yet another unimaginable loss that is difficult to comprehend for all of us. Our hearts are with those impacted by these senseless actions, and we stand with those around the world working earnestly to prevent future violence. More will be said by many in the days ahead, but for the moment, we're going to carry on learning, connecting, and discovering together in community. With that in mind, the learning continues with a keynote from Microsoft Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, Kevin Scott. Kevin will talk about innovations in AI and how those innovations could change the future of development and content creation. Important stuff for sure. A reminder, the Digital Backpack is a great place to save your sessions and keynotes for future reference. All you need to do is head to the session scheduler and and click the Save to Backpack button next to the sessions that you'd like to save. I know I definitely have a very full backpack from day one. Um, as someone who works with devs all day, uh, what were your biggest takeaways from day one that you guys discussed? Well, DevBox was a huge announcement yesterday for my team. Uh, just having another cloud-based way to package those customized developer environments so that when you're joining an, a new team, for example, you no longer have to spend a whole week <laughs> setting up your computer with all the right dependencies and things like that. It's a really cool thing to have. How about you? Uh, your boss, Panos, was dropping a lot of major content yesterday. Yeah, there was a lot of news that I know that came out of both the keynote and then his Interfocus uh, session. Project Voltaire got a lot of love, which was great um, to see how we're arming our devs. <laughs> Get it? Um, uh. So for our audience, there are some new elements that might be of interest to all of you, especially from those of you tuning in from around the world. And of course, we're talking about the new regional spotlights. Yeah, if you're in any of those areas, hopefully you've checked those out because they look like a ton of fun. It is local coverage of the Microsoft Build experience, complete with region-specific keynote analysis, local content, connection opportunities, and all in the local language. To learn more about, what, about what's happening in France, Germany, Japan, Latin America, and the UK, check out the Regional Spotlight section right below this video window. And speaking of things below this player, if you're looking for any of the newly added human audio translations or the more than 29 AI closed caption languages, check out those features directly below this video window. We've also incorporated your feedback, and this year we're looking to expand your horizons like never before with even deeper technical breakout sessions. If you're looking for more introductory sessions, those are also available on demand right now and can be found in the session scheduler. Plus, with things like the Connection Zone and the Learning Zone sessions, there has never been a better time to dive deep into the tech that you are most interested in. So right now, I would love if everyone could check something. If it says sign in on the top right corner of this window you're currently watching us in, then this is your sign to register for the event. It's completely free and allows you to interact with us in the chat and to participate in the polls and of course, use the emojis. <laughs> of course, and on top of those emojis and all of that, you also get access to a bunch of really cool free tech content such as GitHub uh, Copilot and a bunch of other different features that Kevin Scott is going to be sharing in his keynote. Yep, so we've got three Microsoft Build Into Focus shows and a ton of breakout sessions today. But remember to keep coming back to this stream as well where I'm gonna hang out with Leslie. Yeah. We are going to be interviewing with Microsoft thought leaders and industry experts. We'll be showcasing what you're saying on Twitter and all while we help you get the most out of Microsoft Build. Yep, and one way we're going to help you get the most out of your time here is by showing you around the venue a little bit. Let's go ahead and do some of that right now. One place you should make a point to visit is the Featured Partner Showcase. This is your hub for getting hands-on with the latest developer resources from our partners, including SDKs, new product demos, code samples, giveaways, and so much more. Explore developer solutions from valued Microsoft partners like Intel, F5, NVIDIA, LaunchDarkly, and many more who are just waiting to connect with you. Search partners by a particular product focus and find the content that's most useful to you. Gain exclusive access to special offers, jump into the Demo Center to get hands-on with solutions, check out the Innovation Center to learn about the latest news and trends from experts, add a partner's related sessions to your schedule, or save them into your backpack so you can watch them on demand whenever you want and continue to connect with the speakers even after the event is over. All these great resources are just a few clicks away, so simply navigate to Feature Partners up top on the nav bar and check out the Partner Showcase throughout the show.
Now, let's take a look at what you've been up to already today as we bring up some of our tweets on the screen. All right, let's see what we've got. All right, oh, I love this. We got um, a couple of our international teams. Like we said, the regional spotlights that are coming together. This looks like a team um, together from the UK. So it's great that there's a couple of hybrid models that we're working through as well. Um, glad some folks got to see an IRL. <laughs> yeah, shout out if you want a little behind the scenes info. Sassy Black here, excited to share that I curated and mixed the pre-show playlist from Microsoft's MS Build Conference. I included music from a few faves. Join the conference to listen in live. So if you have been enjoying the music that you're hearing, shout out to Sassy Black because she did an excellent job mixing I'd it up. Shout out to Sassy Black. She did the music for my podcast I did for Microsoft. So she's amazing. Um, Looks like the, here's we're talking about a Microsoft 365 Pro session, learning more about building apps at scale with Microsoft 365. I think there was a lot of tools and um, you know announcements made yesterday talking about scale, low code, no code, a bunch yep. of a bunch of features there. Yeah, and also. You definitely want to tune in for the rest of the day because Kayla, as she posts, she's back in the studio ready for more MS Build awesomeness. And I can't wait to see her, uh, the PC that she's been building live all day yesterday in action. Hopefully it boots up today. I can't wait. Oh, you know it's going to boot Absolutely. up. Yeah, if Kayla's working on it, that PC is probably already up and running. She totally. doesn't even have to work on it today. Yeah, and I love that we've had a couple of demos coming in. People are giving shout outs about. Um, let's see. Oh, we have um, Pete, who's going to be moderating his first session today, along with Purnima Nair. Um, I love that people are, you know, doing some shout outs to sessions they're hosting, getting some others, um, you know, some love. Um, save them to your backpack, don't forget. <laughs> Yeah, and Nathan says here, as you mentioned, low code, no code was a very big trend yesterday. Uh, your company needs a low code strategy. Yeah, so <laughs> here it is in full front view as of day one. So that is exciting to see. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, and then here we have one from Uno Platform. Um, always great to see Windows UI and Uno. Uh, Uno platform apps running on Linux. <laughs> Thanks uh, to the team and for the tutorial. So it's great seeing a couple of the shout outs across. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And keep those tweets coming. We have got a full day of keynotes and into focus, plus another great after hour show. And if you didn't see day one's after hour show, you're missing out and you definitely need to check it out. So we want your take on all of that. Yep. Now it's time to take a look at what breakout sessions are coming up next. Build 2022 is here. You don't want to miss out on all of the amazing updates coming your way. Join us for the session on deploying modern containerized apps in cloud native databases at scale. We'll see you there. Hi, I'm Say Doctor. And I'm Nick Gomez. We're both here from the identity division at Microsoft, and we're going to give you an introduction to the Microsoft Identity Platform. We're also going to share some exciting news regarding upcoming functionality that helps you customize the experience and collaborate with other organizations. Come join us. Seth War is here. If you want to learn all about robots, Intel, Open TV, computer vision, people that did cool stuff, everything, make sure you tune in to learn about a special contest with Intel and Open TV. See how you can also vote and win. Please join me. I'll see you there. So of course, day two would not be complete without a poll. So our first question of the day, how are you joining us at Microsoft Build this year? A, from home, B, solo from your office, C, with coworkers from your office, or D, and my personal favorite, in your PJs from an undisclosed location? <laughs> I like the undisclosed location piece of that one. I'm surprised it's so low, so, I only know, 3%. What? Oh, to the 4% yeah. who are able to uh, yeah. be doing that, I. So jealous. Yeah, so it <laughs> looks like from home is pretty high, 80%, mm -hmm. but how many of those are actually wearing real pants? I, I question I know, it. I, really I question feel it. like people are probably in the pajamas phase mm -hmm. and they just don't want to admit it. But Sweat pants were my life for the past two yeah, years. If, so <laughs> if we weren't, you know, hosting in front of <laughs> our right. friends and, and coworkers, I'd probably be in my pajamas. Sweatpants well. chic, as I like to call it. Yeah, it's where you wear the like normal top for, for teams on top and uh -huh. then you know, yoga pants and stuff. Exactly. Below. That's been comfort on the bottom, business on the top. That's been it for, yep. it's gonna continue beyond two years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so hopefully by now you've gotten a chance to attend some of the breakout sessions offered here at Microsoft Build. And now we wanna hear what you thought. 
Yeah, make sure to click on session survey when your session is complete to give us your feedback. We're always looking to make your event experience even better. And I think the speakers themselves would really appreciate seeing how they can convey that information even better. Yeah. Speaking of sessions, here are a few more to check out. Hey folks, Paulin here. I'm very excited to show you some of the unique capabilities we have on Azure for Java and some amazing things that developers are doing with them. We'll talk about containers, Kubernetes, Azure Spring Apps, and JBoss EAP, and show you why Azure is the best platform for Java. Join me in the breakout session for the Microsoft Store. In this session, we share all the great new things coming to help you get new customers and be more successful on Windows. I look forward to seeing you there. Hello, I'm Rohit Tadachar, and in my session, I'll be showing an exciting demo that showcases the ability to deploy and accelerate your Nginx cloud migrations with Azure. We've got so much to enjoy here at Microsoft Build Day 2, including a Microsoft Build into focus later today all about AI. Sonia, I think it will pair pretty well with what we're about to see, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think we talked about AI a little bit yesterday. I think they're going to build upon it um, today. So I'm excited that uh, you know we have a couple of interviews later today. I think we'll have some experts we'll get to speak to and mm -hmm. get their opinions on it. Um, but it sounds like, especially from my Mary Jo Foley conversation yesterday, it doesn't seem like it's in the future. It's like the AI Here. building for it is now. <laughs> it's awesome. So I love seeing some of the announcements that yeah. the teams have been making. And um, yeah, excited to get some more expertise. Yeah. I mean, for me, a highlight of yesterday was GitHub Copilot, which is something that my division has been working on for a while. And I hear that it could even be taken a step further. And Kevin Scott's going to be talking about that in his keynote. So I can't wait to see this the step further <laughs> announced to everyone yeah. else because it's pretty exciting to me. And I know. And we, yeah. we have so much goodness today because we also have Kayla, like we mentioned, who's been building a Windows PC from scratch, which is awesome. I got to not physically hands-on because I had to make sure I didn't like accidentally <laughs> short yourself. the motherboard. Sure. Yeah, but it was super cool getting that experience. So we'll be checking in with Kayla. But also, if you're on Twitter, you can see her live stream right now, which is pretty awesome. So make sure you tune in there. Yeah, <laughs> I took a look at it right before uh, I went home yesterday. Yeah, it's and pretty it cool. Was looking really good. All right. So with that, it's time to head to today's keynote with Kevin Scott. Remember, he's going to share some access to some very cool tools that you won't want to miss out. So make sure you're all registered to get all the details. But afterwards, make sure you join us when you're done. This is Microsoft Build. The act of human creativity often starts with a blank canvas. Because of our curiosity and ambition, we embrace complexity and create tools to manage it. These tools rapidly get more complicated and we layer and compose them to solve more complex problems. Over time, we're able to do more and more useful things. 
In every era, we need special people to focus and harness our great creative ambition, to make and use the tools that extract the possible from the impossible. Today, those people are you, developers, and these tools are called software. Developers have a special creative magic, and your work allows all of us to turn ideas into action at massive scale. Soon, software becomes maybe the single most useful tool we've ever had, and powers almost everything on the planet. But the mounting complexity means that developers' work starts to become more than you can handle. Your creativity gets weighed down by the parts of your job that are more drudgery than imagination. And the magic that happens as you do your work gets harder to conjure. Luckily, we have powerful new tools in our arsenal to help us tackle problems of unprecedented complexity. One of these is called AI. AI tools can assist you with your work and give you new ways to unlock your creativity and to get more done. And the creative energy that made software so rewarding to create starts to return, maybe even more so than before. But the very best part is that AI makes software so easy to use and to create that everybody, not just developers, gets to build things and unlock their creativity because of it. And the world becomes generally a more magical place to live in. Hi, I'm Kevin Scott. Although some of it is just beginning to happen, the story you just heard is true. It's the story of software, developers, and how AI is going to make all of our lives easier in the very near future. Today, we're going to meet some people who are already using software and AI to make the world more helpful and magical. We're going to talk about how Microsoft and our partners are working to create the most powerful software and AI tools we've ever seen. And we're going to give you access to some of those tools so you can try them out yourselves. I'm here at Microsoft's beautiful new Silicon Valley campus. After the past couple of years, it's super exciting to see people back working together in person, sharing ideas, and getting inspired to do great things. Over the past couple of decades, software has increasingly become one of our most important tools to solve the world's problems. But that software means nothing without the human beings who create it. The people who make software, developers, are one of our most important resources. And even just over the past 12 months, the advancements we've made in AI and large AI models have exceeded what we once thought was possible. It was probably the most exciting year in AI we've ever seen. Today, I'm going to show you how we're using AI to help developers accomplish more and share how the latest breakthroughs in AI can empower not just developers, but anybody who wants to turn their creative dreams into reality. In every field and every industry, we're entering a new era where AI is poised to conquer the impossible. Large AI models continue to evolve as platforms that can help us solve our most challenging problems like never before. Over the last year, a tool called GitHub Copilot has shown us how these platform AI models will transform the way software is created, allowing every developer to do more and lowering the barriers to creating your own software. Available for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, Copilot is an AI pair programmer that draws context from code and comments you've written and then suggests new lines or whole functions. It uses AI to transform ideas directly into functioning code using natural language, freeing up your time so you can be more productive and creative. GitHub released Copilot into technical preview last year, and the response has been incredible. Tens of thousands of developers are already using Copilot every day. In some programming languages, we're seeing over a third of newly written code being suggested by Copilot, and it's already delivering significant impact to developers' workflows. As Satya shared yesterday, we're excited to bring Copilot out of preview and make it available later this summer. We want all of you to get started with Copilot today. So we're giving free access to all build attendees until it launches in the summer. We believe we've only seen the beginning of what tools like Copilot are capable of. Earlier this year, GitHub announced Copilot Labs, a Visual Studio Code extension for experimental applications of Copilot. Every developer learns that writing new code is only a part of software development. Often the hardest job that developers face is reading and understanding code. Whether it's because it's an unfamiliar code base or whether the code in question is using a library you might not know, the first step is getting a rough idea of what's going on so you can jump in and use the code or make some changes. Let's take a look at one of these projects right now, Copilot Explain. Basically, it's like Copilot in reverse. Just select some code and you can ask Copilot to explain it to you in plain language. 
The possibilities for exploration and creativity with Copilot are practically endless. But the best part is that tools like Copilot won't just make developers more productive, they will increasingly make coding more accessible to everybody. Let's visit a developer who's already using Copilot to create their own software. Hi, my name is Julian. I'm 16 years old and I live in San Francisco. I'm part of like the computer science club. We prep for competitions together and then also for the ACSL tests together. I started coding when I was eight. We had this thing called Hour of Code at school, and that was fun. I like made a bunch of games, like platformers where you like jump around for platformers. I learned about Copilot actually through YouTube. I was just watching a coding YouTube channel and it talked about Copilot. So when I saw the examples they gave on the screen, I was very amazed. The project I was working on at that time was basically a note-taking app, but for debate where you have to take specific types of notes. At the start of my debate app, I didn't use Copilot. I kind of found out about it midway. And then when I got it, things got a lot faster. So this is my debate flow app. The thing I love about Copilot is how it makes you write a lot less code. It makes you write code a lot faster. It basically can sometimes read your mind. It almost feels like the final puzzle piece in a puzzle being put in. I'm not really sure what I want to do in the future, but I probably want to do something related to coding, so it's very interesting what will happen next. I'm here at the Microsoft Garage, a unique makerspace with locations around the world that allows their employees to work on the things they're most passionate about. Copilot is incredibly cool, and we've seen that it's already transforming how developers of all ages write code. But the large AI models that make things like Copilot possible can not only change how we create software, they can fundamentally shift how we interact with it. And the applications of doing so are nearly endless. Copilot is built on a breakthrough model called Codex from our partners at OpenAI, which can translate natural language inputs into more than a dozen programming languages. Along with GPT-3, it's one of the first models we're delivering to developers through our preview of the Azure OpenAI service. Historically, computer programming has been all about translation. Humans have to learn the language of machines in order to communicate with them. But now, Codex lets us use natural language to express our intentions, and the machine takes on the responsibility of translating those intentions into code. It's basically a translator between human imagination and any piece of software with an API. One example where this can help that we all use every day is the web browser. Let's look at a proof of concept demo our friends at OpenAI developed using Codex and GPT. In the near future, OpenAI's assistive models will be able to translate natural language expressions into action. To give you a sense of this, we've created a demo of an AI assistant that can help users with a wide variety of tasks. So let's say you're about to start coding. Your first priority, of course, is to find some music. What kind of music is good to listen to while coding? It suggests music without lyrics. I'm in the mood for some romantic era music. Could you suggest some classical composers from the romantic era? That's a nice list. Let's go with Brahms. Could you send me a link to some Brahms that I can listen to right now? Now the assistant is browsing the web for us. It's going to use the sources it finds to compose an answer. Looks like it's found us a link to a Brahms playlist. All right, let's get to work. We need to read in some files from Azure Blob Storage. The assistant can help us with that too. What's a good Python library for reading from Azure Storage? It recommends Azure Storage Blob, but I think I've heard good things about a library called Blobfile. I heard there's another library called Blobfile. Could you tell me about it? The assistant is browsing the web again. This time, it's looking for the PyPy page for this library. It's summarizing some key information from the PyPy page. The assistant can even write code for us. 
How can I use it to read and pass a JSON file? And there's some code we can try. Let's finish by seeing what the assistant knows about build. When's the Microsoft Build Conference in 2022? The assistant's not sure, so let's let it browse again. Looks like it found the right answer. What would you say if I told you this conversation would be shown at Build? Excellent, how polite. To see more ways that Codex could transform and simplify not just apps and software development, but things like visual design, gaming, and education in the future, we're going to visit some of our colleagues at Microsoft Garage locations around the globe, with one quick stop from orbit a couple hundred thousand miles up. Hi, my name is Fiona O'Grady, and I'm joining you from our beautiful garage space at Microsoft in Dublin. I am so excited to be sharing this Codex demo with you today. As a model that understands language and code, we can use Codex to build more fluent user interfaces. In this case, we are using the model to power a language-based command line interface. So let's start in PowerShell. Let's say, what's my IP? We hit a keyboard shortcut for the model to suggest a script. In this case, it suggests a web request against a service that returns our IP address. Next, I'll say what's running on port 1018. Developers often want to know what's running on a port so they can free the port up for something else. And it looks like there's a node process running on here. I actually know what the process is and I want to stop it. Let's see if Codex can do that. And look, it wrote the correct script to go ahead and free up that port. Next, I'll say make a git ignore and add node modules to it. This requires the model to understand the semantics of what we're doing. That a git ignore has a period in it, that node modules has an underscore. And I'll say, open it in Notepad. And the model successfully opened this git ignore that it created in Notepad. And you can see right there, it has the node module folder in it. Building this prototype didn't require us to retrain the model. It was enabled through a discipline called prompt engineering. We gave Codex a few examples of the kind of code it should write, and it can generalize from those. If I switch to giving it more conversational examples, then we can coax the model to produce conversational responses. Now, when I ask, who made the last change to this repo? Codex should respond conversationally and use our speech cognitive service to respond. The last person to change the repo was Dhruv Singh. And see, it responded with voice. We can also ask something chitty chatty, like what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is 42. And the model cleverly referenced the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now this prototype isn't limited to PowerShell. Codex can also produce Bash and Z shell scripts. I'm using WSL and Ubuntu here, so I can run Bash on Windows. And now I'll ask, what's the weather in Dublin? The model knew of a curl-friendly API that it could call, and it's a lovely partly cloudy day. Not a huge surprise for the weather in Dublin. Now, this is just one example how Codex can make developers more productive. But more generally, modules that understand human language and code have the potential to enable much more natural interactions with our computers. One area we're really excited about is the potential for this kind of natural user experience is in gaming. My colleague, Martha, is going to share just some of what we've been working on. Jambo, which is hello in Swahili. I'm Martha Gidui, and I'm joining you from our newest garage space here in Nairobi, Kenya. In this demo, I'm going to show how Codex can create new natural language experiences in games using existing tools and APIs. So let's get started. We're playing Minecraft, accompanied by an avatar that uses Codex to produce code and language with the Minecraft Game Test API. The Codex model has never seen this API before. At runtime, 
it's given the API spec along with a few usage examples and it's able to extrapolate from there. We'll start by having a simple conversation. The model is tuned to produce code, but it can also produce dialogue. First, I'll say hello, and the bot responds with hello back. What game are we playing today? Indeed, we're playing Minecraft. Night is coming soon, so let's see if we can get some help from our friend. I'll say, what would be a good item to have at night? And it suggests a torch, which is a smart idea. Codex understands when a message is conversational and can answer with dialogue and keep track of the context of the conversation. It's been answering us with information it already knows, which is not in our bot API code or examples. Now let's use natural language prompts to have it produce some basic code to move around the world. I'll start by saying, come here. And look at me. The model is able to use API primitives to navigate the scene and to look at the player. It can also produce more complex code to handle more complex behaviors by extending primitives with its own code and logic. Since night will be coming soon, and now we know that we could use a torch, let's see if our bot can do that for us. What items do I need to make a torch? And it correctly responds that you need one stick and one coal. We already have the coal in the chest over here. So let's go ask our bot to get that first and then craft the rest. Go to the chest and open it. The model is writing code on its own to deliver the actions we've asked it to do. Get the coal from the chest. All right, and get some logs and make some planks. It's even able to take imprecise language and turn it into precise actions. Finally, I'll say make a stick and make a torch and equip the torch. And as you can see, the model was able to take the conversation and turn it into executable code in real time and deliver the actions in context of what it was already doing. We think Codex's ability to write code for games can open up a whole new world for gamers and modders to create complex behaviors using natural language instructions and can enable game makers to create interactive natural language experiences for their players. Next, we're going to the garage at our headquarters in Redmond, where my colleague Ryan is going to show us how AI can help creators and designers do some amazing new things. I'm Ryan Vollum, a principal software engineer here at Microsoft, and I'm joining you from the Redmond garage on Microsoft's campus. Beyond helping developers, we also believe that models like Codex can empower creators. In this prototype, I'm using Codex to turn natural language commands into Babylon.js code. Babylon.js is a 3D renderer that runs in the browser and can be used to build 3D scenes. I'll start simple. I'll ask Codex to make a red cube. And you can see that it wrote a line of code to render this cube, another to add a material, and a third to make that material red. Next, I'll say add teal spheres above and below the cube. And sure enough, Codex created those spheres and positioned them relative to the cube. Next, I'll say make the cube spin. And Codex chose to use JavaScript set interval function to make the cube rotate once every 10 milliseconds, giving the impression of spinning. And finally, I'll say stop it and see if the model can clear that interval. And sure enough, the cube is no longer spinning. So we were able to create and manipulate simple Babylon shapes. But beyond that, Codex can compose Babylon primitives into more abstract objects. Next, I'll say make a chessboard using black and white cubes. And this will require Codex to understand the semantics of a chessboard, that it's an 8x8 grid. It'll also have to know where those black and white cubes should go. 
And sure enough, it used some elegant code here to go ahead and create and render this chessboard into the scene. Let's try one more complex example. I'll start by saying, make the background black. And I spelled background, but the model should read through it. Sure enough, the background is black. And then I'll say, create a model of the solar system. And this will require Codex to know the different planets, to know their relative colors, their relative sizes, and position them in order. It'll also have to write quite a bit more code to do this. And sure enough, Codex wrote a ton of code here to create a model of the Sun and of nine planets, which is incredibly generous to Pluto. Let's see if we can add rings to Saturn. And the model chose to use a Babylon JS Taurus primitive to wrap Saturn in rings. And then we'll say scatter a few hundred stars around the scene. Let's see if the model can approximate something that looks like stars. And sure enough, Codex chose to use white spheres scattered randomly around the scene to approximate the look and feel of stars. And we were able to create a model of the solar system using nothing but natural language. All of these capabilities were enabled out of box with Codex. We didn't have to retrain or tune the model. And with capabilities like these, we envision that models like Codex will empower not just developers, but also creators. It's also easy to envision how real-time 3D scene generation could revolutionize gaming and metaverse experiences. To give you a picture of what we think is possible, we asked for some help from our friends at Frame VR. Frame is a web-based metaverse platform and part of our team's ecosystem alongside Microsoft Mesh. Let's see what the team at Frame came up with. Up to you, Gabe. Hey, Ryan. This is Gabe from Frame with my Frame teammate, Yure. I'm in California, and Yure is in Slovenia. Hey, Yure. Hey. So we're in Frame right now, which is our web-based metaverse platform built with Babylon JS, which we love. And we're inside the Frame app that we built for Microsoft Teams, so that we can access it right within Teams. A lot of our users use Frame for online classes, so we thought we would use Codex to create an engaging classroom together. You can go anywhere in the metaverse, so we thought we'd set up shop on the moon. So let's wake this thing up. Want to kick it off, Yuri? Sure. OK, Frame. Bring in a model of the Earth. Make it spin and move it up 20 meters and backwards 40 meters. This uses Azure Cognitive Services for speech recognition. And look, we can actually see the Babylon code being generated by Codex as we speak. Bring in a model of the command module and the model of an astronaut and move them a bit apart. These models are actually from a cool Smithsonian 3D library. Students might also want to share their webcam or share their screens. Create a rounded box and make it so that when I click on it, it creates two streaming screens and moves them five meters apart from each other. And now I click on it. Add a table and a whiteboard next to each other. Ryan, can you move that around with the mouse? It's great that we can speak things into the scene, but for some things it's still easier to use your mouse or keyboard. You can use either. We think these experiences should be multimodal. <laughs> Gabe, what are you doing? Oh, I thought the students might like some basketball. Looks too easy. Set the gravity to match Moon's gravity. The model already knows the gravity on the Moon and can apply it to the scene. Whoa! <laughs> well, there you have it. In just about a minute, we were able to make a really cool classroom in frame, and this was only scratching the surface of what you can do with the Codex model. We'll get back to building. 
Thank you, Fiona, Martha, Ryan, and Gabe. That was awesome. We want everyone at Build to start imagining what you can build with models like Codex right now. So we're making the code from these demos available to all Microsoft Build attendees today. We are super excited to bring Codex, GPT-3, and future OpenAI models to developers through the Azure OpenAI service. With enterprise-grade capabilities like security, compliance, and regional availability, and the examples you just saw are only scratching the surface of what's possible. To start exploring the possibilities of Codex even more, we're partnering with OpenAI to present a Codex Innovation Challenge for all Build attendees. Just submit your idea for an amazing Codex scenario, and we'll select a group of finalists to build and present their ideas to our teams. The winner will get resources and mentorship from Microsoft and OpenAI, along with a very cool prize package. We can't wait to see what you come up with. Beyond scenarios like the ones we've just seen, the ability for anyone to access the tools to create new AI-powered applications that can help us solve the world's hardest problems is going to be incredibly important. Here's a technologist who is using AI tools today to reduce pollution and energy use and help combat global warming. My name is Nicholas Becker and I work for Microsoft AI for Good. Growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut. I still do. I hope to go to space someday. But that led me to science and math, and uh, my interest just bloomed. So I didn't get any access to computer science or coding until I was in college. And that gave me the background to bring several different disciplines of technology together. The airline industry is one of the world's biggest environmental impactors. Globally, it makes up 2.5% of total global emissions. A parked plane waiting at a gate burns 60 to 80 gallons of jet fuel per hour. But there are other sources of power for an aircraft while they're on the ground. We started working with Port of Seattle and SeaTac to try to tackle this issue. We used off-the-shelf components, Raspberry Pis, sensors, 3D printed parts to try to collect the necessary information to train AI models to detect this needless emission. And as we went along, we iterated to more and more mature devices. We created a distributed sensor network to monitor these emissions in real time. This network can then tell the airport which airplanes need to have their engines shut down to mitigate these emissions. All right, we are as prepared as possible. Oh, it was so much fun to work on it, you know, climbing around on top of jet bridges and around and underneath the airplanes and installing sensors all around the airport to try to collect the necessary information to solve this problem. It was a pretty incredible experience to see like, we can do this, we can stop these emissions. This is a great solution because everybody benefits. The airlines benefit from fuel savings and hitting their environmental targets. The airports hit their environmental targets and have a healthier work environment uh, for their personnel on the ground. And the consumers benefit because their individual impact is now lower while flying. Now, I don't come from a traditional computer science background, but today all of the science and engineering disciplines require some levels of computer science. So now. Everybody's a developer, whether they had that background or not. If you want to solve a really big problem, the tools available today have made that easier than ever. The technological achievements that have brought us things like Copilot, Codex, and other large AI platform models are going to allow us to take on global challenges bigger than anything we've ever imagined. But keeping those models running is going to require more computing power than we've ever seen. Two years ago at Bill, we announced our first Azure AI supercomputer, which our partners at OpenAI used to train breakthrough models like the ones you've seen today. By our measure, it was one of the top five supercomputers in the world at the time. Since then, we've continued to push the limits of what's possible in AI supercomputing. We now have multiple Azure supercomputers up and running, which we believe are the largest and most powerful AI supercomputing systems in the world today. These systems are being used right now to train OpenAI's next generation of increasingly ambitious models, which together will continue to put into the hands of developers around the world through the Azure OpenAI service, just like we've done with Codex and GPT-3. While there are only a handful of companies like us that can construct systems at this scale, we believe what's most important is that their outputs benefit everyone, not just us.
Building clusters at this scale is an incredible engineering challenge, but the real breakthrough is the layer of software that optimizes how models and data are distributed across them. System software like DeepSpeed, our mSQL library, and the Onyx runtime allow us to train and serve significantly larger models faster and using fewer resources. These tools have been optimized for Azure's AI infrastructure and open source so that the community can keep improving on them. And because our systems are hosted in Azure, we're deploying the same innovations into our public cloud available for developers at any level to use for their training needs. It's this feedback loop from research to deployment that has made Azure far and away the most powerful cloud for AI training based on public benchmarks like MLPerf. And it's why other leading AI research organizations are choosing Azure for their most demanding workloads. Yesterday, we announced a strategic partnership with Meta to use Azure's compute power for their large-scale AI research, accelerating their ability to train cutting-edge large models. We're also deepening our investment in the open-source PyTorch framework, working with the PyTorch core team and AMD both to optimize the performance and developer experience for customers running PyTorch on Azure, and to ensure that developers' PyTorch projects work great on AMD hardware. And as part of our long-term partnership with AMD, I'm excited to share that Azure will be the first public cloud to deploy clusters of AMD's flagship MI200 GPUs for large-scale AI training. We've already started testing these clusters using some of our own AI workloads with great performance. And all of this is happening in Azure. Not only is it the fastest cloud, but it provides developers with the most choice and flexibility from end to end throughout the entire stack. But ultimately, the point of having all this power to train all of these large models is to make sure that they operate as platforms that we can put into your hands to do great things with. Massive scale and research papers and benchmark results are important, but the true test of these systems we're building is whether you, who are building the software and apps that will power the future, can do cool stuff. To make these systems truly valuable, it must be easy and cost-effective to deploy large models using computing resources wherever they exist. As you heard from Satya yesterday, we're ushering in a new era of hybrid AI development where large-scale training happens in the Azure cloud and inference can be optimized for your local device in silicon, the cloud, or both. We call this concept the hybrid loop, and we believe it's a breakthrough that will make platform models more accessible than ever before. You can imagine how it can enable a co-pilot-like experience on every device and for every developer, no matter what kind of compute resources you have. We've just seen some pretty incredible AI tools and experiences, and nearly all of it is available for you to try out today. But there's still a phenomenal amount of creativity and possibility ahead of us that AI can unlock in the future. Last month, OpenAI introduced a successor to DALI, an AI model it introduced last year. DALI creates original, realistic images and art from simple natural language descriptions. You just describe the scene you're imagining and it brings it to life. It's still a research project while OpenAI, Microsoft, and other partners study its capabilities to ensure it can be deployed safely and responsibly. DALI and other AI systems like it can create incredible things, but we have to remember that these are our tools. Only if they're paired with human ingenuity can we get something truly special. And when that happens, these tools have extraordinary potential to empower people to express themselves in new ways and unlock the creativity that's always been within all of us. Who here has a big imagination? Me! Today in class, we're gonna to get to think about how we use our imagination to solve some of the biggest problems in the world. Grab your marker, grab something to sketch with. Think about what matters to you and something that's gonna do good for the world. What matters to me is like climate change and rising sea levels. So what I would design is like a house. It's like on stilts, like when the sea level is like rising, you could like pull a lever that like brings the house up and down. My idea is an electric table. It can heat up food and give it to homeless. I would probably create a soccer ball that has lights so people who don't have power can play with it in the dark. We could take plastic that would have gone into the ocean and make it into a new shoe. These ideas are amazing. I cannot wait to see your ideas come to life. And we have some friends that are working with some technology that's going to make that happen. Should we go check it out? Yeah! All right, come on! This is so exciting. Who's ready? My idea is a club that helps clean up the creek. What we do with all the trash is make it into other cool stuff. The world could be better with no trash than with more trash. 
A computer drew that? This idea, there's like a garden on the moon. We can use some of those gardens for biofuel. My idea is an underwater school to help the ocean. Well, I thought, okay, let's make an efficient sprinkler. A sprinkler that knew exactly what your plant needed. A robot could go in space and pick up trash. Keep fighting for the world that you want to see. Keep thinking about big ideas that can make a difference for us and the planet. Your imagination has never been more needed than this moment right now. I really hope that everything you saw today inspired you to build, create, and develop with AI. Over the coming years, AI is going to make more and more incredible things possible for everyone. But there's also a ton of stuff that's ready for you to try out right now. We want all of you to have access to the tools and the computing power to create AI that's safe, responsible, and that makes the world feel a little more magical. So my challenge to everyone watching is to find something that you can do with AI today, big or small, and just go make it happen. The only limitation is your imagination. Thank you all so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of Build. Just another one of those nights I need it Staying up late one more time to piece it All together now, all together now I, I'm gonna ride this out Breaking my back trying to defeat it Nobody can read in me but I'm depleted All together now, all together now I, I'm gonna ride All right, the future is now. I know there's so many incredible innovations that are quickly becoming a part of our lives. <laughs> yeah, I mean, between the extension to uh, GitHub Copilot, for instance, and with Copilot Explain, which lets me know what the heck is going on with my team member's code, to Codex and all the things you can incorporate with natural language, there are a lot of really neat innovations, and I can't wait to see how they get expanded into real products and things. Yeah, and AI has been such a big part of this and such an exciting area of tech. AI is everywhere. We've been talking about AI, and we're here with someone who's gonna keep talking about AI because I'm pretty sure that's his actual job. We've got Seth Warris with us here on the couch. Speaking of exciting Whew. things in AI, it's me. You know, I'm really oh. excited about Microsoft Build. <laughs> Plus, I'm hosting into focus, I've been up since like 5 a.m. yesterday. I'm so excited. Yeah, you're like 15 uh, minutes early. I yeah. love it. Yeah. I don't even want to know how many cups of coffee you've been running on since 5 a.m. <laughs> so, but I guess I can understand your excitement because one of the reasons why I enjoy into focus is that it allows all of us to go deeper into topics that are kind of explained a bit more broadly up in the keynotes and the core theme sessions. And I know that next show, as you mentioned, is all about AI and you. <laughs> so, can you give us a teaser for what we? can expect that's today yeah it's uh, now yep that is today well how about this since it's you know the show maybe i can build uh, he's here for something he's so early oh, for the dad yeah. jokes man it's uh, way too pun early. intended <laughs> that's on stage y'all <laughs> all right before we let you go because it's literally up next i really am kind of concerned for you yeah right i now. should probably do something <laughs> you have been prepared um i know on day one though you did have a cool interview with our friend over at intel can you catch anyone who might have missed that can you catch them up to speed i absolutely did and i absolutely can i connected with intel field engineer ramon crespo to chat about the latest ways intel is teaming up with microsoft to help make it easier for developers to create solutions from the edge to the cloud plus how we're partnering on new code for Edge AI scenarios to help enhance anomaly detection using eFlow and the Intel OpenVINO toolkit. You can find our conversation as soon as it becomes available on demand later in the featured partner showcase under Intel.
I love it. Seth, I mean, you've been doing a great job yesterday. I'm kind of nervous for you today, but I'm, I'm really excited yeah. for your Into Focus session. You know, maybe we'll just make something <laughs> up as we go. That, 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 that is, is a always plan. a super safe bet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. for these kinds vote. of shows, absolutely. Always works out, you yeah. know. I know. So, okay, I guess, I guess we'll I, let you head off to your Into Focus session. Yeah, I'm sure the devs will absolutely love you being on Super the seat of your pants. Guys, don't worry. <laughs> I should probably go do something really quickly. Yeah, yeah, like writing out what your plan yeah. is for. You got this for into focus and AI. Hopefully, you have the talking points set for AI. I mean, Codex is a big one. I'm giving, I'm giving you help here. GitHub Copilot. All next, that does. Yeah. So <laughs> next up, if you're looking to skill up, do we have some news for you? Take it away, Navin. Hey everyone, Navin Chand here to take you on a tour of the Learning Zone, your destination for training and development. Hopefully by now you've had a chance to explore everything we have to offer. Whether you're a seasoned dev with decades of experience or just starting out in, in tech, the interactive sessions in the Learning Zone aim to deliver. To find out if Intro to Tech Skills is right for you, we have two of the right people here to help you out. First up is Gwyneth. Gwyneth, thanks for joining us. Hey, Devin, happy to be here. Awesome. Hey, can you share who you think could benefit from Intro to Tech Skills and what they can look forward to? Of course. I think Intro to Tech Skills is for anyone who is looking to change the field they're in in tech or get into tech in the first place. If you're looking to build your resume online to stand out with recruiters, there's a session on that. If you're looking to learn which programming language you should use, there is a session on that as well. Uh, if you're looking to tackle a technical interview, there is a session on that too. And even if you're an experienced professional in the field, I'm pretty sure there's something new that you could pick up here at Intro to Tech Skills. Awesome. Thanks so much, Gwyneth. It sounds like there's something for everyone. Now let's bring in Solman for more perspective. Solman, thanks for being here. Hey, Navin. Great to be here with you. Hope you're doing well. Sweet. Uh, so tell me now, um, what have you seen from these Intro to Tech Skills sessions? That is such a great question. Previously, we had the student zone at Build. And what we noticed is those are people who are joining the student zone weren't actually students. And that's something we completely welcome because what we want is people who are totally new to the industry, people who are job switching, people who are students, whoever you are. Tech Skills is all about having people join from every single part of life. Thanks, Solomon. Seems like we've got something for everyone. Navigate to the Learning Zone tab at the top of the page, and there you'll find Intro to Tech Skills. Check out the sessions that are right for you today. Gain new skills and level up in the Learning Zone. We're backstage right yeah, now. Yeah, we're backstage no. here. Just I have no idea what's in store. With yes. That. Embrace that it's coming. The developer can basically take advantage of all of us. What is happening? It's a tiny house, Amanda. Here in Alexander Story's hardware, we are really early in our neurodiverse explorations. Give me a talking head. Yeah. And uh, there's a playground. We really have like stood out. We want to make developers happy. We can be true to our mission. I can take that creativity and build on top of it. On.net is your inside source. Security, identity, friends, our stories. Community, experts, accessibility, developers. It's us. You will learn how to get started with security. How to get started with .NET. Microservices. The latest technologies. Progressive web apps. And how to build for every platform. I'm your host, Christos Matskas, and I'm a program manager for the Identity Division. Richard Lander, program manager on the .NET team. Jamie Singleton, program manager for the .NET community. Jeremy Lickness, program manager for .NET Beta. Hey folks, Paulin here. I'm very excited to show you some of the unique capabilities we have on Azure for Java and some amazing things that developers are doing with them. 
we'll talk about containers, Kubernetes, Azure Spring Apps, and JBoss EAP, and show you why Azure is the best platform for Java. Join me in the breakout session for the Microsoft Store. In this session, we share all the great new things coming to help you get new customers and be more successful on Windows. I look forward to seeing you there. Hello, I'm Rohit Tadachar, and in my session, I'll be showing an exciting demo that showcases the ability to deploy and accelerate your Nginx cloud migrations with Azure. Ah, so many great sessions and so little time. But truth is, with the catalog available here at Microsoft Build, it can be hard to see everything during the event. And that is where your digital backpack comes in. Yep. Say you wanted to get in on one of the sessions we just heard about in that last segment. Your first stop will be at the top of the page where it says Sessions and Backpack. Scroll down to the session scheduler and search through the different options. Remember, the Refine Results area has a ton of tools to help you better search for key themes and topics, as well as levels and even solution areas. Plus, once you find what you're looking for, simply click Save to Backpack. That will be the on-demand video, additional resources, and more. And all of it will be to your backpack, which can be downloaded after the event into a hyperlinked Word document. So it's perfect for sharing with colleagues, you can follow up with partners, or simply review them again. Yep. And you also may have noticed a chat window to the right of this player. And that is a great place to react with some of those fantastic emojis. I'm constantly using the shocked emoji whenever I, I, I think there's a lot of yeah. mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout the event, we'll also be pushing up some polls, your favorite to get to know you better. Our full so our first poll is up. And Sonia, this is a great question to get us started. How many Microsoft Build events have you attended? Mm. A, you are a Microsoft Build first timer. B, you've been to a few. C, please, I'm a seasoned vet of Microsoft Build. Or D, I challenge you to find a Microsoft Build that I haven't attended. Ooh, <laughs> so, I feel like I, I'm, I'm probably a solid B. I've gotten to attend a few in person, which is awesome, back when we had them you know, on site. Yeah. Never made it to SF, though, but I, the oh, Seattle gosh, ones yep. I did. Yep. Yeah, and then now virtually. But I don't know if I would call myself a veteran quite yet. Yeah, I don't know what counts as vet status, but I, this is build number five for me, so. Ooh, that's pretty good, considering you've been at Microsoft for five years. <laughs> yep, yep, so it works out. So make sure to answer that poll question and look for more in chat throughout the event. Now, let's check in with that Windows build PC, Windows PC build. <laughs> Windows terminal PM Kayla Cinnamon is moments away from bringing her Windows PC to life. Kayla. What have you got? I can't contain my excitement. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. Well, yesterday I spent the day building this Windows PC from scratch. It took about four hours, so not a Guinness World Record as we might have guessed at the beginning. So let's take a look at how I built this Windows PC yesterday first. So first I just took the bag off the motherboard and then I put in some RAM sticks for memory. And this is the SSD storage card going in. We have a back plate for the CPU cooler going underneath the motherboard. And this is the CPU cooler itself. I'm just putting the brackets on. And then here are the three fans I installed into the front of the case for extra cooling. And this is the big CPU installation moment that had all of us sweating here in the studio. This is the top of the case I'm just reinstalling so that we can put the CPU cooler radiator on top. This is the CPU cooler itself in entirety. I'm just carefully lowering this into the case to make sure it sits all right. And then I'm just adding the thermal paste, which we saw last yesterday with Scott Hanselman and Felicia Shaw, about a pea-sized amount. And this is the CPU cooler that's going right on top of that thermal paste on the CPU to make sure it's all spread out evenly. And here I'm just peeling off the plastic on the motherboard. You don't want to leave this here in case it gets too hot and possibly melts onto the motherboard. That would be really bad. And here I'm just doing up the final wiring to make sure everything's connected to the power supply. So we should be good to turn it on after the power supply is inserted into the case itself. So now we're going to actually see if it turns on. So first I'm going to actually do the satisfying pull of removing the plastic from the glass front. Oh yeah. This is the best part, is pulling the, the plastic off. We're just gonna throw that over there. All right, so first is the switch on the back. You might see the motherboard light up. And then, oh, sweet! Look at that! <laughs> Looks like it works. 
So you might have noticed that I took out the pre-installed fans and replaced them with these RGB fans here in the front. And that's because I wanted the whole thing to light up like Times Square. And when you're installing fans, you'll want to make sure that you have an even number of uh, intake and exhaust fans. So total the numbers even. So we have three intake fans in the front. Intake fans will go on the front and the bottom of the case. And exhaust fans, which I have two on the top and one on the back, um, help get that hot air out of the computer to make sure everything stays cool. So adding more fans doesn't mean it'll be louder, it just helps with airflow. And this uh, computer is actually quite silent. So it looks like we have some questions from the audience. Why is that PC so large? That came up a few times yesterday. So we wanted to make sure there was room for any upgrades that we wanted to add later. And it's a really nice um, case for development so that we have enough room to get our hands in there, or sorry, for demoing at the build to make sure we have enough room to get our hands in there and everything. And then why a liquid cooled uh, CPU cooler instead of just using the pre-installed fans or a CPU cooler with a fan? So this is, since this is a development machine, we wanted to make sure the CPU was efficiently cooled. And that's kind of why we spent the upgrade to make sure that we had a liquid cooler. And that's pretty cool to have like a liquid cooling thing inside the machine itself. So use the hashtag msbuild and send me your questions and check in with me later today to see all the custom accessories I'm going to add. You'll also get to see me do a full developer demo using this Windows PC that I just built. So things I'm going to be showing off are Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, Windows Terminal, and Windows Terminal Preview, uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux, and also Power Toys. So you won't want to miss that. So we'll be back to Leslie and Sonia in the studio right after this. We pick up and deliver millions of packages going to thousands and thousands of addresses, and it has to be all planned out. It can be very complex. eStar is an effort to modernize our pickup and delivery operations. The challenge that we were trying to solve was scalability. Traditionally, we've had very static infrastructure. It was not able to scale up or scale down either, so we would have that infrastructure consuming cost when we were not putting any workload on it. We had to have a system that was flexible and could expand and grow as our company does. And that's where we looked at Azure. We started uh, pretty new to Azure. We worked with Microsoft consultants and formulated a solid architectural run solution. Everything that we work on is mainly Java. We were able to leverage our existing Java and Spring Boot framework to act as a bridge between on-premises and Azure. We don't have to really build from scratch, so we just need to plug in the Java libraries. Everything was there. We're utilizing Azure Spring apps to deploy our Java applications. That application then pulls off an event-driven messaging queue and then integrates with Azure File Share and the storage queue to trigger an AKS pod. Whenever we publish a message to that storage queue, Kubernetes event-driven architecture, Kita, helps us to scale up every time a request comes in instead of on CPU or memory scaling. We were able to start from nothing to the end product within six months. We can already see that we are able to scale up within minutes to process hundreds of requests but also scale down to reduce cost. We are going to roll this solution out globally. The success of eStar and Azure, we've had many different teams approach us and ask us, how do we do it? So we've had many sessions of explaining our architecture. So that's a very positive, and it's a pride for us. <laughs> You can't just walk into a store. There's no, I saw that in the window and I loved it. It felt like, at least from the fashion world, they weren't, they didn't care enough about me to even want my money. It was worth less to them than someone who was smaller than me. I wanted girls to have a more positive shopping experience than I had. And so I said, if no one else is gonna make it, like screw it, I'll make it. Using Windows 11, we're building a super transparent way to show plus size women that they have more options. I use Snap Assist constantly. I'm working on designs for social media content, editing videos. I could just tap the thing I want with my finger, which feels like a very natural motion to just be like, I want that. We've created a space where you can just say, this sucks, let's help fix it together. Let's build community around it. Let's support one another. And if we can make things truly size inclusive, we're going to make a more positive world. And with Windows 11, I'm working on it. When you're little and you see the tickets 
to your game are half price. You're wearing the boys' hand-me-down uniforms. You just ask why. Right now, a lot of female basketball players are wearing men's and children's sneakers. Children's? Children's. I don't think there's a good reason why. I made a brand built by and for female basketball players. I'm using Windows 11 because one day I am the CFO, the other day I am the box designer. What helps me is Snap Assist. It lets me put all of these applications on the screen at the same time. We're not asking other people to make shoes for us. I've got the tools I need. I found myself really using the touch screen. Windows 11 felt like something that I had been wanting for so long. And we're going to have female players playing in sneakers that fit their feet better. They lace it up and they know they're betting on themselves. Three, two, one. Here we go! I use DevOps every single day when I'm deploying into Azure. Whether it's different tooling like Azure DevOps or GitHub and GitHub Actions, I'm deploying into Azure continuously with continuous integration, continuous delivering, and using tooling like Infrastructure as Code. DevOps is part of my everyday life. I use DevOps every day to solve complicated challenges that our enterprise customers are facing. I use DevOps every day from planning work, to cutting code in the cloud, to CI, CD, and then monitoring what's in production. I use DevOps every single day by leveraging GitHub Actions and advanced security to demonstrate to our customers how to build out secure software development pipelines and how to take an idea all the way into production securely. All right, we have been checking in with Twitter all day and we've gotten some great reactions and we're gonna share them with you. All right, let's take a look. All right, we've got one over here. Avanad bringing a strong presence to Microsoft Build UK today. That's awesome. I love coming together with our partners. I love that they're getting you know that hybrid experience together. We yep. got to be here in real life too, so I'm glad we're kind of doing uh -huh. a hybrid. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. Speaking of hybrid, <laughs> this group has gone full virtual from Gabriel over here. We had a magical watch party in Frame VR, of course, where we watched Frame up on the main stage at MS Build. Had to hold back a tear or two. That's pretty meta. <laughs> Learn about Frame in Frame. I like it. <laughs> I love it. And then over here, we got one from Erwin. Um, looking at the Codex demo in MS Build reminds me a lot of the Tele. Tele iOS power, Telios? <laughs> power Hour episode <laughs> where one of our DANs, uh, Joshua, used MS Bot Framework to manipulate a screen from A Frame VR. Very, very cool stuff with Codex. Yeah, Codex was ever present in that keynote. And keep those tweets coming. Let us know how you are watching the event and what you're learning. And don't forget to use the hashtag MS Build so we can see what you've got to say. And wow, I mean, it's hard to believe that we are only a few hours into Microsoft Build Day 2, and we've already done so much. So much, and we're just getting started. Later today, we'll dive into the world of low-code and collaborative apps with more Microsoft, in, Microsoft Into Focus shows. It's a great way to learn more about some of those headlines coming out of the event from some key Microsoft experts and industry analysts. Yeah, speaking of key Microsoft experts, Seth, what are you doing here? Uh, w what? I, well, the snacks are real. like I'm in the shadows here. <laughs> you just crinkle it away. <laughs> I, the snacks are really good here. Yeah. And, and I thought, wrong. I mean, I would, they, they let me do this last year. I thought I would hang out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's pretty cool. I'm getting like a little nervous for you just hanging out over here. I know. Yeah. Like, don't you have Indifocus to prepare still? Like I mean, we could just make it up as we go, right? I mean, I have teammates and stuff. That. Yeah, you can just grab your Surface Pro and just take some notes yeah. down. And I go. mean, I mean, and, and no not only that, I, I, I have a lot of I have a lot of snacks available available to me here, and I mean, I'm I'm excited to be here. I I thought maybe we could ha hang out. Yeah, what you got in? But what you snacking on? Yeah, just some corn nuts. Nice. Yeah, I mean. The snacks are better here. You did I tell me to not good. get near you when I did the cornets. So look, and also, messy, also, no, hold on, hold on. Also, ever since Kevin Scott's keynote, I've been really 
really wanting to do something with AI. That was literally inspiring. So I'm, I'm just going to go. Yeah, maybe instead of loitering here, okay, you should I'm gonna go. Go. No, just gonna go. go. I'm, I'm going to go. So. All right. So I was super inspired by Kevin's keynote, talked all about AI. I heard that you're the guy to talk to about doing stuff with AI. So since we're in a conference, I thought, why not build a conference app? What can I do to get started? I get a lot of questions about how AI can help accelerate business change and how people can get started. In fact, we've seen AI and machine learning fuel innovation across a wide range of scenarios, from knowledge mining to predictive analytics, from speech transcription to computer vision. These applications of AI enable organizations to be both more effective and more efficient, automating processes to free their teams to focus on more impactful work and infusing cutting edge intelligence into their applications to uncover new insights and unlock avenues of future growth. The tools available to developers are growing as well. Emerging out-of-the-box services and pre-built AI models enable developers to get started building enterprise-grade AI faster than ever before. At the same time, machine learning platforms are enabling developers to reach new heights of sophistication and scale with advanced ML ops for building and managing custom models. We've been doing fundamental research in AI since the start of Microsoft Research over 30 years ago. In the last four years, the breakthroughs we've had, from object recognition to speech recognition to machine reading and comprehension, they've all accelerated. In fact, just last month on the popular NoCaps benchmark, our model beat the performance of people attempting the same tests. More than 45,000 customers are currently using Azure AI, including 90% of the Fortune 500, driving innovation across industries and around the world. Our customers come from a broad spectrum of industries, from established leaders investing and modernizing their businesses with a trusted platform for enterprise-grade AI, to new entrants driving innovation with AI from the ground up. Our foundation of breakthrough research, combined with deep learning algorithms, massive training data, and the powerful Azure computing infrastructure, have been the driving force in our AI evolution and in building our AI portfolio. The AI platform is how we bring all elements together to meet the needs of customers. The Azure AI stack allows you to start with scenario-specific AI services using the applied AI services. It also allows you to leverage customizable, high-quality AI models with cognitive services across vision, speech, and language. The stack also gives you the flexibility to build your own custom models using Azure Machine Learning. You can start as high as you want and go as low as you need. As you saw in Kevin's session, we've seen a lot of ongoing innovation in foundation models for AI. For example, our first foundation model for vision, which is codenamed Florence, was trained on billions of images and text. By training a model on language and vision together, a multimodal model, it's able to recognize and label objects that it hasn't even been trained on before, a technique called zero-shot learning. Capabilities powered by this model will be made available in a preview as one of our cognitive services in the coming months. These innovations enable interesting scenarios like using a freestyle text query to search objects in an image or within a large set of images or video. Today, we're announcing that the Azure OpenAI service is in preview. Customers can apply for access now. The Azure OpenAI service combines OpenAI's models with the enterprise capabilities of Azure. 
Customers can leverage large-scale generative models with deep understanding of language and code to enable new reasoning and comprehension capabilities for building cutting-edge applications. The service can be used for a variety of use cases, such as writing assistance, code generation, and reasoning over data. From financial services to insurance to healthcare, we're seeing new and cutting-edge applications of the Azure OpenAI service. One example we're seeing is in medical billing. The Azure OpenAI service helps extract and summarize this billing content in a way that speeds up the entire billing process. And this is only the beginning. Let's take a deeper look into what CarMax, one of our first Azure OpenAI service customers, is doing. CarMax's use of Azure OpenAI service is enabling their shoppers to access information in a way that they've never been able to before. Car buying is a big decision. It's the second largest thing a person will do after buying a home. CarMax disrupted the industry by bringing honesty and transparency. We have tens of thousands of cars on our website or through our app. And without talking to a human being, customers can get overwhelmed. The challenge that we had was that we only could create so much content. There's manual effort, there's research, the writing, there's the proofreading. Our writers can only produce so much content a month. Would have taken them years to produce enough pages to be relevant. Azure OpenAI service allows us to summarize all of the custom reviews and put it in a, a simple to read and understandable sentence. We're able to take content and feedback from a lot of other customers, curate it, and create this very tailored content for a specific car. Through the fine tuning process, we're at 80% of the content goes through without a human needing to be involved. We're estimating an individual would take 11 years to do what OpenAI service has done in days. We have seen a significant increase in our search engine optimization. Now, the editorial team they're able to focus their time on the areas most beneficial to the company and to our customers. There's so much possibility with OpenAI service. We're innovating at a scale, at a pace like never before. This is gonna change everything we do. With the growing adoption of AI also comes an imperative to make sure that developers are using and creating AI responsibly. To help model builders design, test, and manage models with responsible AI in mind, today we're announcing the Responsible AI Dashboard and Scorecard. The REI Dashboard is a single pane of glass bringing together several mature responsible AI tools in the area of interpretability, fairness assessment and mitigation, error analysis, causal inference, and counterfactual analysis. This is part of our larger effort on the Responsible AI Toolbox to integrate a variety of Microsoft REI tooling in one central place. Seth wants to build a conference app using AI. He's going to need a lot of help. Do me a favor. Teach him. That's impossible. If you want me to quit, just tell me. I knew I should have taken that job at LinkedIn. You know, I'm actually really excited about AI. Um, but on the other hand, I have watched a lot of Terminator movies. I could totally make an AI business. Or I could move to a cabin in the woods, learn some, some karate. <laughs> you didn't even see that coming. I, I made myself a, a yellow belt. Picture this, a conference AI app that looks at your pinky toe knows what kind of programmer you are. A conference AI app that looks at your left eyebrow and knows if you're gonna be a good worker. A conference AI app that knows how you feel. Oh no, what you're thinking. Being responsible with AI is a core feature of everything we do. Responsible AI at Microsoft begins with our AI principles, fairness and inclusiveness, reliability and safety, privacy and security, and transparency and accountability. These principles tell us what we want to achieve with each AI system we create. To implement them, we need to think about three things. First, how to govern the AI system responsibly. Second, how to develop it responsibly. And finally, how to use it responsibly. Let's take a look at how we did this for Azure OpenAI as an example. 
Before you even start building an AI system, you need to think about the potential benefits, harms, and appropriate uses of it. For example, with Azure OpenAI, the model has this amazing potential benefit that it can be used to generate content or code to help humans be more productive. However, without the right design, it also has the potential to generate incorrect or even harmful content. Once you understand the potential benefits and risk, you need to design and build the system to ensure that it will work robustly and fairly for the intended uses. You may need to add further controls to mitigate any other potential risk you identified. As part of developing Azure OpenAI, we created a responsible AI system that works alongside the core model to automatically filter harmful outputs so customers and users don't need to worry about them. You also need to think about the use of the AI system. A system could be developed responsibly, but used incorrectly or in an application for which it's not well suited. For Azure OpenAI, to enable customers and end users to use it responsibly, they need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the system. For example, because it may generate incorrect facts at times, the user should review any output before moving forward with it. We've released responsible AI documentation that helps customers understand how it works, and we've provided UX design patterns to help customers design their application to empower users to use GPT-3 effectively. This is an example of an AI system that we have developed responsibly for others to use, which is one of the benefits of using Azure Cognitive Services. If you're building your own AI system, then you need to go through this process as well. Fortunately, we have tools in Azure Machine Learning, like the new Responsible AI Dashboard, to help you do this for your AI systems. So this feels like a lot. Are people actually doing this? There's a way to be responsible with AI. Let me show you something. Gosh, why not become a surgeon? My greatest responsibility is that for my patients. They're at the heart of everything. Surgery is a significant decision. Previously, when we have a conversation with the patient, we would discuss the risks that they have really haven't been able to be personalised enough. Uh, predicting the risk of surgery is a really complicated process and surgery is irreversible. So we need to make sure that we're operating on the right people for the right reasons. Using machine learning and artificial intelligence to understand risk of surgery is just right at the very forefront of technological change. And the responsible AI is absolutely key. And the beauty of of this system is that we can say what goes into that conclusion and that helps the patients and then the clinicians understand what is driving that particular risk. Currently 220 different fields go into the model. Basic demographics, age, other aspects like social deprivation, the past medical history, blood tests. The Responsible AI dashboard from Microsoft does help us have more meaningful conversations with the patients or a clinical team. Being able to offset those inherent biases, which we all have, is really important for the clinician because they can make a sound judgment and use the tools available to them to provide the best possible care to their patients. Giving them a personalised view about what their particular risk is does empower people to be able to make decisions about their lives. And that is really what we need to be doing with consent, is making it as personal as possible to them for patients. Ultimately, this is going to provide them the treatment they need so that they recover faster, they're able to do the things in life that they wanted to do, that are struggling because of a condition that we can do something about. Such a privilege to be involved in that. Picture this, an AI-powered robot, don't mind the square head, I know that's weird, square mouth, choose your food, powered by AI, so you have flan, although there is two schools of thought on that. A good spicy paella would be delicious for it to chew. Have you ever choked on a meatball? I have. <sighs> it doesn't come out. AI chewing robot. Question?
So what exactly are you trying to accomplish here? Yeah, so I don't even know how to get started. Sometimes getting started with AI is as simple as getting started with AI. In fact, at Microsoft, we aim to bring world-class AI within the reach of every developer without requiring machine learning expertise. Our applied AI and cognitive services consist of specific scenario services that allow you to accelerate time to value when building AI solutions for common business challenges, such as Azure Form Recognizer for Document Intelligence or Azure Cognitive Search for Knowledge Mining. Applied AI services are built on the foundation of Azure Cognitive Services, which encompasses high-quality AI models for vision, speech, language, and decision-making. Each AI service provides pre-built models to help you get started quickly. You can also bring your own data to customize on top of these models to increase model accuracy for your scenarios. Our portfolio of services are designed for developers and data science and can be used in any app by making simple REST API calls or via the SDK, which help you configure those API calls easily. For example, say you want to expedite checking in at a conference. You could use Azure Form Mechanizer to automatically extract the fields from things like a vaccine record or even an ID. Or maybe you want to have your conference Q&A documents available in multiple languages using the document translation service. Additionally, Folks might want to summarize the conference docs using document summarization. Maybe you want to get more session feedback. I can imagine a combination of text-to-speech and sentiment analysis to get a super quick review right as folks leave a session. Today, we're excited to announce new updates for applied AI in preview. New pre-builds in Azure Form Recognizer for vaccine and insurance card and added layout understanding capabilities for paragraph headers and titles to enable more precise text extraction. We also continue to focus on language expansion, adding new languages to our pre-built models, such as invoices and business cards. Power Virtual Agents will be incorporating additional Azure Bot Service Composer capabilities, such as new authoring canvas, rich responses event-driven, and contextual triggers, as well as new telephony channels to further cater to pro developers, all available in gated preview. Also, Azure Metrics Advisor, new auto-tuning capability in preview, enables you to customize the service to surface just the anomalies that matter to you. Through the guided experience, you provide detection preferences, such as level of sensitivity and anomaly pattern, to tailor the model to suit your needs. We're also excited to announce the following updates to Azure Cognos services. You have already heard from Eric about Azure OpenAI in preview. In addition to that, Cognos Services for Language Now offers summarization for documents and conversations, which quickly surface the key information. The service also has several capabilities now generally available, such as custom named entity recognition. This helps identify your specific terms in your specific text. We are also introducing custom text classification, which organizes and categorizes text with your domain-specific labels, like a support ticket or an invoice. Finally, conversation language understanding is the next generation of language understanding, bringing improved accuracy, built-in multilingual capabilities, and much more. We're also announcing that translator document translation capability is now generally available. Scan PDF were previously inaccessible for machine translation, but now this most common document type can be automatically translated while keeping the original formatting perfect for a conference app. So you're saying all I have to do to use AI is just call a service? Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Take a look. In September of 2021, when the Canadian government mandated for all employees of a federally chartered company to be vaccinated, Air Canada fall into that category. We wanted to make sure that we did some level of checking to have compliance and ensure that that was done. Let me tell you about Air Canada AI team a bit. It's a fairly new team that was created about like three years now. And the team tackles a range of different projects from revenue management to cargo. The team itself is about roughly 50 to 70 people. I would say that there was no exact plan on how this data would be uh, validated. For the vaccine, we had to validate 1,000 submissions. 
we had multiple languages, we had submissions from all the different types of vaccines, and we also had submissions from multiple countries as well. Uh, you have PDFs, other times you have like pictures, uh, some pictures that are not straight. Initially, it was like, uh, let's capture the information and find out how we can make sense out of it. We had to first produce a working prototype. We only had roughly two months to do all of that. We worked with Microsoft to build our solution. We relied on uh, Farm Recognizer a lot uh, to be able to extract not only digital document, but also a like, picture containing handwritten information. We are able to recognize, just through the first pass, over 70% of the 30,000 submissions. That's really what made the project so successful, that everybody was working to deliver a solution, and we had great help within Microsoft collaboration to deliver that on time. Really exciting for Air Canada going forward, thinking about different initiatives and projects that we have on the horizon. Example that I can give is we have some maintenance sheet. These are printed documents, and we want to extract information from these printed documents. We're just scratching the surface of what AI can do within the airline industry. We're really excited to collaborate with Microsoft for future projects. So listen, Abe, I'm thinking, what if we built an AI model that generated heroic copy for our conference? That sounds like something custom, right? Is that hard to do? Taking custom models from idea to business value is hard. Add the need for collaboration, governance, security, etc. It seems like this task becomes impossible. Thankfully, we have Azure Machine Learning. Azure ML is a service for accelerating and managing your machine learning project lifecycle. Machine learning professionals, data scientists, and engineers can use Azure ML in their day-to-day -day workflow to train, deploy, and monitor models. For example, data scientists can experiment and train models using Azure ML notebooks, where they'll have enhanced productivity tools like code suggestions. They'll also have access to the Azure ML Python SDK v2 to do common ML tasks like uploading a model to the Azure ML registry for collaboration across their team. As for the ML engineers, they will be able to easily collaborate with data scientists while using a world-class editor like VS Code running on the Azure ML compute. They will be able to easily productionalize data science notebooks by converting them to Azure ML components, and will be able to create reproducible pipelines for ML ops. Lastly, They'll be able to work with the team to securely deploy the custom ML models to production with the new V2 Azure ML CLI. Azure ML bridges the gap within ML teams, provides a platform for teammates to work collaboratively, and helps teams deliver ML models into production faster. This platform will continue to grow, and today I'm proud to announce some new releases. You heard from Eric and Sarah about the new Responsible AI dashboard and scorecard. Today, we're announcing the general availability of Manage Endpoints, which simplifies deploying large-scale machine learning models for both real-time and batch inferencing with an intuitive developer interface. Additionally, we are launching a host of features in preview for automated ML, such as support for NLP and image tasks, generation of model training code, and other enhancements for product integration and MLOps in Azure ML. On top of that, we're very proud to announce our new Python SDK v2 preview is going to be released. This further simplifies the developer experience, especially for those who love Python. If you love using the terminal and command line, don't worry, we have you covered. We're also proud to announce the general availability of the V2 command line interface, which allows users to participate in the ML lifecycle without needing to learn specific programming language. Lastly, we're announcing integration with R Studio Workbench, which allows users familiar with R to use Azure ML more natively.
Would like you like some? Gross. Listen, this AI is going to be amazing. So, how about we use AI to limit access to our AI with AI? You could, but have you talked to Sarah about doing this responsibly? So I really wasn't paying attention. Great. She's right behind me. Having the right tool makes a world of difference when it comes to building custom AI models responsibly. The Azure Machine Learning Responsible AI Dashboard and Scorecard helps put into practice the three pillars of responsible AI that Sarah mentioned earlier, available through a variety of working methods, such as the newly available Code First CLI v2 and public previewed SDK v2 experiences, as well as a no-code UI experience from the Azure Machine Learning Studio UI. When you're developing your ML model, you can easily assess your model during training and testing time with the Responsible AI Dashboard. You can evaluate your models with reproducible and automated workflows to assess model fairness, explainability, error analysis, and causal analysis, as well as model performance and exploratory data analysis. For instance, in this ML app that Seth built, the model will unfairly favor those who are using spaces instead of tabs and not living in Antarctica when providing access to the application we built. When you're ready to use your ML model, you can make real-life interventions and policies with causal analysis in the Responsible AI dashboard and generate a Responsible AI scorecard for trained ML models in your Azure Machine Learning workspace at deployment time. When this ML app is deployed and in use, it's important to build confidence in its predictions when allocating opportunity to all programmers. Finally, to govern your ML models, you can export and share Azure Machine Learning's Responsible AI scorecard for your models as a PDF report to contextualize Responsible AI metrics with both technical and non-technical audiences, bringing stakeholders along as well as assisting in compliance review. Hopefully with these new tools, you'll be empowered to take the next step and start developing, using, and governing your machine learning models responsibly. Seth, your ML model disproportionately favors those who use spaces instead of tabs, and also those programmers not living in Antarctica? Well, spaces all the way. And with real estate prices, Antarctica would make a great summer location. Seth. What's up? You're late. I have one rule around here. If you're not Don't 10 minutes show early, you you're sad late. sad TikToks. So, Seth, yes. you talked to a lot of people today. Tell me what you learned. I feel like maybe if I say too much. No, and Seth, I promise okay. we're not going to cut you off. Okay. And I think the most important takeaway for me was how. To summarize, the Azure AI portfolio supports many different approaches for getting started with AI. Whether harnessing new document models and form recognizer, building models from the ground up with Azure Machine Learning, or even using a combination of different approaches. Hopefully you've also learned that responsible AI is at the core of every stage of building an AI app, and that assessing models for fairness is easier than ever with the new responsible AI dashboard and scorecard. We're excited to announce these powerful innovations across every layer of the Azure AI portfolio, and we can't wait to see how developers continue to use these tools to build powerful, responsible AI applications. That's what I learned. It's, it's been amazing. Look, we're in a conference right now. Do you want to go back and maybe answer some questions? Let's go. Let's do it. So look, I was telling you that the, the Ninja Turtle with the stick is the best one. Yeah, but I, it's all about the bandana. And yeah. that's the oh, thing that's that makes true. the big difference to me is like who's got the coolest looking bandana. I know, I know. And I, I was going to wear a bandana for this, but they told me I couldn't. Yeah, bandanas are they're, they're kind of a little Oh, bad. look at that. Wow. All right, Eric. That was so much fun. Thanks for helping me out, my friend. Always happy to help you out and happy to uh, work with such the wonderful people on the team. And of course, have a little fun at your expense. Yeah, I, I always have fun at my expense too. So that's great. I have no idea what you're talking about, by the way.
I didn't feel any of that. And hey, look who's here. It's our MVPs joining us via Microsoft Teams. Hello, everyone. All right, it's good to be here. We're going to get to their questions in a moment. But first, we did actually build something. We did, actually. Uh, take a look at this conference app that we've built. It's, it's pretty amazing how we've put all the pieces together and actually built a real app using AI. I mean, why don't you tell us a little more about yeah, it? Yeah, so right here, easy check-in with Form Recognizer. If you have documents, you can translate them and keep the same structure. You can see there's got to be 50 billion languages there. I can't see it's really small over yeah, here for me. a lot. Uh, but notice it keeps the structure. It's a PDF. If you want to summarize large objects, you know that like, your emails are kind of long. So take a look. Hey. I, I, sum I can summarize your emails summarize. now. Read them. I can also talk because getting feedback from conferences is hard. Imagine being able to talk into your phone. And being able to know right away, oh, you were not happy. And then finally, the piece du résistance. I'm not very good at marketing, and so this is a GPT-2 model running in Azure Machine Learning. Take a look at this conference app, gener marketing copy generator. This epic conference will be held at least 20 years hence. Obviously. In the future. Yeah, and if it's going to be in 20 years, it's going to be really good. I'm right. pretty sure. Finally, finally, this is my favorite. The conference learnings will, best marketing copy ever, will be given. They will be given. Yeah. Uh, we shall be sitting then <laughs> reclining in a large room. with. Every, I mean, I, I could not have written this. It's almost myself. like Homer wrote it. It's almost like Homer wrote it, indeed. And, uh, you know, if you actually want to see how we built this, make sure to tune in to Breakout 13, where we show the first few tabs of the app and Breakout 21, where we build the heroic marketing copy generator. Amazing. And you can find those breakout sessions via the session scheduler. Before we continue, though, any more additional announcements? You know, there are a few indeed, Seth. Uh, so we at Microsoft are committed to advancing AI so that every person or organization on the planet can achieve more. In addition to evolving AI through Microsoft research-driven AI breakthroughs that are implemented in Azure tools and services customers can use today, Microsoft also works with other organizations to help the global AI community evolve, expand, and thrive. Today, Microsoft is announcing several key partnerships, including Meta and Hugging Face. Meta, previously known as Face of Azure Supercomputing Power to accelerate AI research and development for its Meta AI group. Meta will use a dedicated Azure cluster of 5,400 GPUs using the latest virtual machine series in Azure, the NDM A100 V4 series, which features NVIDIA A100 Tensor Core 80 gig GPUs for some of their large scale AI research workloads. Meta recently trained the OPT 175 billion parameter model on this Azure cluster. And along with OpenAI and Microsoft, this really showcases how the largest models are being built on Azure. In addition, Meta and Microsoft will collaborate to scale PyTorch adoption on Azure and accelerate developers' journey from experimentation to production. In the coming months, Microsoft will build new PyTorch development accelerators to facilitate rapid implementation of PyTorch-based solutions on Azure. Microsoft will also continue providing enterprise-grade support for PyTorch to enable customers and partners to deploy PyTorch models in production, both on the cloud and on the edge. This is really cool, but you mentioned something about Hugging Face, which I'm a huge fan of. Of course. I mean, I'm also excited to announce that Hugging Face is a new Azure partner doing cutting-edge AI on Azure. Hugging Face has been on a mission to democratize good machine learning. With their Transformers open source library and the Hugging Face Hub, they're enabling the global AI community to build state-of-the-art machine learning models and applications in an open and collaborative way. Every day, over 100,000 people all over the world download more than 1 million models and data sets to solve real-world business problems with AI. At Microsoft, we're committing to sharing our latest AI innovations with the community and investing in contributing to open source. In fact, Microsoft has contributed to over 150 state-of-the-art machine learning models on Hugging Face to do amazing things like automatically analyze PDF documents or detect objects and images or power semantic search experiences or even transcribe speech automatically. I'm excited we're bringing together the best of Hugging Face and Azure platform and to offer our, our customers new integrated experiences that build on the secure, compliant, and responsible AI foundation that we have in Azure ML, our MLOps platform. If you haven't already, please check out Hugging Face's build session where their CEO and head of product discuss, discuss this partnership further. Well, this is awesome. You saw some of the B-roll of some of the features, but make sure you go to that session. Well, like I've mentioned before, we have our wonderful MVPs joining us in Together Mode via Teams. Hello. Look at these. I, 
These are such nice people. And they also have some burning questions. So let's get to them right now and helping us always available to us. Sarah Bird. Man, did, mm -hmm. I, time that, did I time that right? <laughs> Boom. Sarah Bird. Back oh. at the office. We left you at the office. Sorry about that, Sarah. <laughs> She's amazing. Sorry, I missed the long walk. Uh, I know, I know. She's amazing. I know we ribbed her a little, but honestly, when we talk about RAI, it's super important. We always consult with. She's her. our expert on everything responsible AI. So yeah, we can. We talk. We look for information all the time. All right. So now let's throw it to one of our MVPs, Makati Ohana Esteban Candido, content creator at Explicami. What's your question, my friend? Yeah, it's great to be here. Well, my question is, what are the three biggest challenges that Microsoft sees for AI in the coming years? And how are you preparing to be part of this journey? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question and, and something we think about a lot of what's coming up and what's next in, in AI. And so if I were to say the three biggest challenges, one is, you know, we've seen these really large language models like GPT-3 and, uh, you know, they're, they're really powerful and amazing, the types of things that they can do. And now we're working a lot with customers to figure out how do we take that power and really bring it into the applications that customers are really going to value and use. And so there's a lot of work with customers hand in hand to figure out exactly what these scenarios are and, and how do we set things up just right to really make things work the way that our customers are looking for them to. Um, probably the second thing is, is pretty related to that is these models are really large and so we're spending a lot of time focusing on how do we make it efficient to serve these at scale? You know, how do we reduce the cost of serving? How do we use the latest and advanced hardware to really accelerate the models and, and the inferencing speed of it? And so a lot of time and effort going into that as well. Uh, the third thing I'd probably say is, uh, you know, with AI just exploding over the last, you know, five years, even decade, uh, it's still too hard to use. And so we spend a lot of our time working with customers, trying to simplify the way that they can take AI and use it in their applications. Everything from the things that we're doing in Azure Machine Learning to make things simple, to, you know, more packaged solutions like our cognitive services and making those really easy to consume. That's cool. I mean, there's a lot of innovation. I love the large language model stuff. Yeah, it's really exciting the, the way that that's really changed the industry transformer. Oh, Transformer. see? Transformer. All right, joining us next is Ivana Tilka, Technical Innovation Evangelist, 3XM Group. Hi, Ivana. What's your question, my friend? Hi, Eric. Hi, Seth. Uh, my question would be, what are some use cases of Azure OpenAI that companies are taking advantage of right yeah. now? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, one of, some of the things that we're seeing are, um, you know, this, this model predicts text, but what we really want to do is, is have it do really useful things like, you know, Seth mentioned summarizing emails, right? And so can you take text and summarize? We've worked with CarMax and, and we talked about them, um, you know, how they're looking at all of these customer reviews of cars and all the different car models and how they can sort of put that together. It's a massive amount of customer generated content. And to be able to, to figure out what are the sales points from that and summarize that so that customers can read what other people said about this car and really trust and understand it without having to go through just tons and tons of models and, and things like that. So we've seen a lot of use cases like that. We've also obviously with uh, Copilot, we see a lot of natural language to code scenarios. Uh, and it's even, Copilot is sort of the actual coding example, but it's expanding to a lot of places where, you know, you can use a 3D modeling engine and use natural language to say, move this object around or, or things like that. So we're seeing a lot of, of that type of use cases as well. And then of course, you know, bots and, uh, you know, being able to use those in customer support and scenarios where now the AI models really understand the language that we're talking and, and are, are much richer in terms of how they can respond to you. Um, so yeah, we, we think a lot about all of that. Sarah, any thoughts on large language models? What's, what's exciting about them for you? Azure OpenAI specifically. <laughs> You know, I think Azure OpenAI has been a great opportunity for us to really innovate in responsible AI as well, right? We actually need the technology to more deeply understand language and understand what people are saying to ensure that we're saying the things we want to say. And so this has been a really great chance for us to build the, you know, Azure OpenAI safety system around uh, around the core models to really improve the quality of the output of those models. And so uh, I think this is just the beginning where you know language is an incredibly powerful technology and there's so much potential for us to really have it work well in every single scenario. And so responsibly is a key part of that. That's a perfect segue. Uh, amazing question so far. Someone asked me this just as a segue, as part of the RAI approaches, how do we ensure that humans are still in the loop 
as well as new folks and younger generations who will use and support this in the future. Sarah. Uh, yeah, this is a great question, and uh, keeping humans in control is one of our core, you know, responsible AI values. Now, how we do this depends a lot on the scenario or the domain. In some cases, it might be perfectly fine to have humans carefully design the end-to-end -end system and review that and, and monitor the output or monitor it in an ongoing way. However, in higher stakes domains or places where an error might have a higher impact, then you're going to want to look at other patterns. Like we may want humans to be uh, inserted in the application to check for errors, or we may want humans to take the output and do a full review and go and use that. So for example, in Copilot today, uh, the code that is generated is just a suggestion for the developer and the developer can take that, they can edit it, they're still going to put it through their normal software development process. And so ultimately, it's a tool to aid humans, but not uh, not full automation. And so all of uh, these different design patterns and guidelines are something that we've released as part of the Hacks Toolkit. So you can go and see how you can insert humans into your application. And we'll be releasing new ones for uh, GPT-3 specifically uh, soon. I, and this is really cool because ultimately, like, all software is for people, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, your thoughts, Eric, on this? I, I mean, it's just all about how you sort of teach everyone how to use this technology and, and really do it in a thoughtful way. And so, uh, yeah, that's one of our core tenets is that AI is, is it's really great at making predictions and we want to use those predictions to help humans make better decisions. And so ultimately, humans are always the consumer of it. And so how do we make sure that there's always that human in the loop? It's, it's a core thing that we think a lot about. I, I love it. Uh, also, we have Jazdeet Chopra, CEO, Pantera Technologies, who's in our live audience. Hello, Jazdeet, your question, my friend. Hey there, thanks for having me. So my question is, what will the future look like for AI and ethics? Oh, we're gonna, Sarah, future of AI and ethics. We, we did large language models, Azure OpenAI specifically. What about the future of AI and ethics? Sarah, over to you. Yeah, I think, you know, the big picture is part of uh, what we were talking to Seth about earlier, which is, of course, that we need to govern the technology responsibly. We need to develop the technology responsibly. And we need to ensure that the technology is used responsibly. Now, of course, that's a higher level framework. And there's a lot of work to do within each part of that. And so a lot of the future, I think, is making each part of those real. In the last couple of years, we've made a lot of progress on governance and how we develop the technology. But it's still, um, it's still early days in terms of how we empower others to use it responsibly and build on top of it. So that's, I think, a, a big area where we are focused is a lot of product implementation patterns like we have the idea that you know models need to be fair but what does that mean in terms of gpt3 and so we've talked about the safety system we've built there um, and so for each new emerging technology we're going to have to take those higher level principles and build that product implementation pattern i mean that's cool that we're we're thinking about it. i mean even in our even in our office time that we just had. Yes. We, we started out with Sarah telling us the principles, and then at the end, you know, Minsu talked about how we actually how do, do this. How do you apply them? No, and it's really important to think about. I mean, AI is evolving so rapidly and, and has benefited so much from just the, the rapid expansion and all the work on it together. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we have uh, just really, we feel an obligation as creators of this technology is to make sure the benefits accrue to everyone. And so as we think about how our AI and ethics going to go into the future, it's going to be really important to think about these models and creating them in really responsible ways and making sure that the whole world can benefit from them. And, and so we're, we work a lot on that. Yeah, this is really cool. Okay, so we've got about three minutes left. Top of mind for you and then top of mind for you. Yeah, I mean, top, there's so much exciting things going on, uh, so many exciting things. And, you know, what's top of mind as we think about it? Uh, how is this field going to continue to expand? We've seen you know, over the last decade, the, the theme really has been just make the model bigger. Deep learning, make the model bigger and vision gets better. Speech got better. For language, you had to make the models much bigger. Uh, and they're still continuing to improve as we improve the size and the scale of these models. So how do we continue that trend and how do we push on that while also making sure we've got the hardware and the, and the systems underneath of it to really go and deliver it? That's going to be sort of a key thing that we think about as we push the frontier forward. Um, and then from the customer side, it's really taking Taking these lab advances that we get from you know, working with teams like MSR and, and all the great research scientists, and how do we bring those to our customers in really simple, easy to consume ways that are, that are really going to transform businesses? I think those are the things that are most sort of top of mind for me. Sarah, for you. 
Yeah, I think building on what Eric was just saying, for me, it's thinking about that complete system. How do we take this incredibly exciting technology and really make it work in practice and robustly and fairly in every single case? And that's a full system and application design that's not just about the model. And so uh, building that in, in for every scenario, for everything that a customer wants to do uh, is really what's exciting and top of mind for me. That's cool. And Sarah, where does even someone start with RAI. I wish you could wheel in that TV again for us, <laughs> yeah, Sarah. Exactly. Um, I think, uh, you know, at the beginning, right, you have to know what you're trying to do with the technology and what are the potential benefits and what are the potential downsides. And then with that information, you've got to, you know, really think about how you're going to achieve those benefits and mitigate those risks. Amazing. Fortunately, we have lots of great tools to help. So uh, responsibly, I dashboard. That's where you should start. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, MVPs, for your questions. We really appreciate you. Also, Eric and Sarah, this has been awesome. Always. Love always my, fun. Love my teammates. To quickly recap what we've covered, we actually built an app. We had a hugging face announcement, some stuff about Meta. We had the RAI dashboard and scorecard. And yes, don't forget to check out Breakout 13 and Breakout 21 to see our applications in action. You can find those in the session scheduler. Fantastic. And for more AI awesomeness from Microsoft Build, be sure to check out aka.ms forward slash build Azure AI. Sarah and Eric, thanks again for being here with me. And one more big thank you to our MVPs for joining us from around the world. Before we go, I have to shout out to our wonderful team who helped put our video together. Sarah, Minsu, Eric, all the wonderful people, right, Abe. Abe. Uh, and that's our show. I'm Seth Juarez. I hope you've enjoyed Microsoft Build into focus on AI as much as I have. Have a great Microsoft Build. We'll see you on the flip side. We're back and day two of Microsoft Build is in full swing. Yep, it's clear that Azure AI is opening up new opportunities across industries right now. Plus, it's always great to see Seth. He loves talking about AI. Of course, <laughs> even if he did scare some of his coworkers from, <laughs> from the a looks of it a little bit. <laughs> so before we move on, we'd like to take a moment to invite you to an interview that I got to host on day one with F5 exec Eric Braun about the newly unveiled Nginx for Microsoft Azure. Now that Nginx is an Azure native SaaS offering, we naturally had some questions about the new load balancing solution. Learn from Eric how Nginx for Azure can help you easily deploy and operate your apps and services in the cloud, migrate from on-prem, and so much more, complete with a customer success story. Visit our feature partner showcase and save F5 to your backpack to access this conversation, plus all of the tools and resources that F5 has to offer here at Microsoft Build. Switching gears, Seth Juarez and Mark Rosinovich joined us day one to talk about confidential computing and our journey towards becoming the confidential cloud. Here's part two of their conversation about the value of container apps. Hello and welcome back to Microsoft Build. I'm Seth Juarez and I'm pleased to be joined by Mark Rosinovich, Azure Chief Technical Officer. They still let you do that around here? Yeah, pretty much. Fantastic. Yeah. So, what are you most excited about Microsoft Build? Announcements, containers. Yeah, cont uh, Azure Container Apps with Dapper GA. That is correct. You were excited about the confidential ones. Yeah. Yes, confidential. That's what it was yesterday. That was yesterday. Yeah. So for those that maybe didn't watch Ignite last time and introduced Azure Container Apps with Dapper, why don't we start with the container yeah. apps? Well, Tell us about those. Sure. Container Apps is a serverless application platform that lets you deploy applications that consist of microservices. And it's got capabilities built into it to let you track upgrades, to do A-B testing, to do network isolation. Uh, it really makes it really painless to create an application without having to learn a lot of infrastructure and orchestration. I, here's the thing. I had to do a container thing with orchestration. I think it was Kubeflow or something, yeah. machine learning. It was actually really quite hard. So I, I know that we have Azure Container Apps, but me throwing up an app and having to throw up another one how do you get the distributed programming problem to go away, which is yeah. still a problem? Well, so built into it is something called Dapper, which loosely represents distributed application runtime. It is a managed part of container apps, meaning you don't need to deploy it yourself or upgrade it yourself. And it provides what, what we call a set of building blocks, where building blocks take care of certain kinds of 
problems that you would have to deal with writing a, a cloud native application. For example, some of the building blocks include secret management, so that it'll manage your secrets for you and give them to you when you need them. It's a pub sub for uh, doing inter process communication, a state store for saving data, a service to service communication, configuration management, and the list goes on and on. I, so that's fantastic, and I, I'm hearing you, but when I'm writing a container, you know, I mean, let's just yeah. say I did a Python thing, right, and, and a Flask something. How, where is Dapper living? Do I have to like write Dapper into my code, yeah. or how does that work? So Dapper is available as a sidecar, which exposes an HTTP or gRPC endpoint to your application. So you can just call into it directly. So any language, any framework can leverage the sidecar without having to use an SDK. Now, Dapper does have SDKs to make it easier to, to use from certain languages, but you don't need it. And just to give you an example of how powerful it means, for PubSub, for example, where you want to do uh, inter process communication and uh, your app, does, you don't want to learn the SDK for event hubs, for example. Right. You just use Dapper's PubSub building block. You plug in the component at runtime for event hubs. You could also plug in Service Bus or RabbitMQ or Kafka right. without changing any of your code, and it'll leverage that as the pub subsystem. And it'll do the authentication for you, it'll do retries for you. So it, it's like your butler, like your dapper butler. Interesting, so literally, uh, that's why there's, that's yeah, why it has that right. hat. That's right. So it's like literally you're in your code, and you're like, hey, can you, can you go tell the other service to take care of something for me? And it will just do it. That's right. So I feel like I need to look at how this works. Do you have, did you bring a demo? Yeah, I've got a little demo to show you. All right, let's take a look at that. All right, so here we have an application that consists of two microservices. It's a checkout microservice that gets orders and sends them to an order processor that does whatever with them and stores them in a Dapper state store. It's fully Dapperized, meaning the checkout microservice can call directly into the other one using Dapper. And here we deploy it. All it takes is three lines to enable Dapper there for the application. As an AZ command. Looks with like. the uh, Azure command line. And then you can see I've got it running here. You can see the order processors printing out orders as they come in. For every one, you, you can see there it's the sidecar there, the Dapper sidecar there along with the microservice. Now for every one of these, the, like I said, the front end, the order, the checkouts sending to the order back end, you can see that visualized here because Dapper is instrumented and you can plug in any kind of telemetry system here, including Azure App Insights, to get this instant dash view dash without the developer having to write any code. You can see the latency between the front and the back end. You can see all the calls to the state store as well. And you get that for free, plus you get secure service-to-service uh, -service communication using TLS. And then finally, you can network isolate the app, like I've done here. So it has no public IP address, or we can move it and have a public IP address. So you get kind of best practices security capabilities built into it easily as well. That's really cool. And that's because if you use Dapper, with Azure Container Apps, you get all of this additional goodness on top of it, like, like seeing the things going between, yeah. just, and that's what I mean, you get. You can get that on your own if you instrument your code, but here Dapper just did all that for you. You didn't need to, to worry about it. And I think that's one of the challenges that I had when I was doing, started doing container stuff, is I couldn't see inside, I couldn't see how these things were talking to each other, and this makes it all a lot, a lot easier. Exactly, just, it's, it's really kind of just lets you focus on your business logic, you can implement things like a function style app, and you can actually think of this as functions for general applications, general cloud native applications. I see, but you own the container, own the container. basically. So I know it's, uh, what's the announcement for today at Build? At Microsoft built. The announcement is that we're GAing container apps plus Dapper. It also has Kata and Event Driven Autoscaler in, included in Envoy too for doing A B testing on top of it. All of that is going GA today. Fantastic. And are, are people like what's the experience been for people using this? So people love it because it's let's like I said, lets you focus on your business logic. It really represents the future of cloud native development where you don't have to learn about orchestrators and infrastructure, you just focus on the business logic. Fantastic. So where can people go to find out more if they want to learn about this? So that URL there, aka.ms slash ACA dash Dapper. Well, I'm excited to learn it and maybe not spend way too much time <laughs> figuring out the whole infrastructure stuff. I love the idea of it being like a serverless thing. All right. Make sure you go to that link for sure. All right. That's Mark. I'm Seth. And that's Container Apps and Dapper. That's all from us. Enjoy the rest of Microsoft Build 2022. Hello, my name is Damon Moff, and I lead the amazing team of PMs working on Azure Machine Learning. Join us for our breakout session, Scaling Responsible MLOps with Azure Machine Learning. 
we will go deep into our Azure ML platform with action-packed demos. See you there. Hi, I'm Tim Hewer, and in my session, my team will show you how to build beautiful cross-platform apps with .NET MAUI. Hi, I'm Jessica Craig. Welcome to Microsoft Build. I'll be joined by Michael Gillett, and we'll be talking about how to deliver cloud-scale developer productivity and the future of the Dora metrics. Coming up next, it's another Microsoft Build into focus. This time, the team is diving into low-code, no-code solutions using Microsoft Power Platform. Check out what they're doing right over in the, in the other studio right now. We've got the cameras up and running. You're definitely going to want to stick around for that. Let's turn now to NVIDIA, who brings us this next story from one of their customers. The Archer Daniels Midland Company, or ADM, is a nutrition leader powering many of the world's top food, beverage, health, and wellness brands. Partnering with manufacturing data platform Site Machine, ADM has developed a new tool that uses NVIDIA GPU technology, hosted on Microsoft Azure, to organize data and speed up AI-led transformation across ADM's factory floors. Let's learn more from the ADM Principal Analytics Engineer, Isaac Humunga. Isaac, hello, welcome. Hello, Sonia, thanks for having me on the program. Hey, excited you're here. Awesome, okay, so let's get started. What challenge is ADM trying to solve and how are Site Machine and NVIDIA helping you in this process? Yeah, ADM manufacturing facilities around the globe are working to transform natural products into complete portfolio of ingredients and flavors for foods and beverages, supplements, nutrition for pets and livestock, and more. In order to give us and our customers a competitive advantage, we use data to make better decisions at every part of our global supply chain, including at our manufacturing locations. Many techniques and products exist that use machine learning and AI to uncover value in our processing facilities. Some identify when to take equipment offline for maintenance prior to unscheduled downtime, other models find opportunities to save money, reduce energy, or increase yield. In theory, these models can be ran against our entire data set, but in reality, there's a lot of contextual information and limitations that must be taken into account for every use case. A machine learning model might think it's possible to save steam in a process by reducing a temperature set point, but perhaps reducing that temperature set point would increase the likelihood of making out of spec product. Similarly, Models need to understand what parts of a process we can change and which ones we can only react to. If a unit operation exists to process the byproduct of another process, we not, might not be able to speed up or slow down that line, even if an analysis of that system indicates it would be cost effective to do so. Setting these techniques loose on a data set just results in an enormous amount of work for a subject matter expert familiar with that process to sift through the model outputs and recommendations and find the real opportunities. We need to tell these systems where the boundaries are, and to do that, we need to find data points that represent those boundaries. So, despite the countless opportunities to apply new and innovative analytics and modeling techniques, we found that all of these are at best significantly hindered, or more often, rendered ineffective unless they're given data that has at least a minimum amount of curation. With hundreds of thousands of applications, each with tens or thousands of potentially important variables, this step is paralyzing. Our challenge is getting data ready for AI by tying tags to specific equipment properties. After repeatedly demonstrating that garbage in leads to garbage out, we need to get our data organized so models give us useful information. We have shown that doing some pre-work significantly speeds up projects and improves returns, but we need to do that at scale, and we need to do it fast. Asking people to, uh, at, a, at a plant to manually categorize tags or their own data, it's a worthwhile effort, and while it provides significant value, it would require an enormous amount of time and effort to categorize our millions of tags around the globe. We need to move faster. Now that brings us to Site Machine and their project to speed up the process of identifying and categorizing process data. The idea is to use a combination of techniques to group tags together using both meta and payload data, and to use those groups to guide subject matter experts through filling out a hierarchy of process equipment. If an SME is asked to find the feed flow from a list of 20 tags with relevant information right at their fingertips, they can move much faster than needing to manually search for that tag. This will let our experts focus on more important tasks and expedite the rollout of all sorts of initiatives that leverage our data to improve margins, 
operate more sustainably, reduce our environmental footprint, and produce products with the best quality. Awesome. So how's the process going right now? How's it unfolding? Status update? Yeah, <laughs> we're currently working with uh, Sight Machine to test their system. It, it's under development using NVIDIA hardware and software, and it, it's, ho it's hosted on Microsoft infrastructure. And it automatically groups tags in a way that can be quickly interpreted by subject matter experts at each location. We're working with about three quarter of a million tags from five locations right now, uh, but we're really excited to see how we can apply this to our entire set of manufacturing data. The focus uh, today is making a user interface that's intuitive, easy to use, and of course, fast and efficient. Great, so what's next for ADM with the solution? Well, the current trial should wrap up this summer. Uh, no doubt there's going to be fine tuning of the results and future iterations, but we look forward to using this new technology to prepare our data for ML and AI algorithms that will continue to give us a competitive advantage by rapidly and accurately using data to drive decisions. And we're really excited to see how Sight Machine, NVIDIA, and Microsoft can help us do that. Awesome. We're excited to see it too. I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Isaac, for joining us. Yes, thank you. Awesome. I love how great partnerships like this can make new cool AI tech like this happen. For more from NVIDIA, check out the breakout session they are co-leading with Microsoft experts on Azure Cognitive Service Deployment. Following that, NVIDIA will also take part in Ask the Experts and Table Topic sessions. Visit NVIDIA and the Feature Partner Showcase for details. Now, over to Leslie. Thank you, Sonia. I'd like to welcome Bob Sayre, who's the Vice President of Engineering for Azure Communication Services. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Leslie. It's great to be here at Microsoft Build. Sweet, yeah, so how is your build going so far? It's awesome. I mean, I just love Microsoft Build. As you know, it's all about developers, and so many Microsoft teams have built so many great things for developers, and it's great to see it all come together here. And I'm excited to talk about Azure Communication Services. Yeah, so speaking of which, just right off the bat, you know, building real-time communication apps can be pretty challenging, but it doesn't have to be, right? So how can Azure Communication Services make those apps easier for developers to build? Sure thing. So think of ACS as the communications platform for developers to bring video, voice, chat, SMS, telephony, and other communication capabilities into their apps. And what's great about ACS is that developers can achieve this with just a few lines of code. So we made it really easy for them to build amazing experiences for their customers instead of worrying about the complexities of building real-time communications infrastructure. That is awesome. And clearly ACS is extremely powerful and almost like having a communications toolkit for developers. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about it, such as I did hear through the grapevine that ACS can work together with Microsoft Teams. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, that's right. Microsoft Teams has become the leading platform for collaboration with over 270 million monthly active users and growing. And with ACS, now developers can build powerful applications that can connect users on Teams and users on any custom app through our APIs and SDKs. And the applications to this are endless for different scenarios across industries, healthcare, wellness, financial services, and others. The most typical being virtual visits, where external customers enjoy a customized application, either web or native, to connect, while employees and internal users enjoy their familiar Teams experience that they use and work at work every day. That is neat. I love how that really does expand the reach of Teams to almost everybody, and I am sure that all the devs out there are starting to see the full capabilities of ACS. But you mentioned virtual visit apps, which I feel like is even more relevant in today's hybrid world. Like I hate having to drive 30 minutes for a five minute appointment and dealing with parking on top of all that. So how can developers get started building those virtual visit apps like the ones you talked about? Yeah, sure. So today we're excited to announce the Azure Communication Services Sample App Builder. With this no code solution in just a few minutes, developers can easily configure and deploy a virtual visits sample app that leverages ACS and Teams interoperability for video, calling and chat, plus Microsoft bookings for appointment scheduling. So the sample app provides an end-to-end -end scenario for customers to book consultations, get notifications, and join the virtual visit directly through a custom web application. Meanwhile, the staff joins appointments through the familiarity of the Teams client that they use and love every day. That's great, so you've got this no-code template that it sounds like developers can expand upon. So how can devs dig a little deeper and customize that uh, template? 
Yeah. So the sample app builder is fully open source, and developers can customize it however they need. For example, you can customize the calling UI with pre-built components from our UI library. And instead of using Microsoft Bookings, you can create your own custom booking solution using Microsoft Graph APIs. You can also build custom notifications, either using our SMS service or by using our brand new Azure Communication Services email SDKs, which we're excited to announce is available in public preview today. Ooh, tell me more. <laughs> yes, uh, so Azure Communication Services email is going to simplify the integration of email capabilities to applications. And this is very useful for developers when, for example, they want to send a confirmation email for virtual visits, as we saw previously, or if they want to send email notifications or alerts to a large volume of customers. And really, any application that leverages email as a way of communication, so you can reach your customers in their preferred communication channel. Yeah, so email is definitely an important part of that. So how can developers get started with that SDK? For sending emails, we focused on easing the onboarding steps for domains and improving the end-to-end -end experience. We have great documentation in our Microsoft, Microsoft Docs site for developers to start using it, but basically we have three easy steps. Set up and verify your own domain or use Azure managed domains. And then you connect your verified domain. And then finally, write code to send email through two sample APIs one call to send email and the other to get message status. So you can see the email that I just sent using this. And now I can integrate this to send emails for an appointment reminder, reminder and more. That's awesome. I love hearing three easy steps. Personally, it just <laughs> makes me excited knowing that my productivity is going to improve and possibly the time to market is going to accelerate as well. So how can developers learn even more about all these awesome announcements? Yeah, so we prepared three sessions at Build where developers can learn more about these announcements. So follow the links and join us. We're looking forward to meeting you all. And don't forget to check out our Build blog post where you can also learn more about additional announcements such as the GA of UI mobile library and voice numbers in new regions. Exciting stuff. And that was a lot of cool content. Can't wait to check out those Build sessions. And I'm excited to see what developers are going to build next with ACS. So thanks for chatting with me, Bob. Thank you. Hello everyone, Navin Chand here with more ways to get the most out of your time here at Microsoft Build. This time we're pulling back the curtain and shining a light on Ask the Experts, one of our most popular connection zone experiences. Taking a moment away from planning these sessions is Alex O'Donnell. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So, why do you think Ask the Experts are so popular? Oh, I like it, Navin. Starting with the easy ones. All right. Um, so look, I think we can all remember the day where we have an event in person and they present some great content and then attendees would sort of, you know, rush to the front of the, the speaker desk and have all these questions and all this dialogue with speakers. And that's the great mark of great content, I think, when there's great questions provoked from it. Um, but we realized it would be such a disservice in the digital world to just have five minutes Q&A at the end of every session. These are sessions in their own right. So we want to give as much time as we can and fit in as many questions as we possibly can manage to answer in the time allotted, fingers crossed. You know, it's, it's funny. I was one of those people that would be <laughs> waiting at the front of the stage in live events. So for planners like us, you know, you were the logistical nightmare because I remember times where we there were so many questions, we needed the room back and we had to sort of move people on. But the great thing in the digital world is, hey, this is all in Microsoft Teams. So we can just kind of spin up more Ask the Experts. So we'll do as many as we can, even for people like you with a lot of questions. You know, and that's the thing, you know, we would crawl ourselves into the show floor or the expo floor and be able to have those face to face interactions. And I love Ask the Experts being that moment to, to kind of fill that need. And, and so I'm very thankful for those Ask the Experts sessions. They're all wonderful. But, you know, what happens if I miss them? Well, you mean you've got a better offer or something? Or are you like me? and that you're probably double, triple booked and you know, you're know you spoiled for choice. So yes, we recognize that you can't probably be in multiple places at once because I mean, you're good, but you're not that good. So yes, we're proud to say that of course it's all about the live, but every Ask the Expert session, all recorded, all available on demand, watch at your leisure. Amazing stuff. Alex, thank you so much.
Head on over to the Connection Zone tab at the top of the page and navigate to Ask the Experts. If you can't attend them live, just add them to your backpack for later. Ask the Experts. Dive deeper, learn more. It all happens in the Connection Zone. Awesome, there's some great uh, resources in the Connection Zone, so check them out. Next up, I'd like to welcome Senior Product Marketing Manager, Harshitha Murthy, to the studio. Welcome, Harshitha. Thanks, Sonia, it's great to be here. Awesome, she's also on my team, which is exciting. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. I would love for you to tell our audience how the latest innovations powered by AI and advanced processing are driving advances in hybrid work. Yeah, in the new hybrid world, it's paramount to build an experience that recreates the feeling of everyone being in the same room, even when they are miles apart for better collaboration. So here's what we did. We took our most powerful Surface device ever, Surface Laptop Studio, and created immersive audio and video experience with advanced AI and audio processing capabilities. Oh, I'd love for you to dive a little bit deeper how it works. Yes. First of all, we built our very own Surface AI face detection algorithm. It perfects exposure and lighting for you on video calls, enhancing your face even in the toughest light conditions so you always look great on camera. In fact, our AI dev team used the GPU power on this device to build out the prototype out of the neural networks and the results are stunning. Secondly, online conversations with colleagues feel more like they're face to face because your voice is captured more clearly. Thanks to the powerful studio mics, you can be heard clearly even when others are talking simultaneously all made possible through voice clarity. An audio processing feature that delivers a more natural voice capture with richer tones and crisper details, whether you're sitting, standing, or walking around in your room. I love it. So how can a developer who has an application that leverages a microphone, how can they leverage this technology? Yeah. As a developer working on audio stream, there are multiple streams available for different purposes. If the developer does not specify any audio stream, then the default is the other. Every audio stream has its own functionalities and we included the voice clarity effect in the communications audio stream. Awesome, so as a developer, if they need to get voice clarity into their applications for users using Laptop Studio, all they have to do is use the communication stream category? <laughs> yes, it's as simple as that. The general guidance that I would give to the developer community is, first get a controllable system effects list, find out what effects exist for different OEMs, and then make a decision on which stream they would like to use, and some may even decide to customize it. Awesome. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit. I know we have a ton of great Surface devices, I'm only slightly biased, but which uh, device is the most ideal for developers? Which surf, uh, Surface device? Uh, definitely Surface Laptop Studio. Awesome, why is that? One of the unique things about this device is its flexible form factor. With different postures, it allows you to do different things. The very first thing is on the laptop mode, the typing on this device feels great. It feels natural, it sounds great, and the key travel is perfect. And we also have the haptics touchpad, which is our largest touchpad yet. And then with just a few gestures, intuitive gestures, you can navigate or simply create using the entire touchpad. And now you will notice with just a light movement, I can transition it into stage mode, which is perfect to be used as a third screen when I'm connected to multiple 4K monitors. Or even a developer can use this in uh, just to watch movies or just games when they have code compiling in the background. And now you will see the third mode when I transition this all the way flat into the studio mode, which is perfect for inking. Here, I can quickly grab my Surface Limp Pen 2, which is just underneath the device here. And as soon as I open it, Windows recognizes this and presents me with multiple inking options. Here, I'll just go ahead and quickly choose whiteboard. The developer can use this to ink, get their ideas across, use this for architecture diagrams, or even collaborate with their friends or colleagues. So as I start inking on this device, the tactile feedback comes to life, which mimics the feeling of pen on paper, which just feels incredible. So overall, I would say this is a powerful device. That's also because we completely re redesigned the thermal module on this device with two fans and large side vents so that the customers and users can continue to use powerful applications in the background while they continue to do heavy lifting in the foreground as well. So I would say this is a great device with hedge uh, 
edge class processor with flexible form factor and NVIDIA GPU. This is a great device for creators, developers, and artists. Yeah, I love it. And one of my other favorite features is the pen. It's mag magnetically right. attached yeah. and charging at the same time. It's right. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where should our audience go to learn a little bit more? Yes, head to our Microsoft Surface YouTube channel where we do a deep dive into automated testing framework in Android foldables and go behind the scenes and learn how the engineers built our most powerful Surface device ever. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today, Harshita. Thanks, thanks for joining. So, thanks for having me, Sonia. Hey, I joined you too. Yeah, this yeah. is great. <laughs> The excitement continues here on day two of Microsoft Build. Remember to keep saving your sessions and other great content to your digital backpack so you can review it in the future. You know, it's like having a backpack from school, but you don't have to drag it anywhere because it's all digital. What's not to like? So we'll see you right back here after this session. And now, here's Caruana. Welcome to Microsoft Build Into Focus, where for the next 45 minutes, we're deep diving into the digital transformation enabled by Microsoft's low-code offering power platform. There's so much ahead, like an insightful customer story, demonstrations, and even audience questions. Let's hop in. This is Into Focus Low-Code Solutions. Hello everyone, welcome, and thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Caruana Gatimu, your host for Into Focus Low Code Solutions using Microsoft Power Platform. I am thrilled to be here with all of you and with our Microsoft MVPs joining us from around the world via Microsoft Teams. Hi everyone. Let's recap what we've covered so far in, on Into Focus. On day one of Microsoft Build, we did a deep dive into the metaverse. And not long ago, Seth Juarez showed us how to build applications powered by AI, which leads us to our show here. Joining me on this journey into fusion development is Julie Strauss, general manager for the pro developer and admin experiences across Power Platform. Hi, hey, Julie. Hey, Corona. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. I know. I'm really glad that you're here. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, but first, before we get started, I, I know we're going to be talking about Fusion Team Development and Power Platform's commitment to it. But first, can you tell us what is that all about? I mean, help our under audience understand Fusion Team Development. What does that mean? Yeah, no, Fusion Team Development is really this practice of um, building teams that build software solutions together. So you have citizen developers, pro developers, and IT uh, professionals that really build solutions together. And, and the goal is really to accelerate that development cycle and take unique skills from each of these audiences and like accelerate that whole digital transformation journey. I think that's fantastic because I'm all about bringing people together. I just think it unlocks creativity and diversity and all that good stuff. So um, when these audiences come together, I imagine that they're delivering more business impact as a single unit. Do I, do I have that right? Yeah. No, and it's really, you take the citizen developers who are typically not technical people and they pair their expertise of the business with these local technologies mm -hmm. that allows them to build solutions that really fills a gap for the business. Then you have the pro developers who can write code and can kind of extend the solutions in case you run out of steam and you hit a cliff, mm -hmm. you can really build components as pro developers. And then you have IT who built the foundation, like they set up the guardrails for governance, etc. And depending on the company also sometimes run DevOps, CI, CD pipelines if they're more business critical solutions. So that's kind of how they all come together. Yeah, it feels like each developer has a role there. Are there more roles we should be thinking about or is that really how the team is actually working? Um, there's always room for more and we'll <laughs> actually see some of that a little bit later on. But those are kind of the key components that, that we think about uh, when it comes to fusion teams. That's great. Okay, so now we have the people, we understand the roles and I understand that. Um, but help me understand this. If I'm a pro developer, right and I can write code why do I care about this new fancy term it's a great question <laughs> uh, and I think the main question is really or the, the main benefit is really business impact like we all want to have business impact and if you can write code 
we are not asking you to put your coding skills on the shelf. We are actually asking you to bring that to the table, collaborate with the business and figure out how can you help amplify that, like build components. So instead of building a solution where you build the full stack and you take months, sometimes years to build a solution that maybe reach a few hundred people, if you can build components to enable other makers to take that even further, you can start reaching thousands of users. So. We're really asking the pro developers to join the journey and be the heroes of driving low code. Absolutely, you know, and they're used to being heroes too. And now we have a whole now that's more reason. group of them. Absolutely. Yeah. So, how are you bringing all this together to enable fusion development? Yeah, the, if you look at the actual low code platform, we have done a lot. We have actually done a lot this past year to get to a very good place when it comes to fusion development. Um, in the low code experiences, we have done a lot around like multiplayer, co authoring, co existing, where you can see your peers in the applications just like in words and you can comment and have a dialogue. But also on the pro or the code first uh, side of things, where we've been a little all over the place for a while, we've really gone to a good place where if you want to be in a right code and you want to be in VS, VS code, you can start there, you can update there, and you can complete your work there. So really optimize for allowing each audience to be in the tool where they have preference. So we're not asking everyone to be in the low code environment. We are asking you to contribute to low code development, but in your in your own way, so to speak. And we've, we've done a lot of investments for uh, creating uh, like liberating data sources through mm -hmm. custom connectors, mm -hmm. building UI components, uh, etc. The whole I, um, CI/CD pipeline as well with integration into GitHub and, and uh, Azure DevOps. So there's a lot of work we have done to optimize for each audience. And I think, I know we talked about this a little bit before, but I also wanted to bring in what I heard you say earlier about feedback. You've taken a lot of feedback from the community to make some of these decisions and investments. How does that work in your team? You know, people, people sometimes say, oh yeah, we tell Microsoft, but they're not really listening. I happen to know we're listening, but help our audience understand how your group listens. No, we, we do listen a lot. And look, we've gone in, we had done things wrong as well, but I feel we are correcting a lot of that. And we'll actually see a demo later on some of the experience we've really worked as tuning in to uh, how do we capture the interest and the energy from the pro developers as well. So we have an active listening system and, and I encourage everyone here, go to the forum, try it out and, and give us feedback. It's really the best way for us to build durable experiences for all these different audiences. Because customers always give us insights that we're not going to see from inside where we're working. Our experiences yep. of, you know, and our histories in this business is long. And so we have a certain perspective. I really feel like customers bring so much to the table for us to help us continue to innovate. Absolutely. It's kind of like fusion team development, it everyone is. coming yeah. together, right? With their own perspectives. Yeah. But also talk a little bit about, you know, you mentioned uh, Visual Studio and you mentioned VS Code. How do you think about the tools that we're bringing to those developer experiences? Do you really see them uh, as the favorite tools of a particular set of people or do you see some interchange between them? Help me understand that because I've gone from one to the other. I used to be yeah. in Visual Studio, now I pretty much live in VS Code. We do see a little bit of both, but we have clearly heard pro developers want to be in VS and VS Code. In the beginning, it was like, oh, everybody can be in low code. And it, was, it really didn't work that well. However, what we do see now that a lot of pro developers actually embrace low code. Mm -hmm. It's not as a full thing, but let's say you create a, uh, a custom connector over a legacy data source. If you just quickly want to build a UI on top, why not just go into low code and do it? It doesn't mean you're forgetting your coding skills. You're just building code first for the components where that's a requirement. But we see more and more pro developers really embracing the full platform. Um, so we do see uh, kind of a little bit more uh, exchangeability than we used to see. So That's great. I mean, this is really maturing very quickly. It's just, it's moving on and you're taking the feedback. It's really inspiring to see the way you're all are doing that. But um, so what are we discussing with the ZF group? I know we have these folks. What, what's, what are we gonna learn from them today? Yeah, so ZF group, is one of the largest automotive technology suppliers uh, and they have as part of their launch of uh, uh, Office 365 they actually let every single user have Power Platform as well and they are a phenomenal company that has embraced Fusion Teams mm -hmm. so not only are they using Fusion Team development when they create more complex applications they actually created a Fusion Team app 
for to encourage fusion team development. That's a lot of fusion team. <laughs> um, but they really built an app where the citizen developers can ask for help for the pro developers as well. So, so they they were really practical example that we thought we would share today to to get a feel for what it can look like. That's great. Well, let's take a look. I want to I want to see yeah, this. Yeah, we talked with them earlier, um, so we can we can roll the video. Yep. Hi. I'm Dil Yon, Senior M365 Cloud and Power Platform Architect at ZF Group. Today, I will be demoing our process to show how we accommodate Fusion development and enable citizen and pro developers to collaborate. Now with this process, our citizen developers can build more advanced apps that also includes pro developer participation and can have access to business critical data that was previously available only to our professional developers building code first apps. Now, citizen developers can make requests through a Power Apps UI that submits all required information through our automated backend pipelines, which automatically creates an Azure DevOps org with related projects where professional developers can pick up work items and run their work as they used to in a code first world. So let's get started. Here you can see the new request that I'm going to create for a new app I want to build. In this example, the app is using third-party OAuth. As I'm submitting, I'm notified that it's going to take some time for IT security to review through our approval flow. Switching over to Outlook and looking at it from the decision maker's point of view, they receive actionable email messages in Outlook that enables them to quickly act on this without navigating anywhere else. When they are done, the requester receives feedback that the request has been approved and they can proceed with their work. Now, let's jump over into the DevOps side of things to show what happens behind the scenes for this business critical apps that requires a more structured process to build and release. In this example, we will show this from an Azure DevOps request app. Since it is a great example, of an app built by Fusion Teams that requires work from both citizen and professional developers. So now, after the request is approved, a lot of automation happens in the background. The new build from the alpha pipeline takes place, and now as we can see that a request is successfully pushed from the alpha Git repo to the Power Platform environment of that requester. And that solution package is an app called Azure DevOps Request App. And if we jump over to the environment to where it's been deployed, you can see the app itself. Here they are able to submit things such as creating new projects, creating work items, and even enable traditional code for a source control. So here I entered my org, my URL for my work, and here's the project name, Microsoft Build 2022, with description, work item process, source control, and request ID. Once I submit, in the background, I have a logic app that is triggered, adding all the request details from the app I showed previously. Here, I am also using an Azure function that creates the project with all the information for us. Of course, we can also monitor the success of the work here, just like we would with our traditional code-first development. So now through this work, we can really focus on cloud adoption side of things and helping everyone connect and collaborate to build applications spanning code first in Azure, handled by our professional developers and the power platform for our citizen developers. I hope you enjoyed this demo and please enjoy the rest of Microsoft Build 2022. That was really cool. I, I liked what they did there. I, I, we were saying during the break, I usually don't like things in the way of provisioning, but I liked that whole scenario there. I it's, thought it was cool. Yeah, it's very powerful. So now let's take a question from our audience. Sharon Sumner, CEO of Casper 365 has a question. Sharon, over to you. Hi, Julie. What are you seeing as the biggest challenges organizations are having when adopting the low code model? That's a great uh, question. And I think uh, we used to have a little bit of uh, challenges getting the different audiences connect, but I feel we have solved for that. I think the main challenge we see right now is it can sometimes be IT, right? Say, oh my gosh, I'm going to give all this power to users and they're going to create so many apps and what am I going to do? But the reality is because it is a managed platform, 
uh, you really bring visibility to IT by embracing the platform. So instead of not knowing what is being built, you're really creating a foundation for giving yourself the visibility. So it's a little bit of a mind shift, like how do we open our minds a little bit and embrace what is already being built, but get visibility so we can manage it. And I think that mind, that, that change in the thinking and approach, it's very different. That can sometimes be a challenge, but we see more and more companies who are getting really comfortable uh, rolling it out more broadly. So it's, a, it's a great question and we see it all the time. It's such a great point. You know, in my own experience and being an IT professional, I know that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when you're worried about the things that are out there that you're going to have to support and what if something goes wrong and what have you. But, you know, seeing the solution from from ZF and then the group and then also hearing you talk about it, there's so much management capability there that you get that transparency. Yeah. You can be more comfortable as an IT professional with being able to drive this transparency. Otherwise, you have shadow IT which we've had for many, many years. Yeah, and, and this is actually the opposite of, of shadow IT. It brings it out so you have visibility. Any connector being used, any app being created, you have the visibility. That's actually luxury in my mind, so. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing too is, is that you can't, IT cannot build every single thing all the time. There's no. just more work than any of us could ever get done. So, you know, I, I just, I find the whole thing fascinating, this, this huge shift that we're doing, right? So it's fantastic. So now tell us about Power Apps and some of the key product updates. I know there's some exciting oh, yeah. stuff there um, that is going to su support Fusion development. Yeah. You know, we always talked about Fusion development is all about collaboration, doing things faster. But we are adding, and I was hinting to it a little bit, we are adding prettier to the mix. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, launched what we call Express Design, which is really integration into Figma. So imagine you work with your design team and they sit and they live in Figma. M many designers love living in Figma and they come up with this pixel perfect design. Mm -hmm. And now you, when they are done, they hand it over to the app maker who now try and mimic that same design inside uh, your app maker experience. Not anymore. You can actually take this Figma design and import it directly into Power Apps and magically create an app with it. Wow. The ease of that workflow, it, it sounds magical. People have been yes. using that word today, so I'm going to use it too. <laughs> it's really intriguing to me. But plus, anytime you can save in that process is great. It gets yeah. people to value more quickly. So can you show us? I thought you would never ask. <laughs> so this app we're going to show you, it was uh, created for um, people working with uh, hearing and language uh -huh. in a company called um, New Hearing Australia. And you see here, we are in Power Apps. We started, we can see there are three sc screens in the demo. The last screen is really a uh, area where you can input training information and sign up. You can see we, have, we don't yet have a submission button, so we will add that just to give you a feel. The app also have information about the community that they're gonna visit so you can get educated in the process. Um, but if you see here, we will add a button, and this is just how Figma works. I'm the designer, and you can see I can line it up pixel perfectly to where I want it to be. And I, I could just rename it here to submit. Mm -hmm. And now we have this three page app, which really looks like a power app, but you can see it's perfectly laid out exactly like you would as a professional designer. Uh, so now we can save this file and we can navigate into power apps. And you see blank app there. This is really where we would normally start blank canvas and you start recreating. But if you see here, we have the Figma entry point mm -hmm. where when you cl click this, we can point to the file. We can give it a name. We can call it New Hearing Australia. We can link to the frame for the Figma file and give it uh, our personal access token and, check and select the format we want to use. And now, literally, magic is happening. The little <laughs> spinny there is building an app for us. Um, and it, it's really exciting because, as you can see, it come out exactly like it was designed. And you can see here we have the three different pages. We have the welcome screen for Lydia, our health worker, as well as the detail pane and the form that we created in the button. All I need to do now is hook that up to a database to take the input. That's really all there is. So it's not even no code is almost no touch, oh, right? Wow. So that's like bringing in additional um, people to this fusion team development. Right, and you know, being an adoption person, something that it looks appealing and has a wonderful user interface, it's easier to help people to use, right? And so that's always been true. This is beautiful and completely amazing. So what are some of the other advantages of that workflow and 
what impact it's going to, to have on organizations that you can think of? It is really, you touch on some of it, is the like beautiful apps drive more adoption, but it's also bringing all, in more people to that process, right? You have all these experts, and I think that's where Microsoft has such an advantage. Like, we have the professional developers, we have the citizen developers, now we can bring in designers. It's using this very unique expertise which is really what accelerates the process versus one person building the full stack. So it's really acceleration of, of the whole process, inviting more people to the party. And each one of those groups has their own culture too. And so I, I really am looking at, again, that people first initiative of having these people work together and learn from each yes. other. I learn from pro developers, I learn from designers, and now you can have all that together for the business. Yeah. That's that's really, that's huge. So I'm thrilled about, thrilled about this and it's, yeah. So impressive. Um, so for our audience to lean in and learn more about this important skill is something we want to do because that's what Microsoft Build is all about, right? It's about you getting to learn and putting your hands on the keyboard. So if that's what's on your agenda, be sure to check out the Power App session titled, What's New in the World of Microsoft Power Apps in the Session Scheduler? So we've seen what you just did in that demo, but are there other ways that the Fusion team can be extended? Yes. Uh, there's many ways. Actually, the entire pl power platform, you can extend. It's extensible all over the place. But I think we should pick the what we call the code first custom connector, uh, because that's very highly relevant for a pro developer audience. Uh, out of the box, the a power platform has 700, more than 700 connectors. It's amazing. And that's really what enables a lot of this app creation, right? You can have a legacy data source, and you can build the new, beautiful looking UI on top. Um, we have invested uh, quite a bit in making the experience single click from uh, Azure API uh, management to create a single uh, custom connector to Power Platform from that experience. However, let's come back to listening. We thought that was fantastic and a lot of Azure developers love it. But for those of us who want to live in VS Code, they were not that impressed with that experience. So what we did was invested in a code first experience for custom connectors, really making that seamless. If you want to live in code, you can live in code all the way through. So I thought we would take a, a look at a deeper dive on, on what that looks like. So, and also what you're saying is that the tools are becoming more powerful, right? You're streamlining them and expanding the audience so that the tools can support more people getting in on this entire situation. So uh, let's see some of that in action. Yeah, for let's sure. do it. So here you actually see the experience we have in API management. And uh, if we click create here, you will see with a single push of a button, you can actually push that uh, custom create uh, connector into the Power Platform. And inside Power Platform, you also have experiences. This is actually where you used to have to go and update these connectors. Um, but what we really want to enable was this code first experience. Uh, VS Code, for example. So if we switch over to, to VS Code, you will see that experience and, and how we can kind of work that end to end. So here you can see that uh, on the left hand nav, you can see that we already have the Power Apps extension installed. Uh, there you go. And with the authentication profile, we already connected to two different instances of Dataverse, which is really the back end uh, for the Power Platform. So this, this is one of these are my development environment. And uh, I already have my source code loaded. I have a, a open API definition that I work from. And if I here, you can see I use the pack connector create command, which is really what is creating the connector. The same as when you do it in the UI, you just do it in a code in a code first way. Once I have created that connector, I can also use uh, the list command to go and list all the custom connectors in my environment. And I can update it. So if I want to modify my source code, I can do that from in here as well. That might sound like, yes, of course I can, but that actually used to be very complicated because an update, you had to go into the Power Apps environment. So that's what I talked about in the beginning. We were kind of asking you to jump all over the place, but here you can start in VS Code, you can update, and now with your, when you've done your change, you can kick off a PR that will initiate that CI CD process. So behind the scene, Azure DevOps or, or um, Azure uh, or the GitHub Actions mm -hmm. will take care of that entire pipeline automation for you. And 
Now you can push that all the way into a Power App environment, and in the Maker experience, either a citizen developer can go ahead and work on that and create a UI on top of that connector, like any other connector, mm. or you can do it yourself if you want to quickly build a UI that goes on top of uh, of that experience. So. That's really start in code, stay in code. Mm, I love that because yeah. I heard Satya talk about also in his keynote yesterday, you know, the developer tool experience and keeping people in the flow. Yes. I feel like this is something about that. And I certainly know that, you know, attention, we talk about attention management and reducing the things that actually, uh, you know, impact your attention on anything. Yeah. I think as a developer, either citizen or professional, it's really important. So I, I'm getting the feeling that you're all thinking about that attention management, that flow state as you're building yeah. these things. Right. Yeah, so it's been a really, really big focus for us to make sure we we optimize again for each audience. Ah. They can live where they want to be. We're not asking you to go retrain in another tool, another language. We're really asking you to be in the tool of your choice and contribute uh, to this local journey. Yeah, absolutely. Because everybody's getting started. There's such an opportunity now from a career perspective, too, right? I feel like you're making these tools more accessible to more people, and we're going to see more creativity, you know, and I hope all of you out there, you know, share with us what you build, share with us that feedback, um, share with us how this is going for you as you're learning all of this, you yeah. know, use the, use the backpack uh, in the show uh, experience as well so that you can continue to go deeper and save the information that's about these tools because you know obviously we get to talk about it here um, but there's so much to do and I personally learn when I put my hands on the keyboard. Yeah. No that's what we want you all to do and bring the feedback back to us as well so so we can learn and make sure we built the right experiences for you all. Absolutely so it's great. Um, all right so we have more things to talk about more stuff to talk about now. Um, so similar to what I asked about express design workflow how does this impact in an organization? I mean how does it build on the fusion development philosophy? I think it's it's actually the same with the express design. It's really making sure that instead of asking people to move around and learn new experiences, we want to invest where people are comfortable working. We're not asking you to change your job, your experience, how you work. We really just want to amplify the notion of low code. So think of low code as a kind of a, a wave you're part of, mm -hmm. rather than the tools you are in. And that's really yeah. what we want to enable, make sure we give all these unique experiences. And, and honestly, that's where Microsoft is strong, right? Yeah. We know the developer community, we know the low code community. So building up those strong experience to support that is what we are really excited about. And I feel we've done a lot here in the last year, so. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's, you, just, you can see it as we review those 10 top trends that Satu talked about and everything else, you know, we're really, I love that, we're part of a wave yes. <laughs> not not just I made that up not just who I know you did and that's why I like that's why I like doing these things live because people make stuff up and it's awesome um, there's already been so much that we've covered um, but people looking for more go and check out the expedite application delivery with low code and fusion team session of course as I said you can add that via the session scheduler that session scheduler is really your curriculum for the future and so you want to just keep adding things to it so you can come back and also get all the resources and assets. So now let's take another question from our Microsoft MVPs. Beth Burrell, Senior Global Black Belt and Technical Specialist at Microsoft. Beth, over to you. Hey, Julie. Um, what I was wondering is how can we better help our customers and partners see how exciting the road ahead is for all the Microsoft Clouds? Ooh, that's also a great question. You picked the good ones here. I think, uh, obviously, follow Bill. We have lots of announcement blog posts. We also have our uh, roadmap released publicly, so you can go and see what's coming. But I think most important for me is ask you to all participate. Ask us to to give us feedback on what the roadmap should be. So to ask the pro developers, the citizen developers, to participate in that feedback cycle so we can make sure you are part of developing that roadmap moving forward. So lots of resources to go learn where, where we are going, but also use your, the kind of empowerment to go and influence where we should be going. That's fantastic. And there's one more question from the community. How committed is Microsoft to community and learning? 
right? We are so committed to community. Uh, we've just announced our new initiative, the Microsoft Community Initiative, and we want all of you to get involved. Uh, this is an opportunity to host community days. You can participate in our public advisory board. Uh, you can, again, give us feedback, but really lean in. And this is across Microsoft 365, Power Platform, the developer community. It's all inclusive. And I'm excited to have so much uh, initiative and uh, you know fo focus on this as we go forward. Because we've seen it, of course, during the pandemic, but even before, people's communities where people are learning and we're, we're learning so much from them. So get engaged, get connected. You can find out more by visiting aka.ms MCI blog. Uh, and there's the sign up there for all of the activities that we'll be doing. So hop over there and get engaged for sure. So, you know, and I know that, you know, you've been involved, both of us have been involved in community and, you know, the developer community has always been so vibrant, but do you see now that there's more diversity in it? Do you see like different people getting involved in the developer community and like identifying as a developer? We do actually, and we've done surveys where we ask the users of Power Platform how they identify, and there's actually a large portion now that identify as professional developers, mm -hmm. even they are like working in the low-code environment. Yeah. And so we do see a mix, and we see people who has never written a line of code, some even have never even written a SQL select statement, and they're building apps in Power Apps. They empower the entire enterprise and have built apps with hundreds, something, sometimes thousands of users, right? And it's that ability to start small, but have the solution grow up. And that really allow much more people to participate in that journey. Yeah, so um, we, we saw that at the beginning also, uh, you know, in the, the solution to help with the food bank donations in UK that was at the top of the show, yeah. you know, and I just think, you know, when people can apply this technology to help <laughs> others to solve world problems, like that's what we're here for. Yeah. Like, that's why I'm here. Yep. I think that's why we're all here. <laughs> yes. No, and I think with the Power Platform, this ability to see a problem and go and design a solution, even without being a developer, it is so empowering. So it's very inspiring as well. And apps feed more apps. And it is, it's really about solving problems for the business, which is much easier the closer you are to the business. Yeah, 100 percent. That's beautiful. That's quotable. I'm going to steal that from <laughs> you for sure. <laughs> We've been talking about how we're transforming the developer and the Fusion developer experience. But now let's think about the business opportunities that are available as well. We're going to have a fantastic conversation with Autodesk who are bringing in their customer Stantec. Julie, tell us about them. Yes, this one I am very excited about. I'm excited about everything as you might have seen by now, but I'm really excited about this one. So uh, Autodesk built software for the architecture, engineering and construction industry or AC. And they deliver software to customers that tackle designs that are kind of complex. They are complex because they handle large data volumes. They handle many different file types, but they also handle uh, intellectual property that customers really want to protect. Right, so Autodesk built a very clever solution where they are embedding Power Platform, Power Automate to be specific, into their SaaS software solutions so that they are extending the value of low code to their end customers. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a very exciting scenario that we have here. And um, so I wanted to welcome um, uh, Amy and, um, and Paul here to, say, to go through uh, some of the solutions they have built. Uh, so we have Amy here. She is the vice president of AC Design for Autodesk. And she's joined with, with Robert Manor. And um, Amy, I'm super excited for you to talk a little bit about Autodesk and, and kind of the organization that you are leading. Thanks, Julie. It's really great to be here. So Autodesk is a platform company for the design and make industries. We're best known globally for AutoCAD, but the Autodesk portfolio is expansive and it supports a wide range of purposes and industries, including media and entertainment, architecture, engineering and construction, and product design and manufacturing. Now, the AEC group that I am responsible for at Autodesk, we build software to support professionals who create the environments that you all experience every day. We support architects, engineers, and construction teams designing and building the homes and homes you live in, the office buildings you work in, roads, highways, parks, and transit stations that you use every day. And we do this by developing and improving our design authoring products, like our modeling workhorse, Revit. 
Now, for more than 30 years, we have worked with customers, firms like Stantec, which you'll hear from Robert in just a minute, to improve our products in targeted ways that make an impact for everyday users of these solutions. I love that. I love that customer focus, really embracing that. Uh, so with that, Robert, oh, sorry, do you want to? No, it's no? fine. I was, just, I was just going to call out the fact <laughs> that I, I want to make sure that everyone on this knows that our friends are live here with us. I yes. think that's really important. We really appreciate your time being here. And, you know, we've heard about Autodesk for so long, but I, I, I'm, I love that you gave that overview because it helps us understand really the breadth and depth of, of what's going on. And, yeah, Robert, would you um, welcome... Welcome. Would you like to tell us about Stantec and, and some of the challenges that you ran up against as you were working on this? Sure. Thanks, Julie and Amy. Uh, happy to be here. Stantec is a 25,000-person 25, global design firm, so I like to say we design everything that you use or inhabit uh, globally. The team that I'm part of is really helping our building design teams adopt a new technology and leverage all this data that they generate with products like Autodesk Revit and, and AutoCAD. One of the biggest challenges the design and building design industry has really is the fact that so much of our design data is locked into these proprietary file formats that Revit and AutoCAD and other products use. And, and so that's a challenge right there. We have all that data there. And then another challenge with these proprietary files is, is a scope and size challenge. So mm. a handful of files contain potentially a large chunk of our design scope and our design data, and those files can get fairly large, hundreds to hundreds of megabytes to even gigabytes. And ultimately, when we want to collaborate with people or even collaborate internally with our own teams, we only need to share a portion of that data. We don't need to ship a gigabyte file off to somebody when really we need to just share this small piece of data with them. And ultimately, that relates to another big challenge, which is QA, uh, quality control mm. for this data. Uh, because buildings are so large and complex, we need to be able to check individual pieces of the data and share those individual sets of data where it's appropriate, because ultimately, our legal responsibility rests in our drawings that we produce. So this notion of sharing data and transforming our industry is still is new in a lot of ways, and we're still trying to find the best ways to share that data. Mm. Wow. So, uh, Amy, as the executive vice president, you have some challenges here you, you need to solve for. Uh, so I love that dialogue. Um, and this is where you turn to Power Platform. Yeah, so as you can, you heard from Robert, we've got a lot of surface area to cover, both in data and in stakeholders. So in order to enhance our solution for customers like Stantec, we needed something that would help us unlock this siloed data and also speed up the transfer of that information. And we needed it to be supported by a seamless end-to-end -end workflow. So, you know, we looked at building our own workflow engine. That didn't make a lot of sense. It would have taken us a very long time to accomplish that. And so our team of developers built a connector and embedded the Power Automate capability directly into our own development platform, which is called Autodesk Forge. Now, this integration not only saved Autodesk years of development work, it also unlocked an amazing amount of innovation for us and for our customers using this application. I love that. And this is this is why I find this scenario so compelling, all the kind of investments that you are saving and yet providing value. Uh, so, Robert, why don't you tell about how you perceive that? What were the outcome of this from a benefit perspective from from your from your way? Right. So you talked on this about about this earlier, which is the, the notion of IT being concerned about, you know, what are people doing? What do they have access to and, and control over that? So the power platform, right? gives IT that level of comfort and control of we know what we're permitting our users to do, we know what we're allowing in or out of our system. So right there, that's hugely important for a large global enterprise that we've got a manageable system that the users can use to manipulate and access this data and, and use it downstream in the, in the larger Microsoft environment in particular. Uh, the other key part here is with what Autos has done is that it's allowing us to share subsets of the data. So rather than having to share that whole chunk of data, out of that proprietary file, they've given us the power to say, no, we only want to share this piece of data with you because that's what you need. And that also perceptually makes it easier to think about QAing it, right? You know, it, mm -hmm. people can say, oh, I... I know that this piece of data is right. I don't have to worry about this other stuff because that's not what in scope right now, but this is correct. I can share it. And because we're bringing it into the Microsoft ecosystem, you know, we can scrub it further if we need to downstream, uh, not just in the uh, original native application itself. And the data that we're sharing is generic now. So we're not sharing 
native application data, we're actually sharing just data. And that's hugely important too, because previously, you know, if we said, here's this file, somebody has to know what to do with that file. Now we can say, here's some data. And, and data is becoming a very common language, right? And you've touched on that a great deal. So uh, ultimately, being able to do all this allows us to bring this data into the much larger system and you know microsoft's platforms obviously allow us to mash up a lot of data from a lot of sources so as much as we like autodesk there are a lot of other vendors that we <laughs> deal with as well that we're pulling data out of so this gives us that power right because now we can use power query power bi uh azure tools and systems right to start to consume and use this data whatever level we sort of need to do that at it sounds like an amazing partnership though. I mean, you know, Amy, it sounds like you were able to accelerate your own development process, but you also served, you know, solved challenges for Robert and the team that you have uh, in this process at Stantec. That it's really, I, I think this is amazing. A platform within a platform with the data, it's huge. No, I love it. And I think this partnership of like using low code where you can and accelerate your own development process and then adding value on to the customers. It, it's pretty amazing. So Amy and Robert, thank you so much for joining us, sharing this amazing story with the audience today. Really appreciate it. And, and thank you for your partnership. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. You know, I hope that people who are watching, both the professional developers and the business folks and everybody are really thinking about this way of empowering their customer. That's what I, I think that's the most important thing yeah. I took away from that was the way that they thought about how, you know, how Autodesk thought about what they could do for their customer and then what the customer was able to do from there. Yeah. You know, instead of investing all their time in building their own product and platform, they partnered with us, which it, it's amazing. No, and I think it's this, like Amy said it very well, instead of developing their own workflow engine, like we have quite a few engineers working on that problem, right? And so taking that and embedding, and they focus on kind of where they have their, their main expertise, uh, and yet passing the benefits on to Robert, who can now work with other data. So the data isn't locked up in one silo. So it's really a great example. So low code is not just about building apps, it's also for ISVs and pro developers to embed in other experiences where, where you want to have that ability to customize. And it, and it unlocks the power and potential of everyone's creativity in that scenario. But also, I mean, from a business solution architect perspective, I always like to think about any time that I can use something rather than build something, that's a good move, right? And then you have that time for customization in you know, really unlocking that business process versus spending that time on the platform element itself, right? You got it. <laughs> you Beautiful. Know, I've been thinking about this for a few <laughs> A few years, a few years I've been thinking about this stuff and I really enjoy it. It's part of my favorite thing because the reason I enjoy this work and I hope all of you out there are thinking about this as well is that when you really solve a business person's problem and you see that look on their face when they, they oh, you did it, you, you really did it. That is so rewarding. I to know. me, that's how I bring meaning into the work as well. I know you do. I'm too. with you. Yes. <laughs> no, you are too. Um, it's so impactful, you know, the power platform, we know that it is. And low code solutions are really here to stay. You know, I, I really think they are. But I have another question for you. I want to ask you this too. In, you know, you and I have both been women in technology for a long time. We've seen this, this industry and this space really evolve. Where do you find your meaning in this work? What do you find? I know we're all excited, but what do you find the most meaningful about some of these things that you're launching now and the work that you're doing? I actually, the conversation we just had, right? I, I grew up in, or I worked in Azure before I came to the Power Platform and, and I've seen that experience. And, and when I joined the Power Platform, I was like, either this is crazy or it's brilliant. And I, I've clearly been drinking the Kool-Aid, <laughs> but this ability to really accelerate and empower people to do things faster and collaborate and and to your point the the, the facial expression of, of your customers when they realize how much they can do it's i just feel i have the best job in the world i'm very lucky so well then we share that <laughs> <laughs> we definitely share that Drew, this has been an incredible session uh, before we wrap up we have one other quick question um, from our mvps and you almost already answered that because i know we're running a little short on time but do, what is the biggest obstacle that you think of for achieving this ultimate goal 
I really think it is making sure that we bring these three audiences together. That's we need awesome. the pro developers, we need the citizen developers, we need IT to help unlock. So I say, like, let's have all those three audiences come together. The business can move on their own, and they are, whether you want it or not. But I think if we can pair all these three audiences, then we have a, we have a good thing going. That's amazing. That's so great. The world of fusion development is so vast. I know there's so much we didn't get a chance to touch on. Um, but, you know, we've talked about what's meaningful. We've talked about bringing all of these people together. And I really appreciate that. I'm sure we could go on for days about this stuff. It's been, I know we could for sure. Um, it's been great to share this stage with you. Thank you so much for that. A big thanks to the ZF Group for sharing their customer story. Also to our MVPs, um, waving to all of you who joined us from around the world via Microsoft Teams. Awesome questions, thank you so much. I wanna take this moment also to encourage all of you to get active in the Microsoft community. There are so many resources and opportunities to connect with and learn from people who are just as excited as you are and who are on this journey. Uh, it's always more fun to learn together. Fantastic. I am so excited and thank you for having me. It's been it's been a great session. Absolutely. And there's a blog out there that people can also uh, take a look at, yeah. right? Um, and it's in your backpack and you can make sure to get that information uh, on the on the Microsoft Build site. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you everyone. Welcome back. As we make our way through day two of Microsoft Build, we hope that you are able to take advantage of all the incredible content across the event. And one way to do that is to keep it right here throughout the day. Yep, that's right. We've got interviews with experts coming up, including my chat with Donovan Brown, securely taking your projects from code to cloud, and a segment hosted by Ann Taylor, all about accessibility. Good stuff. We also just heard about low code and coming up, we've got another Microsoft build into focus show all about collaborative apps and what they can do for the modern workplace. That and much more still ahead. And remember, fill that digital backpack with sessions, keynotes and Microsoft build into focus shows to make future viewing even easier. But right now, we want to hear from you. It's time to check in on social media to see what's buzzing and to catch up on the hashtag MSBuild conversation. All right, Leslie, you ready to see what's up? Yes. All right. right. Why don't you start? All right. So I'm taking a look down at uh, Pragati down here. Had an amazing experience speaking at MSBuild at the Microsoft UK headquarters with experts. Really, it looks like a really fun time. That's one of the regional spotlight locations, and all of those look like the best time ever. So. I'm sure it was really fun. <laughs> I love this over here. Both of these are related to our friend Seth Warz's <laughs> last session. So at the top, um, we have a MVP who got to be part of the live audience in their Into Focus session. And then here's a little snippet from their pre, like little pre-show that they had. I love it. Mimicked um, very famous Parks NBC show, Parks and Rec. <laughs> um, but yeah, the expression really does say it all. He, he kept everyone on edge with his content. Yeah. I love it. Me watching the, the segment. What? <laughs> also down here, I want to give a shout out to some action in the developer division. Chris says, this is quite an awesome continuum. Great stuff. Highlighting Blazor, Maui, which just got uh, its GA release uh, yesterday, I believe. And it's really exciting to be able to talk about that in particular because Maui has been a long time coming for folks who want to have that singular code base for multiple platforms when developing applications. Awesome. And then if we go over here, we have a great tweet from Annie. I had a really great time doing a session at Microsoft Build today. Um, they had some great co-speakers. They had a great time. Highly recommend tuning in and watching the session because you can have it in your backpack. Quick plug to the backpack, yeah. backpack. Um, <laughs> to check out all those sessions. But I really love that some of our speakers have been uh, making sure to publicize their own. So make sure everyone tunes in. Yeah, and also I, we got a shout out from Christos over here, going live in 20 minutes, which I guess by now might be now. Maybe aired. <laughs> Who knows? With the one and only uh, Shanku Wen at the Microsoft Build 2022 to talk about identity and security in the cloud. This will be my third speaking session today. Oh, that's amazing. Kudos. Really busy mm -hmm. day. Awesome. All right, we got some new ones over here. All right, let's see. 
Um, we got one from uh, Jeremy over here talking about Win32 apps are available now in the store. If you publish your Win32 app in the store, you get insights on how the app is used and how it's installed. Pretty awesome. All these new features that came, came uh, to life. Today. Yeah. <laughs> also on the side here, we got a shout out from Isaac, who I know he's awesome. <laughs> also, he's giving a shout out to Tim from the developer division team. He's looking very professional professional channeling some Scott Guthrie action with the polo <laughs> and I thought he did a great job presenting that talk on Maui and Visual Studio so check that one out not to plug <laughs> what my team in particular is doing but that's pretty sweet. Plug away. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> What's not to love? So we want to keep the conversation going so tell us what you're liking, tell us what you're learning and remember to use the hashtag MSBuild. Yep, Leslie, there have been so many key themes that we've seen throughout the show. And one of those themes will continue to make its way through today and continue to make waves, and it's artificial intelligence, AI. Yeah, that seems to be the theme of the day. So, <laughs> yep, so that does seem to be the theme of the day because both Satya and Kevin Scott prominently featured AI and machine learning in their keynotes. So you know it's a game changer when both of those two very prominent people have it in their keynote. Absolutely. And... And those keynotes are just the beginning. If you're looking to skill up, dive deep, or simply learn more about the world of AI, machine learning, then you've come to the right place. Microsoft Build has so many opportunities to engage with AI and machine learning even after the event wraps. So if you are interested in machine learning, we've got to mention Microsoft's partner, partnership with PyTorch. This machine learning library features a full stack from best in class GPU hardware and interconnects to enterprise grade customer support. Yep, definitely a partnership worth checking out. Speaking of things to get in on and check out, the keynotes we mentioned earlier uh, announced some really new great offers open to attendees, registered attendees, remember, that you'll want to take advantage of. Yep, emphasis on registered. Starting with an offer from GitHub, Microsoft Build attendees get free access to the GitHub Copilot preview until it launches this summer. You gotta get on the ground floor of this. It is really cool, and I love not having to think about how to implement my functions anymore. <laughs> exactly. So if you tuned in for Kevin Scott's keynote, you also saw a series of demos that showcased OpenAI's Codex model. We're excited to announce that the team has open sourced the code for these demos so you can try them for yourself. And there are some great demos, including the natural language command line interface, natural language 3D rendering, and even controlling an NPC in Minecraft. Yep. Plus, registered Microsoft Build attendees get unlimited access to Codex models from OpenAI for three months and free tokens to use on all other publicly available models on OpenAI's API. Mm -hmm. Look at all that cool stuff that we get just by doing that quick registration. For free. I know. <laughs> and we're also partnering with OpenAI to bring you the Codex Innovation Challenge. Microsoft Build attendees will be given the chance to submit an idea for a Codex use case. The winning idea will get... The winning idea will get resources and mentorship from Microsoft and OpenAI. Meet Kevin Scott and CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, and so much more. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> to learn more about any of the offers we just mentioned, which were a ton, check out the URL below. Now switching gears from those great new offers to sessions being offered here at Microsoft Build. Here's a quick preview of some of the outstanding sessions that are coming your way throughout the event. Hi, my name is Steven Siciliano, and I'm excited to talk about all the new capabilities in Power Virtual Agents and Power Automate. We have new ways to bring together all of the awesome technologies so that way developers can be more productive than ever before with the Power Platform. Please join me in this exciting build session. Hello everyone, this is Hania Odala from Microsoft. Please join our breakout session we are uh, like describing our collaboration with NVIDIA, bringing glitz and the glitz models in very efficient way using NVIDIA Triton server, both for Teams captioning scenario and Microsoft Document Translate. You have trouble sleeping. Do you dream about building apps that'll reach millions of users? Hmm? Well, boy, do we have the session for you. It's called Reach 270 Million Users and Grow Your Business with Microsoft Teams. So go on, watch it now. Go on, go on. I'm happy to welcome Bob Ward. He's the principal PM architect in Azure Data. 
Bob, you're here to talk about Microsoft SQL Server 2022, which seems to be getting a lot of detra uh, <laughs> a lot of traction and conversation throughout Build today. And I hear there's some great enhancements coming that you've been presenting throughout. So tell me more. Leslie, thanks so much for inviting me here to talk about SQL Server and all the announcements you had. It's such a great Build conference. You know, SQL Server 2022, our flagship database product we've had for decades, finally has gone public preview. So everybody can finally get their hands on the bits download them and try them out. And just, we announced some amazing capabilities that have come with this release, including some really powerful abilities to go hybrid, to connect SQL Server now, to manage instance for disaster recovery, to Synapse for near real-time analytics, and for Purview for central governance. We have a great engine. So we've announced capabilities we call built-in query intelligence. So developers can gain performance, get consistent performance by upgrading to SQL Server 2022 with no code changes. Just make a database compatibility change and all of a sudden now your code is faster. We have new built-in capabilities in the engine like SQL Ledger, tamper evidence uh, capabilities got like blockchain inside your database and many, many other features that folks can now download and try with SQL Server 2022. So very, a lot of excitement. We made the announcement yesterday and just everybody in the industry is pretty excited to finally try it download it and see all those new great capabilities. That is so exciting. Clearly a lot of announcements and happy release. That is always really fun. So regarding all those features, why do they exist? So like, what are, the, what are some of the challenges that developers typically face when they're working with databases? Yeah, thanks, Leslie. If you think even about SQL Server or Azure SQL Database, our flagship database in the cloud, our platform as a service, a lot of it comes to integrating data where it exists, taking your code, getting a tight integration in an easy way. Other things cons are considering for these challenges are things like the local development experience. Like I'm working on a laptop, but I don't always be connected to the cloud to build my apps in conjunction with my database. So think of like that DevOps type experience. And I'm always looking for more capabilities to be infused into the database engine so I don't have to put all that logic in my code. So we see all these challenges coming around and we believe some of the enhancements we've announced yesterday at Build are gonna provide solutions to those. Awesome. And yeah, you've clearly announced a lot of different announcements, but is there anything else that people missed in the Build sessions in particular? Oh, there's so much we power packed in these sessions, incredible. <laughs> I mean, think about SQL Ledger I just talked about. We went generally available with that feature for Azure SQL Database. We showed a multi-party trust scenario where SQL can in the database need now be a central authority for trusted data without having a central authority itself. So for a supply chain scenario, developers now can build apps using SQL Ledger for this tamper evidence record of data over time using blockchain technology. But I also think about in the development space with Azure SQL Database, some really cool announcements. A local development experience now using Azure SQL Database Emulator or JSON capabilities infused into the T-SQL language for all those developers that love to process JSON language but want to do it with our relational engine. We also announced the capability of binding Azure Functions with SQL Database data now. So if you love developing Azure Functions, a lot of people like that as a cloud-born service for apps, you can now tightly integrate the data side with Azure Functions into your code. And what a really interesting feature with Private Preview, something called REST endpoints. So imagine a world now where you as a developer, you write your code, you use system procedures in the database engine to push data to any REST endpoint where it may exist in your environment, in the cloud, wherever it, where it may be. We did a really cool demonstration showing all of these capabilities infused, woven together, for kind of a complete end-to-end -end developer experience. That is awesome. And there's so many options tools-wise in this space. So how do all of these tools work together ultimately to make developers more productive? Yeah, thank you. There's a couple examples I think of. Number one, this local development experience is really powerful. So you're a developer, you're working with GitHub, you may be even using GitHub code spaces and working with Azure SQL Database, but you need a very efficient way to make that DevOps a reality. So Azure SQL Database Emulator allows you to push down your development experience to your laptop or even in GitHub code spaces. And then when you're ready, push those changes along with your code itself into the database. So that's very popular. A lot of people have seen our announcement about that and they want to try that right away. But we also showed a technology called Dynamic Lineage with Purview. People look at Purview as an interesting technology for central governance. 
but it also gives insights for developers that were not possible before. We showed a demonstration of looking at stored procedures in SQL Server and seeing how you can do dynamic run analysis to see where are all the dependencies around my ecosystem so I can know when I make changes, how am I gonna affect things like Power BI reports? Really exciting to see that one. If you're a developer, go check out certainly Purview Integration and Dynamic Lineage. Great, and you also mentioned, uh, I think at one point, the Intelligent Data Platform. Can you summarize what that is really quickly? I am so excited to see that land. Our Vice President <laughs> Rohan Kumar talked about that in his session. Think about analytics, think about governance, think about operational databases like Azure SQL Database, Cosmos DB, and think about how to sync these together, integrate them together. So Synapse Link for SQL allows you to take your operational data and put that in analytics or Purview doing dynamic runtime analysis with Lineage or even central policy management. So we're trying to integrate our data services together into one intelligent platform. Awesome, there's so much to try out. So Bob, thank you so much for being here. And to learn more, try out, to and make sure to try out the newest SQL Server features, go to aka.ms slash SQL Server 2022. And now back to Sonia. Awesome. You know him, you love him, and once again, he's breaking down the biggest news and themes from Microsoft Build in his own special way with a few friends and Microsoft experts. Here's what you can expect from Scott Hanselman and friends at Microsoft Build After Hours. We're backstage right yeah, now. Yeah, we're backstage here. Just I have no idea what's in store. With yes. Me. Embrace that it's coming. The developer can basically take advantage of all of us. What is happening? It's a tiny house, Amanda. Here in Alexander Story's hardware, we are really early in our neurodiverse explorations. Give it a talking head. Yeah. And, uh, it's a playground. We really have like stood out. Yeah. We want to make developers happy. We can be true to our mission. I can take that creativity and build on top of it. Next up, Chris Yoon and Daria v Vasilyeva join Ann Taylor for a conversation on accessibility and a demonstration of new accessibility functionality for mobile apps. Check this out. Hello, my name is Ann Taylor. I'm from the accessibility team at Microsoft. I'm delighted to be joined today by two of my colleagues from the Microsoft Search Assistance and Intelligence team, Daria Vasilyeva and Chris Yoon. We will be talking to you about the latest accessibility improvement of the Play My Email features, and we will also be sharing with you lessons learned on how to develop in an accessible manner. But first, let's learn about Play My Email. Over to you, Daria. Thank you, Anne. It's great to be here, and thank you so much for your partnership. Play My Emails is an um, email productivity tool powered by Cortana on Outlook Mobile on iOS and Android. You can listen to your emails like a podcast, whether you're on the go, multitasking, or need a little break from a big screen. You can use your voice quickly to quickly triage your emails, as well as perform powerful search like read my emails from my manager from last week. The history of experience starts from incubational project in our M365 design studio. It was solely focused on helping users with disabilities getting the most from Outlook Mobile. As the project developed, we saw a value in bringing it in for people with all abilities. So we brought in a destination to be useful in many day-to-day -day use cases. Now we have returned to our roots to make sure people with disabilities are still empowered to be more productive daily. After meeting fundamental requirements, such as compatibility with native screen readers and meeting international accessibility standards, we went further and worked closely with people with disabilities, from user research and design to usability testing and studies. And we are excited to share some of the innovations we are introducing this month. Thanks, Daria. And as a visually impaired user myself, I'm really excited to see these changes come to play in my emails. First, I want to thank Anne, the CELA accessibility team, and everyone who's worked on Play My Emails for their support and partnership to bring accessibility into the forefront of our user experience. With that, I love to share our enhanced Play My Emails accessibility experience in action. Let's start by launching Play My Emails. Select the menu button and navigate to find Play My Emails in the sidebar menu. Menu, Nicole.Wagner at 6SZJ. Selected, add a new email account, but Play My Emails button. Here, we found an opportunity to improve the launch experience by creating a series shortcut that users can set up with a single tap of the button in Outlook settings 
and combining it with iOS's BackTap accessibility feature. Now, users can simply tap on the back of the iPhone to listen to their emails anytime. App, two stack, Hi 3D, there. image, Let me get your Outlook, email. more options, button. I've got a few emails for you right now. As you can hear, we had a unique challenge to balance two competing audio sources, one from Cortana and one from VoiceOver, to ensure a seamless experience without overloading the users. To accomplish this, we've added universal VoiceOver gesture uh, support, as well as powerful hands-free voice commands for users to be able to quickly listen to and triage their emails. You can double tap with two fingers to play and pause Cortana. Get all the latest news by subscribing to our weekly newsletter. One you can swipe left and right to move between emails. Pause Yesterday button. morning. You can also use three finger up to archive and three finger down to flag an email. Pause I'll button. archive it for you. Yesterday morning. I'll flag that one. You can also use your voice to take other quick actions, uh, such as sending a quick reply. Hey, Cortana. Send a quick reply. So tell me your short reply to Devin Torres. Welcome to the team, Grace. Ready to send it? Yes. I've sent it. Likewise, you can swipe up with three fingers and down with three fingers to accept and decline calendar invites. And lastly, you can use your voice to speed up or slow down Cortana's readout speed. Hey, Cortana. Speed up. I'll speed up. By combining familiar voiceover gestures with powerful hands-free voice commands, it is easier than ever to audibly go through your inbox. And that was a quick demo of our new Play My Emails accessibility experience. Our recent user research shows that people with disabilities need end-to-end -end experiences across all their workflow. We know there's more work to do, and we're excited to dig into other products and areas. Back to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Daria. Three things I'm going to leave with you, my developer friends. Number one, co-create with people with disability from every stage of development. Number two, leveraging platform accessibility. Avoid using custom controls. Number three, test with people with disability using assistive technology. Now go forth and do great things. And thanks very much for all that you do to make your technologies accessible to everyone, including people with disability. Looking forward to see you next year. So many great and important accessibility features to consider. Inter interested in learning more about accessibility and what you can do to make your apps more and solutions more inclusive? Then you're in luck. Microsoft's Ability Summit sessions are now available to watch on demand. Head over to the event's YouTube playlist at the URL below to learn more. Now, it's time for another poll. We want to know now, how excited are you for the Microsoft Build Cloud Skills Challenge? A. So excited. B, ready to earn my free certification exam. C, I've done a couple before, so I'm ready to refresh all my skills. D, I'm running to sign up right now. So no matter what answer you choose, it's clear the Microsoft Build Cloud Skills Challenge is a great way to expand your mind and career. And with eight challenges to choose from, you can select the one or multiple, whatever floats your boat. Here's more about how you can skill up and win with the Microsoft Build Cloud Skills Challenge. Hi, it's me, Navin Chand again, and I'm excited to talk to you about something that's near and dear to me, the Learning Zone. And it's not just me. Let's bring in Suzanne, who works on the programming that goes on year round with Microsoft Learn. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for joining us all the way from Singapore. Hey, Navin, thanks for having me. Awesome. So for those who aren't familiar, why should everyone check out the Cloud Skills Challenge in the Learning Zone? Right, absolutely. So the Build Cloud Skills Challenge is a fun way to learn something and earn a free certification exam. There are multiple topics to choose from, and this year in six different languages. So find one that you feel most passionate about or comfortable with and get started. You have till June 21st to get it done, so it's not too late to register. 
I love that you said that. People have an entire month to get this done. So sign up now, take your time, get it done, and get that free certification exam. So cool. So beyond Cloud Skills Challenge, what else do you have going on after the event? We're excited to continue the momentum after Build with more live technical content more Ask the Expert sessions and more Learn Life sessions led by Microsoft. And our community is leading more table topics, more after parties, and unpacking more of Microsoft Build from our reactors from all around the world in your local time zone. I love that experience. You're taking what we did at Build, all this global, localized content, and keeping that party going all the way through for, for an amount of time. It is so exciting to see, and I love that you have it in multiple languages as well. Suzanne, thank you so much. I've had a blast, and hopefully you did too. And just because Microsoft Build is wrapping up today doesn't mean the learning has to stop. There's so much you can do after the event. The Cloud Skills Challenge alone is a fantastic way to skill up and earn a free certification exam. So head over to the Learning Zone tab up top and check out all the ways you keep the learning going after Microsoft Build. My name is Daisuke Okamoto. I'm from Japan and I'm making art. When I was a kid, my dad, he always was me drawing together. He was good at it. I thought it's really cool. So I wanted to be like that. I do all kinds of the art, but mainly I do uh, line work with the uh, ink and the pen. I like making intricate detail artwork because it's like a journey. Every time you see, you find something new inside of my art. My art expands by trying new technology. After I got surface, I designed with the digital and that's open more art field. First of all, uh, it's very easy. Everybody can use it. If you are not good at drawings or you don't have steady hands, Surface supports you to make really clean lines. And when you work with this pen on the monitor, it vibrates, it gives the texture and feeling of drawing on paper. You can put the pen in the garage and you never lose it. Surface has a stamp like this and you can use it as a laptop. You can also take out the keyboard and you can go all the way down to studio mode. You can draw on it like tablet. I can zoom in and zoom out. All you need is surface. You can walk anywhere. In train, in the car, on the cafe. The surface could be your studio and your office. You can do anything. Thank you so much for joining us. We have some exciting announcements with Power BI, a monster announcement, probably the biggest upgrade we've made to Power BI in years. You have to check it out. Hi, I'm Rich Turner, Program Manager Lead on the Windows Developer Team. I'm presenting a breakout session called Develop Windows Apps on and for Rich Ecosystem Platforms and Devices. This is going to be a really exciting session. I'd very much encourage you to come and watch. Hey everybody, I'm Jacob Bogey and I'm joined by Pavan Lakala. And we're gonna talk today about how you can set your data in motion with Confluent Cloud and Microsoft Azure and gain insight from your data in real time and build new applications. Feature management might be a new concept to some, but to those who already use tools like feature flags and toggles, they know just how much time and effort these software techniques can save. LaunchDarkly is a leading maker of these management tools for Azure DevOps and Visual Studio. So joining us to share why we should let those feature flags fly is Microsoft MVP Michael Gillett, who authored the book Feature Management with LaunchDarkly. Hi, Michael. Hi, nice to meet you. Awesome. Thanks for being here. So starting off the top, what is feature management and what are some of the problems that developers face when trying to perform efficient feature management? So I think feature management is best thought of as the ability to control what features a customer would be experiencing in a, in a website, in an app, um, and anywhere they're going to be interacting with software. And the way that that can be used is pretty extensive. And that's because in reality, a feature flag is really just a Boolean. It's an if statement within some code to execute feature A or feature B or, or maybe no feature at all. 
And that allows us as, as developers to roll out features in a safe manner uh, to 5%, 10%, 50% of, of customers. And maybe when it gets to 50% rollout, then we're in a position where we can be doing an A-B test and then we can do some experimentation and future management can be used in that way as well. And there's other ways where we can ensure that we can turn features off if we need to. So if there's a particular um, issue that we've got in our production environment, maybe there are some high intensity features that we could look to, to turn off and buy ourselves a bit more headroom within our system to recover a bit more gracefully. And so there's many opportunities for the way in which that kind of if statement can be used, but that does come with some problems. And what is important is the, the control of those feature flags and making sure that they're well managed and well looked after, that they're cleaned up from code once they are kind of once they've served their purpose, once we've been able to release a feature to all customers. Um, and what's fascinating with it, and I could talk for a long time, probably why I've written the book, <laughs> but actually what we're beginning to be able to do with feature management is decouple the release of a new feature from the deployment of code to the production environment. And that's a fantastic development. Well, that sounds like a really important area. So how does LaunchDarkly help address those challenges? So LaunchDarkly... What it does is, is kind of the magic of how an if statement can be used in such a powerful way. So it knows about the, the user, the request, the session, and allows us to choose which experience, which feature, which variation we actually want to serve to segments of customers, to individual customers if, if needed. But it's all, uh, it offers us a range of um, ways that we can target that. So it's off of different attributes and we can provide those attributes to launch darkly. And so some of them could be IP or, or the location of that customer and others are going to be quite business and, and uh, specific to the function that that app performs. But we get to determine that. And then there's a load of additional things. And I think the audience of Build, there's a lot of enterprises here, large enterprises that need good governance and good auditability. And if we're saying that actually releasing a feature can be decoupled from a deployment of code. Well, there's a lot of rules and I'm sure and regulations around um, how a company looks to make a deployment. Well, we wouldn't want to get away from that when releasing a feature, if actually the releasing of a feature is what customers will experience. And so LaunchDarkly provides that, that government grade in, in some cases, uh, assurance and, and quality, auditability, uh, and the ability to set roles and permissions and, and really give that, that safe environment by which any size organization can be making uh, real-time changes to what features their customers are experiencing within their production environment. Great. So as you mentioned earlier, you love feature management so, mar so much that you've actually written a book on it with LaunchDarkly. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so I've been talking um, at conferences and events about feature management and LaunchDarkly for a little while. And then with the pandemic and lockdown and not being able to do too much, a, uh, the opportunity to write a book actually uh, arose and it was a good use of that lockdown time. So the book covers everything from introduction to DevOps and the Dora metrics because what's interesting with feature management is that the Dora metrics generally can all be improved by a good adoption of feature management. And then the book goes on to look at rollouts and experimentation, kill switches and safety valves, and uh, some advanced options where you can get rid of test environments completely by just using feature management. And it goes in depth into how all of those scenarios and opportunities are available through using LaunchDarkly uh, with tips and tricks along the way from my own experience and from talking with others who use the product uh, to make the most of it. Great. And kudos for writing a book during quarantine. I spend most of my time just binging a bunch of TV shows. But thank, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing with us, Michael. Thank you very much. All right, so to hear more about LaunchDarkly, catch the breakout with Michael and LaunchDarkly dev advocate Jessica Craig co-presenting on Feature Flags. There's also an Ask the Experts plus a table topic session coming up live in just a few minutes. Visit LaunchDarkly and the Feature Partner Showcase for details. Back on over to Sonia. It's time to check in with someone who specializes in the Windows developer experience someone who comes from the Windows Terminal team and who is currently surrounded by some incredibly colorful, colorful hardware, Kayla Cinnamon. Let's check in. Hello. Oh, hey, thanks, Sonia. 
So hey everyone, I'm Kayla and I'm here with Felicia. Hey! So um, we wanted to talk about a bunch of different hardware and uh, keyboards that are in front of us. Um, but I do actually have some questions from the audience that I want to answer um, before getting into this. So the first question was, um, are the fans in the computer, uh, are the colors in them um, able to be changed or addressable? And the answer is yes. So these are ARGB fans, which stands for addressable RGB. So you could just buy an RGB controller and then install it into the motherboard and then you can change the colors any way that party you like. Party up. Party in your computer, uh, customized to your liking. And the second question that came in was, did we get the BIOS up? So in the last segment, we just turned it on, but then after that ended, I plugged the machine into a monitor, saw the BIOS screen, and now we're installing Windows onto the machine to make sure we have a good demo for next segment. So let's jump into the keyboard. So which one calls out to you the most here? Oh my gosh, they're all so beautiful, but I have to say, this tiny little copy paste stack <laughs> overflow keyboard is yeah. so cute. Like, what is this? So I've seen this all over Twitter and I think it's just copy and paste and then like you're good to go. Fabulous, like wow. Just have an external enhancement for copy pasting. Yeah, and it only takes one key rather than two, like holding control, oh. you know? Oh, mm. So something to note about the copy paste keyboard along with most of these other ones is that these are mechanical keyboards, mm. which is like really big, especially with developers. So under a mechanical keyboard are these keyboard switches and they come in different colors based on the feel in the keyboard. Mm, the tactile feel in it. Yeah. Exactly, so here's a clicky switch if you wanna hear this one. Oh, like this. Click yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this is what I think of when I think of mechanical keyboard. Yeah, it's very typewriter. It's very like I'm getting business done kind of thing. People will hate you, but you love yourself. Exactly. And then uh, next up is a tactile switch, which mm. is over here. Slightly less clicky. Right. So it still has that bump, but it's not as loud. Yeah. And the last one is a linear uh, keyboard switch. This is like the soft one. Right, so no bump, but you can still uh, feel when you press all the way down that you've entered the key in. Um, so these are switches and these are heavily customizable. So if you get a hot swap keyboard, you can pop these in and out really easily. Mm. Some of them have soldering on the back, so you'll need a soldering iron. Like this one has a, oh, wow. a soldered in, so I can't switch those out that easily, which is a little sad. They're pretty though. Yeah. And so this one. <laughs> yes. What is this like retro little phone keyboard is what it reminds me of. Yeah. So this one, if you want to show them, this is actually from Scott Hanselman. He donated it to this session. <laughs> um, but it has a trackpad on the side, and then it has all the keys that you need, like function keys, it's got arrow keys, it has everything. But it's really compact and small, so if you're traveling or anything mm. like that, you could just take this little one, which is pretty awesome. That's yeah, really cute. And then, of course, we have an ergonomic option. So ergonomics are the big thing these days, and this one is looks like two oven mitts to me, but you can spread these out and then type separately. And then these are for your thumbs, so you can have some totally. actions there as well. And the last one is this Microsoft uh, Compact Design keyboard that isn't mechanical, mm. but it's still really nice to Deal. type with if you're not mm. into mechanical keyboards. Mm -hmm. So stick around, because later today, Felicia and I will be back for our last segment in After Hours. I've got a developer demo on deck you won't want to miss. Felicia, please tell everyone about After Hours. Yeah, so you've seen After Hours yesterday, and I hope you'll tune in for it. After Hours today. We go behind the scenes with your favorite speakers and give you a little bit more information about all the cool talks and topics that you've heard at Build. Uh, with a little more intimacy, but oh. uh, yeah. Sounds great. So if you have any questions about my build here, send them to me and use the hashtag msbuild. Now back to the studio. Sonia? Great. We want Microsoft Build to be an engaging event that offers content that intersects with your passions and interests. So we want to know, got another poll, what area of Microsoft Build Learning Zone piques your interest the most? A, I'm joining the Cloud Skills Challenge. B, I'm prepping for a Microsoft certification. C, I'm kickstarting a new career and joining the intro to tech skills sessions. D, I've got questions ready for an ask the expert session. Head to the chat and let us know. Thanks, Sonia. I'm definitely team, B, team D personally. I, the good news is a lot of these colleagues who are speaking 
work here so I can talk to them afterward. And so we are just minutes away from our next Microsoft build into focus. Join Microsoft Teams Engineering Vice President Brigu Sarin as he leads a discussion on building great collaborative experiences and apps for Microsoft Teams. Brigu and Caruana are on deck right now to talk about best practices, find out how partners continue to leverage the power of Microsoft Teams, and they'll even be answering some audience questions. Our next guest is a mainstay here at Microsoft Build. Please welcome Partner Program Manager for Azure Incubations, Donovan Brown. Welcome, Donovan. How are you? <laughs> Doing great. Awesome. So I know you're heavily involved with the dev community. Do you mind just talking a little bit more about your role that you're wearing today? I know you wear a lot of hats. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm currently on the incubations team under Mark Rosinovich for Azure. So if you're thinking about what's going to be next in the world of microservices and cloud-based development, that's what our team is trying to do. So if you're familiar with Kata, that came from our team. If you're familiar with Dapper, that also came from our team. Uh, so we're really excited because we got to announce Dapper in space uh, that at this event. And it's just amazing to be able to work in a team where it's, we're looking at what's going to be in the future and trying to make sure that we make the world for the developers just as easy as we possibly can going forward. Awesome. We really appreciate that, I bet, <laughs> from our audience perspective. Uh, in your previous session, you talked about Dependabot. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit how uh, this will help teams speed up their development? Absolutely. So Dependabot is a feature inside of the GitHub Advanced Security. And what it allows us to do is monitor our dependencies. What I mean by dependencies is to speed us up as developers, we're gonna go and find a package that already does what it is that we need done so that we don't have to rewrite that code over and over again. Problem is, is the more dependencies that you get, each one of them could potentially have an update that you need for a security vulnerability, a patch, new features. And keeping up to date with that can be really a challenge. And what Dependabot will do is it will actually look at my code and say, hey, it looks like you're using this particular version of a project or, or a package. There's a new version of that. And you really want it because there happens to be a security vulnerability or a bug you really want to fix. And instead of me having to stop what I'm doing as a developer, going and downloading it, trying to update my package.json or whatever manifest I'm using to list all my dependencies and then check that code back into a pull request, Dependabot does all that for me. It says, hey, I know what package you need. I'm going to download the latest version. I'm going to update all the manifests that you need. I'm going to submit you a pull request. At that point, it can run through all of our gates and our builds and our tests to make sure it's good. And then I get a notification saying, hey, there's a new pull request that's already fixed this problem for you. And all I have to do is click one button and it just merges it into my code and then we're off to the races again. So it's a great way to keep all your dependencies up to date, because otherwise it would just be a taxing event that a developer would have to do. And that at that point, we're no longer adding value. We're just sitting here maintaining all of our dependencies. Yeah. So it's great that it's automatically reviewed. The dependencies are revolved, but this can't be where security ends, right? Like, oh, there must be some other. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish that was where security end, but it's it's not. There's so many things that we do as developers that sometimes just get ourselves in trouble. <laughs> I, I always joke that if you've been developing for more than a day, you've probably done what I'm about to describe. You needed to test something. You needed a connection string or password. So you just scribbled it in your code real quick so that you could test to make sure that it works. And you're so excited when you see it work that you just check the code into the repository. And there goes the secret into the history forever. And that's a bad thing because if a bad actor sees that secret, they might be able to use that to exploit uh, another portion of your infrastructure, or you might use the same password in multiple places, and now they have a way in. And then even trying to clean up your history once you identify that can really be a problem. So what we do is we have security scanning, a secret scanning, that will actually scan your entire repository looking for secrets and make sure that if there are any that have slipped into your repository, that we can go back in and help you clean that up. But what's even cooler than that is that we now have a feature called push protection, which will stop the secrets from getting in there in the first place. So I made that careless mistake. I'm excited. I try to push my code. And on my local machine, it'll say, hey, Donovan, uh, there's something that looks like a password in your code that you're trying to push to a repository that would be really hard to fix later. Did you really mean to do this? And sometimes the secret might be in test code, and it's completely OK for me to put, check that in because it's not really a password. But I needed it to look like a password for my testing. And I can say, it's false positive. That's just for testing. Or it might be saving my butt, right? Because no one wants to be that developer, the developer that puts your entire company at risk because you accidentally checked in a secret. And push protection now says, hey, I'm not even going to let you push this code. You're never going to have to worry about that getting into that repository. I got your back right now. And you're able to fix it really quickly, which is great. 
I love that because you always say you have to start secure and stay secure, right? You, so, you nailed it, exactly. Any other new features that you would want to talk about, especially from this proactive versus reactive state, anything there? Yeah, we also have some really cool stuff when it comes to CodeQL, which is a technology that allows you to think of your entire code base as a database and then be able to run queries across that data to figure out, do I have SQL injection attacks or do I have some other careless type of security vulnerabilities? And it'll highlight them for you and say, hey, Donovan, just FYI, like you probably want to come and review this piece of code. And it does that for us automatically in the background, just keeping all of our code secure. Awesome. Uh, so sounds like it's something you're, you'd like to avoid. Can we imagine a world where this doesn't happen at all? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to get there because what we're doing with GitHub Advanced Security is we're shifting left all of this technologies because the sooner that you can identify a problem, you can prevent it from even being a problem. And what happens today is that a lot of developers throw all those responsibilities over the wall. It has to be committed first and it's reviewed by someone else. But security is everyone's responsibility. It's not someone else's job. It's everyone's job. And by shifting all of this technology to the left, we're allowing us to start doing these reviews earlier in the process. And it's much cheaper to fix a bug earlier in the process versus having to go back and rework things when you let a security issue escape into production and potentially leaked information, passwords, personal information. So we're trying to shift it left and make sure that you, as soon as you can possibly identify it, that you do. Oh, that's great. I love that. Uh, to learn more about GitHub Advanced Security, by you can learn more about it by following the link on your screen. Donovan, I think that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So, Sonia. Day two is going by so quickly. Yeah. What has stood out for you so far? Honestly, everything has been amazing. I do love that we talked about AI today. We got to um, you know, speak to a, quite a few experts. We had Seth, uh, obviously, in his into focus session going into details there. I've just really loved all the enthusiasm also from all of our partner speakers. Yeah. Also, shout out to those corn nuts. Star yeah. of the show. It really, like, <laughs> really crinkled on in, <laughs> into the show. Crinkled our way, its way into our hearts, yeah. really. Yep. Not so. sponsored by Corn Nuts, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. so it's time for Microsoft Build into Focus. Build collaborative apps to thrive in the modern workplace. Be sure to join us right back here in the studio, though, when you're finished. This is Microsoft Build. Welcome back to Microsoft Build Into Focus. This segment is about building collaborative apps to thrive in the modern workplace. I'm your host, Karawana Gatimu. For the next 45 minutes, we'll be showing you some exciting demos and code to help you with your collaboration scenarios. We'll also speak with customers and partners who are already building collaborative apps. Let's hop in. This is Into Focus. I'm here with Bragu Serene, one of the early leaders of Teams. I've had the pleasure of working with you for some time now, Bragu. It's great to be here, Caruana, and with all the developers out there. That's great. You know, I want to just hop directly in. What exactly is a collaborative app, and what does it mean to create one? Absolutely. So a collaborative app enables a team of people with different roles across geographies to come together to accomplish a task. And, and you know, these collaborative apps, uh, in the collaborative app, getting the job done is at the heart. So for a minute, imagine you're a developer of uh, an ISV that builds DevOps. And here you are with this application, and one of your users gets a notification at 2 a.m. Not that it's ever happened before. <laughs> and you get a notification, but when the developer wakes up, you've also built your app to be collaborative in the sense that it brought together all the content, all the data related to that life site via a bot inside a channel in Teams. And guess what? It also enabled synchronous collaboration by creating a bridge for a meeting and everybody else that's needed to solve that issue is right there. 
I love that. You know, it's really bringing everyone together to be effective at the same time. So really, I mean, obviously we're at Microsoft Build. So how should developers think about enabling collaboration in their apps? Do they just turn this on? Is there more depth that they really need to bring to that scenario? Awesome question. So there are a number of Teams platform capabilities, and you could, you know, just take those, integrate them in your application, whether you're a line of business developer, whether you are building an ISV or a system integrator, they're there. But a, um, what it provides is an opportunity for developers to really rethink, reimagine what that application means when you take advantage of a chat or collab capability and enable synchronous collab, uh, asynchronous collaboration or synchronous collaboration leveraging Teams meetings extensibility. Absolutely, so together or apart, you're enabling something that is helping people be more effective. Exactly. Right? exactly. I love that, I love that. So, but you know what I'm gonna ask you next, right? What should an IT pro be thinking about, about managing collaborative apps in their environment, the ones that come from Microsoft Teams? And I'm smiling because Karwan, I know exactly where that question's coming from. You used to be an IT admin in your past life. Right. And so for IT pros, we deliver capabilities on two dimensions. It's about visibility as well as control. On visibility, admins can see information such as what data the app is going to use and on permissions it needs to run. And on control, admins can manage app availability in their orgs as well as manage the user experience, choosing proactively to install apps. For the Teams Admin Center, when we were building it from the beginning, one thing I just wanted to share is at the core, when we were imagining it, it is about empowering the admin to create some magical, powerful experiences. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's easy to say magical experiences. But, um, so for a minute, imagine you have someone in your organization that's in marketing. You, as an IT admin, can create templates that are customized with the apps, workflows, or if you're a retail colleague, imagine being able, when that retail colleague opens up Teams, right there they have all the floor plans for the store. In case they have a question, corporate can answer right away, or, or you complete the task, you publish the, what the display looks like, and right away, other people can give you kudos and thumbs up for how gorgeous it looks. Yeah, I love that. You know, and of course, uh, in my former life, I worked in a large organization that lots of retail places. But what you're talking about is that that information that's so uh, there, right there. So it's, I love that. A few days ago, folks, I spoke with Shiva Ganesan from Tata Consultancy Services. He's the global head of the Microsoft Business Unit. And we talked about how they're developing collaborative apps for their own experiences, but also for other organizations. Let's take a look at some of that conversation. Hi, Siva. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here, Prakul. Siva, first, I just want to open by saying thank you very much for you and your team's partnership on first onboarding TCS onto Microsoft Teams, leveraging chat, collab meetings, and then using Teams as the hub for collaboration, building collab apps on the Teams platform. Uh, do you mind sharing your journey with us? Sure, Brigo. Uh, as you know, we've embraced Microsoft 365 and Teams as the next-gen productivity suite across almost 370,000 monthly active users on Teams today. Now, we've been on a journey not just spanning the basic functionality, but indeed integrating it with line-of-business applications for ourselves and our customers. You'll be happy to know there's more than 10 applications that are already in use, and uh, two of them in excess of 300,000 monthly active users. Shiva, sorry for interrupting you, but the two applications combined monthly active usage is 300,000? Oh, no, it's each of them. Each, so it's wow. really a lot of usage, yeah. So the types of apps we have built, right? So if you uh, look for a few examples, one is a, an application that helps us look for experts within our organization. And that's very handy when it comes to assembling our teams. The second is in terms of how we integrate from a line of business perspective with our enterprise applications on, on say, service management. Helps for speedier resolution time. Now, um, surely it's not all work. There's also good fun stuff. So for a parent group, uh, believe it or not, there's a food ordering app as well. So kind of spice it up a little. Now, extend this to different industries we're working on. Let me take just two examples, retail manufacturing. So much of the industry use cases coming right. alive from a team's extension perspective. I think that's really where the game is headed. So TCS works with thousands of customers across the globe. 
What market opportunity and patterns are you seeing from these customers when it comes to collaborative apps built on uh, Teams platform? So there's a tremendous opportunity to build these collaborative apps, right? And the thing re really is about how do you extend Microsoft Teams and integrate line of business applications with it. Now, when you do this, uh, employees get empowered because they're all operating of one canvas teams. Right. They don't have to switch context all the time. And you can rather focus on the experience and the transaction on hand. You need to deliver to the end customer. So that's really the, uh, you know, uh, the USP, if I may, of how the line of business apps, the collab apps, as you've put it, combine forces with teams. Absolutely. And so from the hundreds of examples that you have, can you share any specific stories of collab apps that Tata Consultancy Services has mm -hmm. built for the customers? Sure. Uh, let me take two examples. One, a large Canadian bank uh, who during the pandemic had to connect with customers. And as right. we all know, that was really a pent up need for most organizations. Right. Taking advantage of Teams, secure video channels, allowing for documents and stuff like that to be shared. And also integrating with CRM. It provided, I think, quite the right digital humanized experience for interactions between the bank and its end consumers. Uh, switch gears, let's go to Europe, a large uh, telecommunications giant. Frontline workers, field service, need to partner with a larger ecosystem of suppliers and, and uh, providers. Again, Teams as a channel allowing for larger digital collaboration and not just the basic functionality. So I think two great examples from, like you said, hundreds of what have come by. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing to see by geo, by industry, by job function, uh, the, the different scenarios that are making uh, people's work more efficient. And so as we transition from remote work to hybrid work, do you see these patterns actually staying? No, that's the beauty of it. I think it's no longer a transient phenomenon that you know happened only during the pandemic. I think as the normalcy unfolds, we see examples like that of an Indian retailer for whom the audit process, a traditional right. one, where auditors have to travel and you know be physically present at the site of audit, that whole process has been streamlined and lubricated through the video capabilities of Teams. But it's not just a conduit; it's also um, improving or uh, you know augmenting the extensibility of the audit because you supplement it with checklists and the like, which are also native to Teams, and therefore enhance also the quality and the efficacy of the audit. So examples like these, I think, are here to stay, and more will come by. It's amazing to see how TCS helps an organization from envisioning to building and then deploying these, what historically we've always been talking about as digital transformation. I think it's here to stay. And so it's good to actually hear you say it's here to stay. And so thank you very much uh, for being here and, and uh, talking to me about it. Great. You're welcome, Brugo. Thank you. And uh, look forward to even a deeper partnership in the years to come. Absolutely. Thank you. What a time to be a systems integrator or a developer in this space. I feel like the opportunity is pretty endless. It's yes. tremendous. Exactly. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a great time to be here. Um, and uh, where would you call seeing 10 years of digital transformation all happening in a set of two years and we're only getting started. I know, right? And we have the ecosystem, right, to support people taking advantage of this. I think that's huge. This opportunity is real. It's right now. And even though it's magical, it's it's completely true of what's happening. And it's being done on the Microsoft Teams platform. You're absolutely right. And there are a number of ISVs that are making significant progress, fueling growth by building collaborative apps on the Teams platform. Satya shared yesterday uh, this slide where there are several partners, each generating more than a million dollars in ARR, annual recurring revenue from commercial customers. Wow, that impact is real. It is. So we have a lot of developers who are new to collaborative apps, but how do people begin building them? You know, right now, I think we should hand it over to Alex Powell and Paul Godet uh, to show us just that. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm super excited today to show you how to build these kinds of great experiences in Teams. I'm Alex Powell, a Principal Design Manager on Teams, and I'm joined here today by Paul Gilday, who's a Senior Product Manager on Fluent UI. And today, Paul and I will talk you through just how easy it is to build a Teams application using the latest toolkits and Visual Studio Code extensions, and how to make your app look really great inside of Teams. And whether you're an ISV or an LOB app developer, 
everything we're going to show you is available for coding today so you can get started building amazing Teams apps. Paul, are you excited to show us some code today? Yeah, totally. Can't wait to see what you have. OK, awesome. So now let's imagine you are in charge of building a Teams retail application called Contoso. The Contoso app enables its users to connect and collaborate on common retail scenarios. So these are things like product launches, sales and analytics, and supply chain management, and it really acts as a central hub for the company. So here we can see the Contoso Home tab, which brings together content from a number of different data services and connectors, including Viva Insights and Power BI, giving users a complete view of relevant information for their day. So this tab has been designed using Microsoft's design system called Fluent and its component library called Fluent UI, which enables you to build Teams applications that look and feel integrated, but give you the power to retain your own brand. The Fluent components are responsive down to mobile views, like the one you can see on the right here. They're fully accessible, and they come with a design token system that enables you to apply custom colors, shapes, elevation, and font styles, enabling you to easily style your app to match your company's own style system. OK, Paul, so now that we've seen this, how would you go about building this kind of app for Teams? All right. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. So I have my developer environment already set up. I have VS Code with the Teams toolkit already installed. And this toolkit is essential for building Teams applications because it allows you to build, debug, provision, and deploy your Teams app to Azure. Now, I'm, I've already hit F5, and so we're running live here. And so what I'm going to walk you through is this dashboard experience that Alex, uh, that Alex presented to us. So I'm just going to add a little bit of configuration to my view here. And then I'm going to talk about the, uh, the technology that I'm using, the UI technology that I'm using to make this happen. So I'm using a mixture of Teams UI and Fluent UI React. And so Teams UI gives me the capability for low code configuration for high level layouts and for UX patterns. And Fluent UI React gives me the control and the customization that I need for building custom components. And so here you can see I have a dashboard full of data visualization, some custom components. And as Alex said beforehand, all of this is responsive. So as I resize my window here, you can see all of that content resize and fill the screen, which is super cool. The other thing that Alex also mentioned was that these component libraries come with theme ability in mind. And so when I change the, the theme inside of Teams here from a light mode to a dark mode, all of the UI automatically updates. And if your end users have specific contrast requirements, we even have high contrast theme support out of the box as well. Super cool. Now, we also talked about responsive, right? And so we can take the same exact experience and we can bring it over to a phone. And so let me just bring this up on the phone. And you can see here all of that same UI that we built here on our desktop is now available on the phone. OK. So what's, uh, what's next on the agenda, Alex? Thanks, Paul. That looks absolutely amazing. OK, now let's take a look at how Teams can seamlessly connect data and workflows across Teams and enable collaboration with the Contoso app without having to leave the chat or the channel that you're in. So here we join Daniela, who's a regional store manager working the Contoso app on a new product launch and is looking at the Contoso supply chain dashboard to see information on the new product that's being launched. So she wants to share information on the new product with her team. And so she uses a new feature called Share to Teams that she can access from the overflow menu that you can see here. So when she clicks on it, it opens a task module which has been seeded with an adaptive card displaying product information taken from the dashboard. And here she can enter information in the description field and select the channel that she wants to share the information with from the channel picker before sending. OK, Paul, so how would you go about building something similar to this in Teams? OK, awesome. So I'm back in VS Code. And what I'm going to use is the Teams SDK for this, and specifically the sharing capability. So I'm already inside of a menu item here. And all I need to do is use the sharing capability, call the share web content API, give a URL to the content that we want to share. And that's it. Teams takes care of the rest for me. So I'm going to hop back over here. And so for this example, I'm going to click on that same menu item. I'm going to click Share. Teams already provides this UI for me. And here, I can specify the, uh, the, channel that I, the channel or chat that I want to add this content to, and then hit Share. And off you go. That's awesome. OK, now let's take a deeper dive into more Teams collaboration features for chats and channels. 
So now back in the retail scenario, we're going to join one of Daniela's colleagues, Ray, who's an assistant store manager working on the new product launch. He receives a notification that Daniela shared some information in the product launches channel that's been generated by the Contoso app. So he clicks on the Toast notification that takes him directly into the product launches channel where he can see the post created by Daniela and an adaptive card showing information on the product being launched. So Ray now wants to create a task for the product launch for his team. So he uses what's called a message action that he can access from the overflow menu here to create the new Contoso task. That then opens a task module where the description field already contains information taken from the message that has been extracted via the Graph API, saving Ray time and effort in filling out the task description. All he has to do is select the due date, the priority, and the task assignee, in this case, Karen, before clicking on Create. And the Contoso bot takes care of the rest. It posts a new adaptive card to the channel, which shows the task information, and it also automatically notifies Karen that she's been assigned the new task. And one of the really cool things about the adaptive car framework is that it enables the Contoso app to show different content to different users using what's called role-based views. So for instance, here we can see that Ray on the left has additional editing capabilities on the card as the creator of the task compared to Karen on the right, who's been assigned the task. Okay, so we just showed you how adaptive cards, message actions, and task modules can really make collaboration in chats and channels a fully integrated experience with the Contoso app. So Paul, I think you can probably guess what I'm going to ask you next. You how would you show us how this works in code? Awesome. And so what I'm going to focus on specifically is link unfurling with adaptive cards. And the easiest way to do link unfurling is to build a bot. And the easiest way to, easiest way to build a bot is with the Teams Toolkit extension. And I can build a bot with simply two clicks. All I have to do is click Add Capabilities, click Bot, and that's it. And then this gets scaffolded out into my project. So I've already done that today, and I've pulled up my, my bot code here. And so you can watch me. I'm just going to walk through kind of the code that I've already written uh, to get us that adaptive card as a response to, a, to the bot. So here you can see we're declaring our adaptive card. We're rendering that with the data associated with it. Um, I'm adding this to an attachment. And then that attachment gets sent as a result from the response from the bot. So let's go see what that looks like in action. So I'm going to go back to our application. And in this context, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this link to you so that we can collaborate in chat over a specific item in this dashboard. So I'm going to click your avatar here. I'm going to click Follow Up. This will launch a chat with me and you. And you can see that adaptive card pop up automatically with that link unfurling. I can send that to you. And now we can collaborate over chat and, uh, and get our work done inside of Teams. That's it. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. So now in our final scenario, Ray wants to discuss the new product launch with his team in their weekly planning call. So he adds the Contoso app to the planning meeting via the app picker that you can see here, which opens this task module where he can select the dashboard of content that he wishes to share in the meeting. In this case, the new item that's being launched. And now the dashboard with all the relevant product information he wants to share is pinned to the meeting. And he also has a collaborative space here where he and his team can create launch readiness tasks timeline milestones, and things like store plans. OK, now in the call, Ray can use the Contoso app in the right pane adjacent to the call stage so that he can access all of the content he needs to share, but still keep his focus on his team during the call. He can share information on the product launch to the meeting by selecting Share to Meeting from the overflow menu here. And this shares the product information onto the call stage and enables his team to view the product and optionally add their own notes and comments. When they click on OK, the information is then stored with the meeting so it can be accessed after the meeting has ended. So Ray then wants to start creating tasks for the launch plan and so adds them to this collaborative table that you can see on the right-hand side here that's been built with the Fluid SDK. And now his whole team can start adding tasks together and collaborating in real time. So then to make better use of the call stage and so you can share more information with his team, Ray selects the Share to Stage button, which shares the full Contoso dashboard onto the stage, enabling everyone on the call to see all of the information available. And finally, Ray wants to sketch out some ideas for the storefront, and so he shares this storefront designer from the Contoso app that's been built using the Microsoft Live Share, and now everyone on the call can start collaborating and sketching on the call stage in real time. And now, after the meeting, all of the work that Ray and the team did together on the call has now been saved and is available in the Contoso meeting tab. 
so that it can be accessed by all of the call participants after the call has ended, and they can then share this information more broadly across their tenant. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Paul for one last time to give us a demo of the meeting extension framework. Paul, take it away. Awesome. So I'm back in VS Code, and we're gonna reuse a lot of the same code and the demo that we actually built today. We're just gonna put it into that meeting context. And the easiest way to do that is inside of our manifest, we just add the chat tab, the side panel, and the stage context, and that's it. So now I'm gonna switch over to a live meeting here with Alex, nice to see you Alex. And you can see that our application is in the toolbar at the top here in our, in our meeting. And when I click that, you can see that same application, resizing, looking great, applying the right theme, uh, the right theme in this UI. And then with one click, like Alex talked about before, I can share that to the stage. And now Alex and I, we can be collaborative in this meeting and get our work done. So there you have it. Whether you're an ISV or an LLB developer, you have access to a whole bunch of Teams capability uh, here today. What did we talk about? We talked about message extensions, bots, Fluent UI React. We talked about tabs inside of chats, inside of channels. Is there anything else? Did I leave anything else out? I think the only thing I can think of is personal apps. Okay. But yeah, great session. Thanks, everyone. And back over to you. Alex, Paul, thank you. This really shows the end-to-end -end solution opportunity with apps built on Microsoft Teams. Now let's showcase Atlassian, another key partner of ours. Atlassian has been deeply integrating with Teams with apps like Jira and Confluence, which represent some of the best ways of leveraging the Teams canvas. I'll actually let Steve Goldsmith from Atlassian talk about it. He joins us via Teams. Steve, thank you for the close partnership Atlassian has been one of the earliest partners on the Teams platform. Uh, do you mind sharing with all of us a little about your journey? Hey, it's great to be here with you as well, Bergu. For Atlassian, it's all about empowering teams to work the way they want in the tools that let them thrive, which leads Perfect. us Thank to you. build apps on best of green platforms like Teams. We've been building with you since the very beginning, investing to make sure our Atlassian products have a great experience in Teams. We've taken a few different approaches to building on the Teams platform, depending on the product maturity on our side. For existing products like Jira and Confluence, we're using customer insights to create a Teams app to extend and enhance that experience, kind of going back and rethinking our core products in the context of Teams. Separate, limited, but promising for us, products that natively use the Teams platform as the user experience for end users. Our product Help, which appears as an app called Assist in Teams, follows this pattern. And finally, for new products that we're launching, including things from our point A new product program, we're building a Teams app as part of that kind of V1 product spec for many products as we bring them to market. For example, Atlas, which we just launched, had, had a Teams app while it was still in beta. Regardless of the product maturity, though, we let customer experience guide how we prioritize and translate those capabilities into Teams. So, Steve, it's pretty awesome. And again, I'm just sharing for everyone, like this journey you've been on, you've actually used applications, first built them just natively, then incorporated some of those key platform components, and then even brought new uh, apps and capabilities onto the Teams platform. So could you share with us some of the usage patterns you're seeing around collaborative apps? For sure. Teams for us is, the, is kind of the new office, meaning it's the critical channel where work ultimately moves forward not just the structured meetings, but the kind of online hallway chats and impromptu huddle type conversations. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a surge in usage of our, our apps in Teams, which I attribute obviously to the complementary nature of our products. Uh, nearly 70% of the Fortune 500 companies use at least one Atlassian app within Teams last month. Wow, awesome. that, that, yeah. is pretty, that is really cool. That's awesome, thank you. So Atlassian apps are frequently the system of record for the current state of a project or yes. a repo or a knowledge base, something like that. Teams acts as a system of engagement to really extend the out information out to where people are working. Right. Um, building apps in Teams allows for inclusive teams engagement, inclusive team engagement, <laughs> allowing contributors to take action or stay aware of a project or piece of work as it moves through the life cycle without having to switch apps. One example of this is the Confluence embedded pages that we just shipped. It brings the full editing experience of the Confluence editor into a Teams tab. This is the first time, actually, we've embedded this core functionality into a third-party product. So again, it's really um, uh, cool to see how you're reducing the friction 
for the users. And at the end of the day, our joint goal is to how do we empower the user to complete the task faster, to collaborate better, to get those decisions that need to get done so projects get done and, and they deliver impact. And so in this uh, case, what are the team's capabilities do you think they first leverage? And how's the feedback been? I would say generally our customers want both depth and flexibility in their apps, not right. just a surface level kind of connection. Um, that's why our apps have functionality across the multiple scopes of Teams, from chat to tabs to notifications to meetings. Uh, after the initial discovery of the app, we found that most users flock towards two main things. One is personal notifications. Customers are hungry to move that notification out of their inbox and work at the pace of chat in the place they're spending their day. We actually had a customer tell us that after adding the Jira app to Teams, he claimed he started to scare a few coworkers with how fast he responded to ticket updates because the Teams notifications are instant and could comment and update right from Teams. We, we found that that's not really the design goal of the product we were after to help employees scare each other's team members. But it's kind of funny. <laughs> that's that the notification one is uh, is uh, is classic because. Uh, we see this all the time is notifications being a powerful um, ability to really drive that engagement and complete those tasks. Um, is there something around tabs that you could share before we get into the next uh, set of uh, thoughts here? Yeah, for sure. The, the other big one in addition to personal notifications was tabs and being able to pin that Trello board or, or Jira board or Confluence tab directly to a channel. Right. So the whole team has that shared context to everyone quickly and easily. Perfect, so true examples of collaboration, both driving async as well as synchronous collaboration with everyone with a shared context. So here you have a channel, you have the right people, you have the right content, you've got the applications, and you're able to make decisions faster without having to switch between and, and, uh, and have any of that friction. So um, I'm gonna change tracks a little bit from our customer experiences to more around your developers that built these collaborative applications on the Teams platform. So Steve, from an, from an Atlassian development team perspective, could you please speak to the ramp up journey on building the, on the Teams platform and then later on how we've been kind of grown over the years. But, but, but before you start, Steve, I'm gonna request, could you please keep your feedback to the last 18 months or so? Because I know we've been working together, and if you go back four years, four and a half years, I'm a little worried because the platform is a little rough. We've made a lot of improvements. So over to you, Steve, if you could share how your developers are uh, experiencing the Teams platform. Thank you. Sure, and, and we've been happy to be a partner along the way here. We know that any new platform is an investment of time and energy and really ex succeeds when that platform is embraced mm -hmm. and extended. We're committed to Microsoft Teams to ensure our customers can engage with the surface or product or workflow that works for them. Onboarding working Teams API, Graph API, and Bot Framework was a pretty big project for us due to the breadth of APIs available. Um, what's nice though is we're also learning as platform consumers and platform providers. So we're thinking about ways we can continue to offer Atlassian's flavor of collaborative apps and enable developers to lower the learning curve just like you all are. Steve, so we keep learning from each other's platforms and programs. Steve, thank you very much for the continued partnership. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brigitte. It's been great. And now, Karwana, back to you. All right, so much good stuff here. I love that part from Magoo about just the last 18 months. <laughs> that was great. Next, we're going to hear from Lumen, whose large citizen developer community uh, has built over 3,500 low-code apps and continue to add or develop applications directly in Microsoft Teams. Make sure to check it out, and we've got some great information for you right now. At Lumen, we're all about the next-gen technology and connecting the consumer with what we're doing and with the business. We have smart people at Lumen. They come up with ideas, and if you don't provide them a platform, they figure out a way to do it themselves. And Teams is a great gateway for that. Teams is a fantastic platform for collaboration. But beyond collaboration, you can surface different power apps into your team solution. 
For our more experienced developers, the Power Platform removes a lot of the work that you have to do up front. There's also the ability to just quickly create your canvas and then move your code in behind it. I can just drag and drop. I have the ability now to actually go in and look at my power effects and I can see how all this actually flows. Another area is the API access to Dataverse. And we have the pro developer who's seeing what's happening there, and that's happening with our citizen developer and our maker, and now they're coming together. We've created 3,800 power apps and close to 8,500 flows with our makers at Lumen. The thing that I'm most proud of is this community that has just organically grown. It's this ability to support each other it's the best thing I've ever done in my career. So we've come to the final moments of this Interfocus, and here with us in studio is Carolyn Groh, the Chief Operating Officer at Law Tobots. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here today. So before we get into our conversation, I wanted to start by saying thank you, Carolyn, and thank you to Law Toolbox. Um, I'm going to go back a little to the first Microsoft build back in 2017 for Microsoft Teams. And uh, it was a special moment for me personally as we were sharing uh, the platform capabilities. And you were there and we met. And uh, I just wanted to start by saying we appreciate the partnership. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It was such an exciting moment to be at that very first Teams roundtable. We had just uh, announced our Teams app, and that was right before Microsoft Teams was formally launched. Right. Uh, could you share with us uh, what Law Toolbox has built and uh, your journey? Absolutely. So our founder, a litigator, created Law Toolbox as the first online legal SaaS way back in 1998. Wow. <laughs> one, he had one goal in mind, and that was to reduce the risk of missed deadlines. And he did this in two ways. First, he created online legal calculators that auto-generated deadlines based on a library of the rules of procedure for regulatory and civil litigation deadlines. And of course, the second part was to get those deadlines into the, the, the attorney calendars, mm -hmm. the place where well over 90% of lawyers rely on to be reminded of their deadlines, of course, the yeah, Outlook calendar. Exactly. So, as, you're, as the lawyers are using your law toolbox yeah. and experiencing, and seems like Outlook is working really, really well. So in addition, why a collaborative app on Microsoft Teams platform? Well, first off, our clients were explicit. They said, please don't make us learn a new tool or go to a new cloud. That's fair, by the way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So our job was to solve their calendaring and collaboration needs but we needed to do it in the place that they had already invested their time and, and were familiar with and using right. every day. Right. So the, ba the bet that we placed was based on a response to a 2018 Forrester prediction that within five years, Microsoft Teams would become that place where people spend their day. So today, Law Toolbox is a matter management platform that is built on top of Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, and Outlook. Nice. And used inside of our customers' Microsoft 365 tenants. That's pretty cool. This, it really is. It's super fascinating, and especially for me, because legal technology is actually where I got my start in this business. So I really want to see this. Can we take a look? Absolutely. The Law Toolbox Personal Bot helps lawyers organize their work by projects called matters in the legal industry. They have the flexibility to create working groups to share a matter among colleagues across their team. The source of the matter is generally pulled in from a customer CRM like Salesforce, an accounting program, or a state and local government database, and connects via our API. On the back end, the Law Toolbox API calls to the Microsoft Graph API to create matters in Teams automatically. Law Toolbox offers Teams templates with pre-configured tabs, channels, folders, and files. We also allow our customers to pull in whatever they need, like e-signature or document automation, to ensure a team has what they need when they start a new matter. From the matter I selected in Outlook, 
Clicking Teams Chat uses a deep link to jump users from Outlook directly to the Teams Chat for that matter. And here in the Teams tab on the toolbar, we see our pre-configured templatized team with the apps our clients need to get their work done. And in the left rail are the channels, files, and folders where they can organize their work. Now, using our bot-enabled messaging extension, users are able to select a matter in the Teams chat, which is then displayed in an adaptive card. This deep links to the individual matter, taking them to the automated calendar for that team. Powered by Law Toolbox's rules-based calendaring library for administrative or regulatory timelines. I love this. It is such a great example of the continuity of technology and how it can really impact people's experience. Agreed. Uh, it's embracing people and helping get the job done efficiently. Could you share your thoughts around security, information pr protection, and the compliance uh, considerations? Yes, as, as you can imagine, there's a hyper sensitivity around security and privacy. Yes for the legal community and state and local governments. So because our product lives inside of Microsoft 365's platform, Law Toolbox inherits the Microsoft 365 data governance and records retention policies for free. And mm -hmm. we and our clients are benefiting from a level of security that we could never build on our own. You know, it's really, all about peace of mind. It's, it's the peace of mind for our customers, but it's also peace of mind for us. Right. And so changing tracks a little bit, uh, first, thank you for sharing your experiences. Yep. There's one feature that we shipped back in October, and that was the ability to have uh, ISVs or developers have a uh, SaaS offer that could be purchased right from either the team store or from the Teams admin center. And Law Toolbox actually integrated the capability. And so I'm curious, uh, what has been the feedback and how have organizations responded to the integration of this capability? It's been awesome. Our customers nice. have, yeah, I mean, truly, they have told us that it is, they just really appreciate how much easier it is to very quickly get approval, um, not have to go through the, the uh, the PO process, a purchase order process, and they can go straight to purchasing and then managing their Law Toolbox 365 licenses nice. in the exact same way that they're managing their Microsoft 365 licenses. Um, and, and speaking of purchasing, we've actually seen our licensing revenue double in the last several months. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's great. <laughs> It is great, it is great. And it's a seamlessness of experience that we mm -hmm. really strive for. So, you know, this means if any of you are really excited to get the Law Toolbox app in your office or Office of General Counsel Org, you or your Teams admin can buy it directly through the Teams App Store or the Teams Admin Center. Exactly, and, and when you combine that direct buy process that I just talked about, right with the, uh, the option to, to partner and leverage the Microsoft ecosystem of 100,000 Microsoft partners, right. our ability to scale and grow reaches an entirely new level. And, and Brigo, you talked earlier about those $100 million partners. Million dollar. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> the million dollar She's partners. She's seeing into the future, know, that's all. That's hey, just into the future. They might or might not be 100 million, but <laughs> yeah. that's like. 100 million, yeah. yes. That is a million dollar annual recurring revenue slide, yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, we're gonna get there. And we actually um, got some exciting news last night. Okay. We heard that our April licensing revenue quadrupled March. Uh, Whoa! So I think I think we're gonna get there a lot sooner than we expected. So Carwana, when we were talking earlier, yeah. like last week when we were prepping for this, yes. I had not heard that stat. That's great. See, and this is a live reveal right is, here on the show. We like that. I was we gonna, like that. I was gonna worried for a second because then <laughs> Carolyn's like, I got some data last night. And I'm like, oh, feature request, feature request. <laughs> but, but okay, that that uh, that is awesome. Uh, yes, and you know, honestly, we're. We're, we're going to get there, and we believe that being part of the Microsoft Team Store and that, that buying process is like really key to helping us get there faster. Absolutely. 
Carolyn, it's so great to reconnect with you. Thank you very much again for the close partnership, continually giving us feedback, making our platform even better. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been, it's been lovely to be here today. It's a great story, and I, I just love the history, right? These partnerships are about people and what we can do together. So thank you so much again. And thank you, Ragu. You know, it's always good to spend some time with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Kind of want to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, here we are. Um, I am very enthusiastic about what happens here because you can see the direct impact that it has on people, on their businesses, and on the careers that are out there. This is exactly what we're trying to talk about here at Microsoft Build. So whomever you are, maybe you're a new business user who's just coming into this or a new developer. Maybe you're a pro developer who's been here for a really long time or you're an ISV or a partner who's thinking up new product spaces. That's exactly what we want you to do. Think about this, dream this up with us, and then dive in to the skilling that we have for you so that you can make it a reality like the folks we showed you today. That does it for Into Focus on collaborative apps. Personally, as you can tell, I'm so inspired. There's been so much that's happened here at Microsoft Build uh, over the course of the two days. Uh, I'm always inspired listening to Satya speak about those 10 key themes. Um, I watch that again. I encourage you to watch that again because it'll help you orient on everything that's going on. We've talked here about the metaverse, about the power of low code, no code. Uh, we've talked about AI, and now we're talking about collaborative apps. And so these things, these themes are coming together, right? So again, the opportunity for you is to dive into the technology, put your hands on the keyboard, unleash yourself, break free as we talk about uh, so that you can realize the benefits of this for yourself, for your career, for your community, and for your organization. It doesn't matter if you're brand new to this or a seasoned pro. You can build collaborative apps and also take advantage of all of the other things that we've talked about here on Into Focus and at Microsoft Build. It is possible right now today. Microsoft has provided the ecosystem, the support, and the tools to make it happen. You heard me talk about community earlier. Dive in there as well. So to learn more about what we've covered today, here are some resources. For collaborative apps, you can see this link on the screen. You can put your hands on the keyboard at the App in the Day workshop at AIAD event. Um, you can continue your learning journey in the Microsoft 365 community with our dev calls. And lastly, stay up to date on all of our news at the Microsoft 365 developer blog. I'm Karawana Gatimu. I am always privileged and lucky to be your host for Into Focus and to participate in Microsoft build. I hope you have a great one. See you soon. Welcome back to the Microsoft Build Studio. It's day two. We've gotten three Microsoft Build Into Focus shows under our belt, which makes me one very happy host. See what you did there. It's our last hour of regular programming, but this final hour in studio is really starting off with a bang. Yep, this time we've got some great guests and interviews. That's all right, we'll be sitting down with the president of Microsoft's developer division, Julia Lucen, to talk Java. She probably make some coffee for yourself right now. Ah, no, she's I turning know. into Seth. What is I happening? I the puns. I knew Seth was on the stage for too long. <laughs> Speaking of interviews, I'll be rounding out the hour with a chat about connected apps at the edge of 5G, a great way to round out the day. And the final party of this Microsoft Build event has to be the second installment of our After Hour series. Series. Our very own Scott Hanselman and friends are always having, you know, fun time talking about interesting things, so look out for that after the show. It was so fun yesterday. Like, I'm trying to figure out how to get into the MS archives right now. <laughs> so, there are a lot of opportunities to learn and skill up through the event, throughout the event. So our next question is, secret poll, how oh. excited are you for the Microsoft Build Learn Live sessions? A, you can't wait for the Learn Live sessions. B, you've already booked out your calendar for a few topics. C, you'll check them out if your schedule allows. Or D, you're more of a keynote person, but now that you mention it, yeah. And we're looking at the results. Hey, so many people are super Whoa. excited. Yeah. I, I love the learn live sessions. A lot of love for that. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. 
I, I uh, learned a little bit about how the learn lives are structured and there's like a gamification involved with it too, with achievements. And Amazing. I, yeah, as a completionist, I want to learn everything now. <laughs> yeah, I, I like this. It's all about a learn it all attitude, right? So I yeah. think that is a perfect set of sessions for, for everyone to get really hands on mm -hmm. into the content. Yeah. It's, I see a little bit more coming in. I'll check them out if my schedule follows. That's what your backpack's for. Yeah. Add them all to add your it. backpack. If you're in doubt, just <laughs> add it. The backpack never gets any heavier. Yeah. <laughs> and personally, I'm always team D because I always think I'm just gonna watch the keynotes, but then I get immediately curious about whatever gets discussed in the keynote, but because it's only a two minute Thing. It's like, wait a minute, I want to know more. <laughs> Don't keep going. I know. <laughs> so throughout the event, you've shared your insight, your excitement, and your reactions. Let's check in on Twitter feed one more time. All right, we've got some of the new tweets up on the wall. Let's take a look at what's going on over here. All right, I love the Microsoft Build keynote from Kevin Scott that features makerspaces, Minecraft, and so much more tech goodness. I know, that was a really great keynote for us to kick off today. Um, we've had some amazing speakers, but yeah, Kevin Scott's, like he really helped, uh, you know, with the AI conversation, like really kicked it off. Yeah, we've also, mm -hmm. and we've also had some really amazing regional spotlights. Ignacio over here says, it was amazing to be part of the in-person MS Build, Latin event as a newbie MVP, Latin America. Great sessions and people everywhere. Yeah, uh, I really wish I was going to one of those regional sessions because they looked like such a blast. It looked like such a party in France. I know, France and <laughs> was like, what is Germany. going on? It's like it's a nightclub amazing. over there. I like this very straightforward tweet over here, just Azure, Azure, <laughs> Azure, 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 Azure. That's a takeaway right, right you know, there. You know that game like uh, Eight Degrees by Kevin Bacon? Yeah. You can just tie everything back to Azure. Yeah. That was discussed at Bill, most likely. When in doubt, mm -hmm. yeah. I also like this shout out down here, kind of closer to you, Sonia, about the dot Comp, um, the .NET conference for 2022 in November. That happens every year. Always some exciting things in the .NET space, such as today's announcement, which was about .NET Maui, as we talked about earlier. So definitely uh, stay tuned for that and mark your calendar. Yep, and then we have, uh, ooh, we got some new ones. Yeah, Yay. awesome, great. So uh, we have uh, April, who's talking about another Learn Life session, which our poll was just about, going on around integrating web APIs with the Power Platform. So if you added this to your backpack, you can go and check it out. Uh, there's some, so many amazing sessions, the keynotes, all that you can save um, and access for later when you have some time. Yeah, and you know, we mentioned how much fun it looked like in Paris in particular. So uh, Olivier over here says, thank you for the welcome, the organization, your state of mind, the goodies, you rock. I'm assuming it's France, so forgive me if it's not just based off of the flag, but it looks like there's some great camaraderie happening and uh, a build over on that side. Yep, and then I, I really love this one over here, watching coding with kids, cultivating the next generation of developers through play. I think there's some amazing sessions talking about, you know, the building blocks and how you can uh, get started in, in coding. So I think. I think we've had some amazing sessions. I love all the enthusiasm and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wait, mommy, I'm on TV from Stefan over there. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it's not directly, but speaking mm -hmm. <laughs> at Build does count. I think that's pretty good. It, it is an international event, so that's really exciting. And remember to use the hashtag MSBuild to keep the conversation going. Can we keep the tweets coming until next year's event? Let's find out, hashtag challenge accepted. Oh, yes, but first, are you into cloud gaming? <laughs> Your hand was like already up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then this next video is for you. <laughs> Inside a top secret biotech firm in the hills of New Zealand, history is about to be rewritten. The Heinlocking Key, a secret project is being incubated. A brilliant team of data analysts, engineers, and scientists is applying data and AI to help resolve a global crisis. In here, data doesn't merely illuminate. Data doesn't just quantify. Data feeds those who need it most. The amazing new game that lets you put your Microsoft technology skills to the test. Data feeds a Microsoft Learn Cloud game. Coming soon. You can't just walk into a store. 
There's no, I saw that in the window and I loved it. It felt like, at least from the fashion world, they weren't, they didn't care enough about me to even want my money. It was worth less to them than someone who was smaller than me. I wanted girls to have a more positive shopping experience than I had. And so I said, if no one else is gonna make it, like screw it, I'll make it. Using Windows 11, we're building a super transparent way to show plus size women that they have more options. I use Snap Assist constantly. I'm working on designs for social media content, editing videos. I can just tap the thing I want with my finger, which feels like a very natural motion to just be like, I want that. We've created a space where you can just say, this sucks, let's help fix it together. Let's build community around it. Let's support one another. And if we can make things truly size inclusive, we're going to make a more positive world. And with Windows 11, I'm working on it. Ask the Expert on Learn TV is a weekly show where you can connect directly with the technical experts you're looking for and get your questions answered live. We talk about the interesting people behind the tech at Microsoft and beyond. Connect with the experts, learn amazing stuff, live on Learn TV. Next up, I got a chance to sit down with Julia Lucen to talk about the latest from the world of Java. Take a look. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Sonia. Great to see you. Awesome. All right, so let's get started. Um, what build announcements are you most excited about? Well, my team have uh, many announcements at this particular build, and there are three I'm really partial to. The first one is the Microsoft DevBox. The second one is the general availability of Azure Container Apps. And the third one is, um, is, the, gen is the general availability of uh, Java Spring Apps uh, Enterprise tier uh, at build conferences. So with the Microsoft DevBox, the thing I'm really excited about is that it's a new cloud service that provides developers and their team with self-service access to high-performance workstations in the cloud. And developers can pre-configure the workstation with any tools, a library, framework for their specific project, all while maintaining security and corporate governance. And it really reduces new developer onboarding from potentially days to minutes. It allows developers to easily work on other projects and try new tools. So I'm super excited about that. And then for container apps, it allows you to run microservices and containerized applications on a serverless container platform. And then one of the really nice thing about it is that it's built on the foundation of a set of powerful open source technology that delivers the same microservices benefits as Kubernetes, but it's in a fully managed kind of app hosting option. So as a developer, that means you don't have to worry about Kubernetes infrastructure. You don't have to worry about the hosting services. You just have to go focus on developing the business operation and the code that you can write. And then with Java Spring Apps, we, this is a close collaboration with has VMware. It solves the challenges of running Spring applications at cloud scale, also on Kubernetes. And very similarly for developers, you don't have to worry about you know, application lifecycle, monitoring, container intricacies. You can just work on, again, developing the business logic that you can work on. So those are the things I'm really excited about. Oh, that's awesome. Great. So we'd love to know specifically, how are these announcements relevant to Java developers? Yeah, Java developer has been a huge focus for my team. Um, I know there's a keynote coming up, uh, right, you know, in a, in a little bit, <clears throat> really focused on Java. For developer, if you think about a Microsoft DevBox announcement, as a Java developer, you probably want to provision, you know, your own IntelliJ or Eclipse IDEs. You want to try to, you know, the Java runtime and, you know, whichever version you're currently using on. And, you know, and then you can configure the entire thing exactly to what your development team standards are. And then, you know, you can preserve that standards in the cloud. And when you have a new developer joining, the new DevOps just shows up immediately like that. And then isn't that amazing? And then for container apps, we are very, you know, you can use Java, you can use .NET, you can use Node to deploy, you know, your Java applications in container apps with the same kind of benefit I just talked about. And obviously, Spring app is all about Java. Spring is the most popular Java microservices framework. 
So the Spring Apps Enterprise is really dedicated to our Java developers. Oh, that's awesome. That's wonderful. Um, so you quickly, you had mentioned VMware. How is Microsoft working with partners in the open source community? Can you tell us a little bit more there? Yeah, we have been spending so much time working with a lot of different partners. Even in this particular build, we have a set of big announcements with our partner community. Sprint App is a great example of our collaboration with VMware. Uh, not only we co-developed the Sprint App services, and we also cooperate it together. That means that you know our develop, our Java developers will get the sort of like the the product support services from both VMware and Microsoft together to fully support their needs. We're also making an announcement with F5 to you know to have an Nginx service that is kind of built by F5 on Azure. It will really help migrate ex and, and or extend Java workload you know uh, into the cloud from their on-prem solutions. Uh, I very frequently people use Nginx for their load balancing needs, et cetera. And then for Nginx, this is another you know, close partnership between F5 and Microsoft in developing this solution together. It gives developer almost a native experiences in Azure with Azure, Azure, Pro, uh, Azure portal experiences, et cetera, you know, uh, and uh, you know, uh, CLI you know, uh, access. And we also have a very similar story with Dynatrace. Developers can deploy Dynatrace with one-click provisioning and configuration on Azure portal, also with building security, and so it's a very native experiences. So these are just some of the examples of how we're working with partners to give our customers the best experiences on Azure. I love it. Awesome. This is great information, Julia. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Sonia. Nice talking to you. Well, as a member of the developer division, it's always cool to hear what Julia has got to say. Microsoft Build is an event for developers, but earlier this year, Microsoft showed up to the Game Developers Conference in a big, all-digital way. Welcome to Game Development at Microsoft. If you're interested in making games but not sure where to start, start here with the latest content released at the Game Developers Conference. Begin by learning about our self-publishing platform, ID at Xbox. Today, ID at Xbox is over 2,600 games in active development. We have 4,600 studios registered with us across 94 countries. Wherever you are, we'll help you develop in the cloud. A new program called ID at Azure. Access to all of Azure services, credits, learning, and expertise. To take full advantage of cloud gaming services. The last two years has taught us a ton. Remote, moving to hybrid work is really here to stay, uh, which is why we actually created the Game Development VM. We're so committed and focused on how do we make game development easier? How do we break down those barriers so that you know, everyone can focus on the game itself? Our shared goal is to really make it possible for anyone to be able to tell their story. I really liked that video. Yeah, that was great. I, I'm one of those people who checks out the giant um, GDC or Game Developers Conference playlist on YouTube when <laughs> it's over and just binge watch a bunch of different ones. I love yeah. seeing how games get made. I love that. Yeah, the greatest hits and you can actually deep dive into some of them. But yeah, it's great seeing how we're partnering with um, you know, plenty of other game developers out like there. The <laughs> Azure Game Development VM, I thought that was pretty sweet to have those gaming specific needs and dependencies all in one place. It's great, yeah. It's definitely you know an incredible time for games. Um, and it's great to see these tools and resources are readily available to anyone who wants to get into game development. Yeah, and if you want to learn more, you can check out the GEC 2022 YouTube playlist as I do at the URL below. Yep. Next up, the new tech that's personifying hip hop. Oh, sorry, personalizing hip hop. <laughs> Our role in this case was to develop the system called Breakbeat Narrative. It's a personalized experience that uses AI technologies to give people a glimpse into the history of a hip hop. It's an experience like nothing people have seen before. These people, they need to see their history so they understand their connection to it. It's more than just music now, it's a lifestyle. Make sure to tune into Code Stories, where you learn all about developers doing amazing things all around the world with Microsoft technology. We're going to dive into the code. Make 
sure you tune in. Ask the Expert on Learn TV is a weekly show where you can connect directly with the technical experts you're looking for and get your questions answered live. Hello! And welcome. Today we're talking about what's new with Azure Machine Learning. DevOps. Microsoft Graph Toolkit. Microsoft Mesh. Today we're talking about how to get started with the Go programming language. We are here with Brian Kernahan. We are here today to answer your questions about the Rust programming language. Go to aka. MS ATE on Learn TV to see what Ask the Experts show are coming up next. We'll see you there. That's a really good question. Hopefully you've had a chance to check out the Connection Zone and the Learning Zone during the event. And now, here to talk about some of the exciting ways to continue that skilling journey, please welcome Aaron Rifkin and Sandeep Bano to tell us more. Hi, y'all. Hello. Hey. So why don't we start with you, Sandeep. Why is skilling so important? And can you tell us a little bit about how Microsoft Learn plays a part in that? Yeah, I think uh... We think about it from sort of the lens of two very important sort of personas, right? One is our customers. And in a day and age where every business is relying more and more on technology, you know, that tech in intensity that we talk about so much, it is imperative that those customers know what to do with that technology. And then when you think about our learners and the individuals, we think it's critically important that they be able to gain the technical skills that are really the currency of, of today and the future of the digital age that we live in and acquire those skills so they can build a lot better long-term economic future for themselves, build their careers, et cetera. And for us, Microsoft Learn is smack in the middle of those two sort of personas and constituencies. And we uh, hope and try and help them both with Microsoft Learn. And specifically, a learner can go to Learn and gain technical skills. They can do this in a sort of a very hands-on learning environment. We're big believers in learning by doing and getting your hands dirty, especially if you're a developer or IT pro. You can also earn certifications and prove those skills and expertise to the outside world, hiring managers, et cetera. And then finally, on Microsoft Learn, you can connect to a really vibrant community of learners like you where you can get your questions answered, you can give back, you can mentor or find mentees, uh, and you can find all the resources in that thriving community. Wow, so <laughs> judging by how many different options there are, it seems like Microsoft Learn has grown a lot in the last few years. So passing it over to Aaron, can you share a little bit about the new features that you're most excited about? Yeah, I would love to. Um, you know, we have expanded our popular Cloud Skills Challenge uh, for this event. So it's fully localized learning. Um, you can qualify for free certification exams. Um, and on top of that, you can then, as you're going through the training, you can um, gain achievements and you can share them on social media and on email. Uh, it's like LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and then we have added a new feature um, around our assessments. If you go over to the certification page, you can you know, take your training through Cloud Skills Challenge and learn. You can go to the certification page. You can take an assessment so you can practice before you go sit for your exam. So make sure, like, how prepared are you? Are you ready um, before you go and take that exam? But we've also launched a ton of new content. So every time we come up for these events, we make sure that we have all of the new features and products uh, have content out there and available to you. So we've added resource pages for every single session at Build so that you can get access to the documentation, training, and architectural guidance. It's really gonna help you continue to go technically deep beyond the event. So if you go over to the resource pages and you look at the recommended next steps, you're gonna see a wealth of information there that's gonna help you. Um, and then last, you know, for educators, we've launched the uh, Learn um, Educator Center. So it's a really a dedicated space for professional educator development on Microsoft Learn. So I encourage you to check that out as well. 
That is so exciting. I love how there's a segment specifically for educators on top of that. And it sounds like, yeah, there's been a lot more content that's yeah. constantly being added. It's ever growing. And Sandeep, I heard that there are some new and innovative ways for our viewers to learn even more about Microsoft products and services. Tell me more. There are indeed, and there are, uh, I think, two things in particular that we are really excited, and I think our learners and viewers will be really excited about. So the first is Microsoft Learn Cloud Games. So, well, first of all, who doesn't like gaming, right? We all like love playing right. games. Who doesn't <laughs> like learn learning? When you combine those two, you get cloud games. And so what this is, is a brand new learning experience. It's a collection of really immersive role-playing games in which technical professionals solve real-world problems by applying technology and you know, Microsoft products in a really complex, rich, fictitious world brought, brought to life with really sort of captivating storylines. Story so it's really fun. You learn a ton, and we're really excited about this. The second thing we're really excited about is Exam Readiness Zone. So what this is, very simply, this is your one-stop shop for if you want to take a certification exam and you want to get ready for that exam, everything you need, whether that is uh, study guides or videos, sandboxes, practice tests, sample questions, you name it. We've collected all those great resources in this one place uh, so to make it easier for you to get ready and, and, and get that amazing certification on your resume. We're starting with Azure Security, and then we plan to roll out additional exams over time. Awesome. I personally always get excited whenever a learning experience has been gamified. I find that so much more enjoyable than <laughs> just like reading off a whiteboard or, <laughs> or just being lectured. Oh, man. Yeah. And I heard that there are even more ways to learn long after build is over. So Aaron, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, your learning journey really doesn't have to end just because the event does. Um, you can visit aka.ms slash post build. There are a number of live technical content opportunities for you. Um, we have Microsoft led Ask the Expert sessions that are going to run through July on learn events. Um, you can also catch it on YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Uh, we've got the Learn Live series. They're directly aligned to our Cloud Skills Challenge and also to build sessions. Um, those are going to run through June, and you can uh, go to those. They're going to be led by Microsoft engineers and MVPs. You can ask questions directly and learn from them. Um, and then we have community-led opportunities. Um, we have table talks, after parties. We've got three and 400 level uh, build tech teardowns. And some of those are going to be hosted at our global reactors. So if you're nearby, you can stop in and be able to check those out. But we're also doing them hybrid, so you can check them out online as well. Great. There's something for everybody. And I can't wait yeah. to check out a bunch of learning activities <laughs> after build, too. So Aaron and Sandeep, thank you so much for joining us here today. And thank you. yeah. And if you want to check out everything that Microsoft Learn has got to offer, head on over to aka.ms slash Microsoft Learn Cloud Games. And now our final breakout sessions are about to start. Remember to fill out those session surveys because we're always looking to hear about your experience and how we can make it even better. Next up, want to know what those last few sessions are all about? Some of those session speakers are here to show you. Hi, I'm Scott Hunter. Come watch me, Bruno, and Rory show you how you can build amazing microservices in Azure with Java. Hello, I'm Marco Castellana, Vice President of Products for Azure AI. Join us for our session on how Azure AI brings innovation to document processing to learn how to take the work out of paperwork. See you there. Hello, my name is Samriti Seth, and I'm a Product Manager at Microsoft. Tune into our session where we will discuss automating and extending retention and deletion scenarios in Microsoft 365. We're Malika Mouse. We're scientists. We're engineers. We dance, but not so well. <laughs> we get really excited about science, and we want to share that excitement with the world. Windows 11 makes things easier. One of the biggest features I use is multiple desktops. By just swiping the screen, I go from being a student to being a gamer. With Snap Assist, I can have all the important applications on at once. Being a mentor to young scientists is one of the biggest dreams we have, and Windows 11 helps us do it. check out the Visual Studio Toolbox show, the show where we talk about all the cool new and existing features that are available in the Visual Studio family. Our goal in this show is to provide you with a place where you can learn more about your developer tools. So come join us, whether it's one of our shorter pre-recorded episodes or our hour-long deep dives. Available on YouTube, Twitch, and Learn TV. Happy coding, y'all.
so many great sessions to add to that digital backpack. Now, let's shift gears to talk about some of the new dev tools and services coming to the Microsoft Store. Here to give us a look at what developers can expect, please welcome Senior Program Manager, Jessica Sachs. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for coming. All right, so what has been your favorite part of Microsoft Build so far? Oh, my favorite part was a store testimonial video with developers talking about their experience bringing apps to the Microsoft Store. I love hearing how much our open store policy helps developers. For example, during the store testimonial video, Daniel from Glass, a great photo sharing app, commented on our open store policy of allowing developers to use their own e-commerce system and keep 100% of the revenue. This really struck me because I used to work for a small startup and know firsthand how important it is to reinvest as much revenue as possible back into the product. It's amazing to see that our open store policy is allowing developers to do just that. I also loved hearing Pete from Wondershare's comment that Microsoft Store's ROI speaks for itself. The reason developers are seeing a great ROI is the same reason we've seen a 3x increase in consumer visits to the store, because we now have way more ways in which to connect consumers to great app experiences. Our new storytelling module allows us to tell stories about the apps in our store in ways that we couldn't in the past. And our new pop-up store allows consumers to download an app for Windows directly from the developer's website with all the benefits of the Microsoft Store distribution mechanism. You're right. It is really wonderful to see the positive impact that the open store policy really has had on developers. It's great. Um, shifting gears a bit, today during the store's breakout sessions, there were a number of announcements made regarding Win32 apps. <laughs> How do you feel about what's coming for Win32 app developers? I am super excited about the announcements made today related to Win32 apps. You know, our open store policy allows developers to choose which app format to bring to the store, including PWA, UWP, and now Win32 apps as well. On that note, the wait is over. Anyone who wants to bring a Win32 app to the Microsoft Store can now do so. And we're offering new tools and services for our Win32 app developers to help them save time, be more efficient, and monitor installation health. For example, if your Win32 repository is on GitHub, you can take advantage of our new CI CD pipeline that will enable you to get your code published to the store quickly and easily, which is a major time saver. And We've simplified the process around understanding installer performance. So today, a Win32 developer has to set up a complex and very expensive infrastructure to monitor how well their installer is performing. We've solved this for our Win32 partners by simplifying the process and giving them great analytics and insights into how their installer is performing, and we do this for free. Ooh, free is always good. Uh, how exciting to hear, though, that developers can now submit Win32 apps with free tools and services lined up to help them manage their app in a truly meaningful way. Were there any other announcements you're excited about? Uh, you bet. I am also excited about Microsoft Store Ads because it expands on our open store policy by giving our developers more control over their own destiny on the Microsoft Store. Our goal with the Microsoft Store is to help users find the apps they want and discover apps they didn't know they needed. Developers know it's hard to find new customers, and the great thing about Microsoft Store ads is that it helps developers find users at the right time in the right place. So I encourage any developer also excited about Microsoft Store ads to sign up for that waitlist ASAP. That definitely sounds like there's you know, something <laughs> every developer right now should be signing up for. And it seems like there are a lot of great changes coming to the Microsoft Store. Boy, it's really exciting. You could say that again. <laughs> With our open store policy, new tools and services for Win32 apps, and the forthcoming Microsoft Store ads, I just think developers have a lot to look forward to if they release an app in the Microsoft Store ecosystem this year. I know. It's super exciting to see. You guys have really helped simplify it. And open, I think, has been the term that we've been using a lot since day one. So definitely super exciting stuff. Um, really appreciate your time, Jessica. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. So for more on these updates to the Microsoft Store for devs, check out aka.ms forward slash build dot developer community. <laughs> um, so I hope you're going to stick around a little bit longer for, for build, though. We have such a great rest of the show. <laughs> oh, you bet. <laughs> What a great interview. I'm excited to see all the more customizable ways to interact with the Microsoft Store. 
and there's more to come Microsoft Build. So remember, you can continue learning more about the new products and features that you discover during the event, even after the session ends. We know it can be hard to see everything during the event, but that's where your digital backpack comes in. Say you wanted to get in on one of the sessions we just heard about in that last segment, your first stop will be at the top of the page where it says sessions and backpack. Scroll down to, uh, to the sessions uh, scheduler and search through the different options. Remember to, to use the refine results area. It has a ton of tools to help you better search for key themes and topics, as well as learning levels and even solution areas. Plus, once you find what you're looking for, you can simply click save to backpack. So that will save an on-demand video, additional resources, and more to your backpack, which can be downloaded after the event as a hyperlinked Word document. And that is a resource that you can use long after the event wraps. So there are no excuses for checking out what Zero you're excuses. most yeah for what you're most interested in. <laughs> so next up, do you use Microsoft Azure DevOps? This next piece shows how indispensable it can be for so many and why you might want to give it a try. Three, two, one. I use DevOps every single day when I'm deploying into Azure. Whether it's different tooling like Azure DevOps or GitHub and GitHub Actions, I'm deploying into Azure continuously with continuous integration, continuous delivering, and using tooling like Infrastructure as Code. DevOps is part of my everyday life. I use DevOps every day to solve complicated challenges that our enterprise customers are facing. I use DevOps every day from planning work to cutting code in the cloud to CI, CD, and then monitoring what's in production. I use DevOps every single day by leveraging GitHub Actions and advanced security to demonstrate to our customers how to build out secure software development pipelines and how to take an idea all the way into production securely. Check out the Visual Studio Toolbox show, the show where we talk about all the cool new and existing features that are available in the Visual Studio family. Our goal in this show is to provide you with a place where you can learn more about your developer tools. So come join us, whether it's one of our shorter pre-recorded episodes or our hour-long deep dives. Available on YouTube, Twitch, and Learn TV. Happy coding, y'all. I'm Scott Hansman, and it's another episode of Azure Friday. Where every Friday, I'm going to sit down with an actual developer or program manager who works on Azure. Cosmos DB and Azure Functions, it's like chocolate and peanut butter. <laughs> Only good things can happen. It's just me learning Azure from the people who built it. And I'm going to go set this up right now. Tell me what this is about. OK, let's go into the details. Put that up in the cloud, and the integration is just chef's kiss. Proven guidance that will help you navigate your journey. I am uh, just gushing about the excitement about what's happening right now in space and in the cloud. Uh, we are learning all about Azure Orbital today on Azure Friday. It's been so fun getting to know you all throughout the last two days. So now we have got another question to pose because it's poll time. How are you preparing for the Microsoft Build Cloud Skills Challenge? A, reviewing documentation and studying prior challenges. B, I'm winging it. I live for the surprise. C, checking out a couple of resources beforehand. Or D, talking with my friends about my strategy approaching the challenge. Ooh. Head on over to the poll chat and let us know. I like the strategy, like someone actually trying to like right. whiteboard out their plan. I really it's do love tactical. that. It's very tactical. I love it. So far, that has zero. So no. maybe not a lot of people doing that. What's about the strategy? It looks like a lot of people are reviewing documentation and studying prior to challenges. Mm -hmm. Always a good idea to get a little. I bet you five bucks. There's a lot of good material on the Microsoft Learn uh, page that I just yeah. talked yes. <laughs> chatted about. Yeah. So that's where I'd be going. I'm yeah. Team A. I always say I'm a team B, but my conscience, my conscience yeah. is always like, oh, I'm fine. winging it. Yeah. yeah I wish I could sure wing it. <laughs> wing it. But I guess, you know, I'm glad, though, that people, even if they don't have the time to study it in advance, yeah. yeah. And, wing it's, it. and it's free better too, than so, not. Like, you know, why not? Give it a, give it a go. Absolutely. You can practice all you want, again, at MS Learn as well, from what I hear. And I think that this is exciting stuff. I like the 3% who's chatting with friends. 
multiple heads are better than one, in my opinion. Slowly. So, yeah. <laughs> So diversity, inclusion, accessibility, these are three important elements that we at Microsoft continue to keep top of mind with our products, services, and solutions. And thanks to our development partners around the globe, we're not alone. This next piece is about the power this valuable work can have on the world around us and what you can do to get started. Words appear. We can only fulfill our mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more when everyone is included. Real progress on diversity and inclusion doesn't happen without real work. Ideally, when we try to create change, we can do so without error. But that's not the kind of world we live in, the ideal kind. Even if we each had a blueprint, a prototype, or a manual, we would still have setbacks. We would still make mistakes. So each day we must strive to create a culture and a community that includes all of us to ensure that systems and societies support all of us. We must create, iterate, and create again, because that's the work. Good intentions alone don't make real progress, and progress will never be perfect. Progress requires us each to examine our decisions, our perceptions, our attitudes, and the impact we have on the world around us. When it comes to diversity and inclusion, this is about honesty and accountability. This is about each of us choosing to do the work for all of us. Because we can't just do more. We can't just do better. We must do the work. In a studio, a dozen people of various ages, styles, and ethnicities smile and interact. A man with a curly, dark beard and black stocking cap grins broadly. Continue your inclusion journey with us at aka.ms forward slash inclusion journey. Microsoft. Now every time it's done, it's different. But every time it's done, it's the same. It's the same piece. Unlock the legacy of Saul LeWitt, the father of conceptual art with Microsoft AI. Welcome back. I'd like to welcome Microsoft Director of Growth, Innovation, and Strategy, Nick McGuire. Thanks for joining us all the way from the UK. Hello, Leslie. Yes, here at UK HQ. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's late, but, uh, but the team's here and it's great. Sweet. Well, thanks for waiting for us. So Satya mentioned in his keynote on day one that Azure is everywhere. What do we mean by that? Yeah, well, the cloud is expanding into this ubiquitous and highly distributed fabric that's bringing compute closer to the edge, but it's ultimately bringing compute closer to the problems that developers are trying to solve. So what he means is, is that Azure has become this comprehensive and flexible platform to build these distributed apps that can span not only from the cloud to the 5G edge, but increasingly over time, even space as well, which is, which is just wild. Yeah, it is. And I think other people see that too on Twitter. I saw one that was just like Azure, 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 Azure. So it's, it really is everywhere. But what does this mean for developers? Well, what it means is actually we're seeing a new category of application emerge, what we're calling modern connected apps. And modern connected apps are these highly intelligent, network intelligent applications that have the ability to interrogate the network and have the ability to ultimately um, get help developers solve problems that they've previously not been able to solve. And I think that's what's really important when we think about this uh, this this category of application and and what's what's coming with respect to what this this type of application area. Great. Now, I also remember back in Satya's keynote that there was a little teaser of a customer, Ferovial, doing some work that relates to this. So can you tell us a little bit more about what Ferovial is up to? Yeah, sure. Why don't I show you a demo of, of the Ferovial solution? I think that would be fantastic. So should we, should, we, should we do a demo? Yeah, who doesn't like a good demo? So highways are becoming more and more digitized to improve safety. So Ferovial is creating a smart road solution called Ivia, where the road is basically exposed as an API, enabling infrastructure to automatically adjust in real time to changing situations thanks to information from cameras and sensors that are placed along the highway. So this allows Froville to create a digital twin of the highway in real time, which is what you're seeing here. Now the cool thing is, is they can offer services to the drivers and expose information as APIs to connected vehicles or autonomous cars. For example, they built a custom AI model for object recognition to identify safety hazards like debris or broken down vehicles. 
And latency is so critical. A few milliseconds can make the difference in terms of saving lives. So the solution has to be ultra reliable and responsive, which is why it's based on 5G. And using 5G enabled cameras, sensors and panels, roads can automatically identify these hazards and respond in real time, such as submitting service requests or updating the signage to inform the drivers. Now, how do you bring 5G and compute to the highway for all of this? Well, in areas further away from the cities, Frovial deploys their own private 5G network along the highway using Azure Private Mac to bring compute to those locations. But in other cases, such as updating the digital message signs, they can use an available public 5G network if in an area with 5G coverage. In those cases, Azure is partnering with carriers through our Azure for Operators initiative, so they can provide compute locally to those networks too, what's called Azure Public Mac. So you have Azure Private Mac to extend Azure Compute to your own private 5G networks and Azure Public Mac if you want to use an available 5G network. Oh, shoot, that is really cool. But, you know, as magical as it seems uh, from that demo, what's actually going on behind the scenes? Yeah, so why don't I show you some of the components in Azure Portal? I think that'll answer your question for you. So why don't we roll the next, next flavor of the demo? Yes. So if I start with the private 5G network, with Azure Private Mech, you can manage several aspects of the network directly from the Azure portal or even programmatically. For example, we can get a holistic view of all the various locations where the private 5G network is active. And if we do a double click, we can see them represented as an edge custom location. Because the solution is deployed as a Kubernetes cluster using Azure Arc, you can manage this type of distributed containerized application in a highly consistent way across on-premises and multi-cloud environments. Now, still in the Azure portal, you can also view and configure all the different devices connected to the private 5G network and set up policies such as quality of service to determine how the network will handle things like traffic prioritization and bandwidth usage. Now, this is just on the private 5G side, but here we can see the same distributed app deployed through several Kubernetes clusters across multiple targets to cover different requirements. So besides the Arc connected cluster we saw previously for the private mech, we also have our application deployed in regular Azure regions and also in an available public mech node. The highway here is in Dallas, so we can use the Azure public mech node provided by our partner AT&T, and you can see how it is completely integrated with Azure. This cluster will run in AT&T's local compute in their network in Dallas, which is where my highway is connected to. That means very low latency for me to target the critical scenarios such as hazard identification we saw earlier. Now in this cluster, we are running the video analytics model to detect traffic congestion. And what's powering it is a video platform called Edge Video Services or EVS, along with ML models from Azure Cognitive Services such as Spatial Analysis. And this provides intelligent video analysis for this vehicle counting application that we saw earlier. Now EVS splits across private and public mech or regular Azure regions, and it's optimized to work with 5G to reduce network traffic volume and make the best use of the compute infrastructure underneath. Now say we wanted to set up a new smart road deployment in Atlanta, for example. Well, we could just deploy our AKS cluster into an available AT&T public mech node in that location, which is exposed in the Azure portal as edge zones, as you can see here. And of course, we can just use GitHub Actions to automate the CI-CD pipeline, which allows us to automatically deploy the same containerized code base across private Mac, public Mac, and Azure regions in parallel with each code change. So, so this is such a great example of a modern connected app powered by 5G in action. Um, you know, bringing compute closer to the problem that needs to be solved. And in Frovial's case, it literally was solving safety problems at the roadside. And because we've got one unified and flexible platform, we have, we have the ability to manage it all through one, one single pane of glass, which that is just is, phenomenal. Yeah, that is fantastic and very important work, clearly. So where can developers get started? Yeah, please go visit us at uh, aka.ms forward slash modern connected apps. You can see it on the screen here, and we'd love to, love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, well, Nick, thank you so much for joining us. So now, Thank you for having me. Great. Yeah. So now over to Sonia with our last poll of the event. It's so sad. Sonia? Yeah, it's our final poll. And you know what we want to know? We want to know what you love most about Microsoft Build. A, the learning zone. I love acquiring new knowledge. B, all the sessions. I love hearing about the latest and greatest. C, getting to connect with fellow builders. 
D, fun activities and even more fun swag. I know all the digital swag that we had. It was great. Yeah. I think we have to add an E, though, from the all hosts. The above. Yeah, the hosts. <laughs> <laughs> Boat E or all the above. <laughs> no. All right, let's see how the poll is doing. All right, we got Learning Zone in the lead right now. Really? Oh, oh, whoa. All the sessions just jumped up. I'm Team B. Yeah, I think all the sessions were great. If you didn't have time to watch them now, obviously, they're in your backpack. You've heard us. <laughs> yep, they're all in my backpack because we've been hosting for two days straight and I've had no time, but every title I see, I'm like, yep, adding that, adding it's, that. It's super easy because then you can just, throughout the year, you can be catching up or if you wanted to reference something or share it with colleagues, it's a hyperlink document. You can mm -hmm. easily share it. Amazing. So yeah, 71% right now, all the yeah. sessions, people have the right idea. <laughs> and also the fact that C is even an option this year, I think is exciting too, getting to uh, explore this cool event with your peers, your coworkers, your friends, your pets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So a huge thank you to those of you who have participated in these polls. Um, it's been really great getting to know all of you. And you know, speaking of thank yous, we want to make sure to thank all of our partners who brought us some of these outstanding developer content and resources this year. Special thanks goes out to Intel, F5, NVIDIA, and Launch Darkly for the inspiring stories, helpful sessions, and top-notch expertise they delivered here at Microsoft Build. Absolutely. Our partners are critical in how we build and share our technology, and they are just as invested in your success as we are. And the best proof of that is in the Featured Partner Showcase. That's where you can access exclusive demos, SDKs, code samples, giveaways, and a lot more all carefully curated by our partners to help you solve your biggest problems and accelerate your projects. After you leave here today, you'll still be able to revisit those partners in the showcase and add them to your backpack. If you're going to want to do that because, and you're going to want to do that. <laughs> I think I've said backpack 20 times. Um, <laughs> because there's enough content to keep you engaged and learning until we meet you here again at the next Microsoft Build. <laughs> Now, from the Microsoft Store to what's in store for today's After Hours show, check this out. So excited. We're backstage right yeah, now. Yeah, we're backstage here. Just I have no idea what's in store. Yes. Embrace that it's coming. The developer can basically take advantage of all of us. What is happening? It's a tiny house, Amanda. Here in Alexander Story's hardware, we are really early in our neurodiverse explorations. Give me a talking head. Yeah. And, uh, it's a playground. We really have like stood out. We want to make developers happy. We can be true to our mission. I can take that creativity and build on top of it. Hi, I'm Anna Hoffman from the Azure Data Product Group here to tell you about a show I host called Data Exposed. We talk about all things data, what's new, deep dives, how to's, and we even give you a glimpse under the hood from the people who actually build the products. We cover topics like Azure SQL Security, running high performance SQL Server workloads on Azure Virtual Machines, migrate all your database assets to Azure SQL, data science with something old and something new, Azure SQL Managed Instance, developing apps with Azure SQL Database, and more. We post short episodes on Thursdays and once a month on Tuesdays, we release a special MVP edition with the community. May the fourth be with you. Catch us live on Learn TV on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific. We're going to have some fun together. If you want to stay updated about what's new in technology as well as the tech communities, talk to some amazing people and learn something awesome. Join us daily on Learn TV. It's a celebration of human creativity. The perfect blend of technology and community. You can meet the people that build the products that you use. All the different things that make up your experience using Azure, using Microsoft products. And of course, you'll get some of the latest and greatest coding tips from the best technical experts at Microsoft. The cool coding experience. That's what we are all about. Welcome to Ask the Expert on Learn TV. Welcome to this episode of Data Exposed. You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show. Make sure you tune in. Join us every weekday on Microsoft Learn TV.
internet is your inside source security identity friends our stories community experts accessibility developers it's us you will learn how to get started with security how to get started with .NET, microservices the latest technologies progressive web apps and how to build for every platform i'm your host Christos Matskas, and I'm a program manager for the Identity Division. Richard Lander, program manager on the .NET team. Jamie Singleton, program manager for the .NET community. Jeremy Lickness, program manager for .NET data. Throughout the event, you've shared your insight, your excitement, and your reactions. Let's check in on our Twitter feed one more time. Woo! All right, so we got one from Brick. Home again after a great day at MS Build at the MS Dev UK site. Seeing so many friends from the community and Microsoft after all this time was wonderful. I really do agree. Some of the teams that got to do the hybrid, you know, regional spotlights, it's amazing to have that community building back again. But mm -hmm. you can do it virtually too. That's what the fun goodness is of the chat on the side. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we also have a shout out from Daniel, new solutions, new tools, new opportunities, a lot of new things. <laughs> new. <laughs> new, just new everywhere. I mean, it's so much content. I mean, I'm even I'm exhausted after just two days being, I guess, technically virtual, but really we're on stage. I but. know, we get to IRL <laughs> hangout. Um, oh, this is such a cute one. That's cute. Oh, uh, it's a shout out to <laughs> Leslie awesome. Singh. Uh, she's such a great host. I'm, I'm not offended that my name's not up there at all. I'm not sad at all. I but it's think okay. you're wonderful too. It's okay. And shout out you to did. Michael who <laughs> did that tweet. Uh, he was talking about Launch Darkly. He yeah. was an excellent guest. Oh, so. Great guest. <laughs> After and you. yeah, so we've got another shout out from Jeremy. Still time to sign up for the Microsoft Graph Data Connect product roundtable. Come join a bunch of people and ask your questions and give the product group feedback. Really exciting feedback, of course, is extremely important. Our products don't get better without y'all. So yeah. Literally, the product roundtables are there to hear your feedback. So yeah. sign up. You don't up. just throw it away. <laughs> yeah. It's it's from you that we actually can improve ourselves. Exactly to your point. Yep. Okay. So Jeremy, there's never been a better or more exciting time to be a Windows developer. Yes. yes. Completely agree. Mm -hmm. So true. I mean, all the tools now and all the options. Know, and there's the feedback loop too, like we just mentioned. So if you're like, hey, that tool is not super helpful, give us the feedback. Let us mm -hmm. know. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, that, I totally agree. Like Jeremy says, I completely yeah. agree. <laughs> also, we got another one from Jenny. Whoa, MS Build is full of surprises. Yeah, so it is. Many. As I mentioned before, my most commonly used emoji for this is usually the shocked. I know, the, the Jonah Hill one. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I love it. All right, and we got one from Anna. If you enjoyed MS Build but want to meet the community, take a look at the after parties what? you can be part of around the world. I ah. want to go. Where's our invite, Anna? Yeah, y'all send me all the invites. I'll make it work. I'll find a way to. <laughs> I you know. Out. We have the after hours and after party. So many things that you can get involved in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and last but not least, another shout out from Paul. Excellent demos from Ask Priya and the Microsoft Build session showing the new Power BI Data Mart features. That is really awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And look, he hyperlinked the session. You can add mm -hmm. it to your. Backpack. Your backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Can't forget. <laughs> Never too late to check out all of those sessions. And remember, keep the hashtag going. It's MS Build. You can keep this conversation going all year round until next year's build. I know. So it feels like it was only yesterday we started our Microsoft Build journey and, you know, we're already wrapping things up. It's so fast. <laughs> this may be, you know, the hardest question to answer all day, Leslie, but what do you think are some of the biggest things that you'll take away from the event right now? Oh, that's so hard. I know, there's I so guess, many things. I know. I mean, I think first and foremost, just the sense of community that Build always brings, even if we're virtual or hybrid or uh, in person, it's always exciting. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I was really excited to see what my division has been doing with Visual Studio and with Maui and DevBox and all these other incredible products as well. 
So um, I'm excited, and I'm also excited to see all these sessions that I missed that sound really, really cool <laughs> after the event is done. I know. I'm like gonna add in, you know, blocks in my schedule to start watching some of the sessions in the keynotes <laughs> again after this because there's so many good things. I know. Um, I, I love that there was, like she mentioned, full of surprises, a lot of big announcements that we got to do. Um, it's really nice that we were able to come together as a company again and host this event and make those announcements. Like you said, the community building is so important with the dev community and uh, excited to keep the conversation going throughout the year. It doesn't have to just be now at Build. We can keep it going year long. There's so many act like activities to get involved in, um, the Learn Live sessions too, like everything from... There's so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've both attended Build in the past, so yeah. scale of 1 to 10, how does this one rate for you? I mean, it's pretty awesome getting to be a host. I'm not going to uh, lie. <laughs> if you, if you asked me when I joined the company five years ago that I and told me that I was going to be hosting Build, I'd look at you like you were a Martian. I'd yeah. be like, R what? I'm like, what, <laughs> what, what, you, what are you saying? Oh I get to sit up on the... <laughs> In this bougie, amazing I know, set. in the comfy couch that's it's not very mine, but I wish it were mine. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've gotten to attend, like I said, build in the past in, in person, which was great. Mm -hmm. And I think the activations that we had there and the sessions are great. But I really like how much content we're able to get in and share with the community. And I think a shorter time frame, which is nice. So yeah. I know it was always like a commitment for people to come mm -hmm. in person. But, you know, these hybrid uh, sessions that people will have afterwards, they still can, you know, yeah. get some of the, the goodness out of that. Apparently. The after <laughs> parties, <laughs> digital or, or in person. But um, I know this is a very special build for me, I will say, for sure. Same, yeah. <laughs> this one's definitely getting memorialized. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, can we get, yeah, I want like a I, know, I need like a plaque or a pen or something. I <laughs> yeah. totally agree. Or just even some decals on my um, on my laptop, I think would be pretty sweet. Yeah. And, you know, I think the fact that it is such a hybrid experience these days, it makes it even more, yeah, as you mentioned, more accessible for all these folks who maybe it's difficult to fly into Seattle yeah. every year for to check out all this content and do the networking thing. Yeah, so. especially with the regional spotlights we were able to do mm -hmm. this year, we could have it, um, you know, localized. Which I'm so jealous about. <laughs> yeah, localized for Japan and Latin America, UK, Germany, France, and then they have their activations that they're getting to do there and the extra keynote analysis. Like it's it's extra special this year, and I think the team has done a really good job bringing that. Uh, yeah, you know, to life. Mm -hmm. So there is still. There is still a lot to come with After Hours, but it's time for Leslie and me to say goodbye. No, but it has been an absolute pleasure being at the helm of such an incredible event. Again, I never would have dreamed that I would even be hosting the, <laughs> this event at all. So, and I could not have asked for a better co-host. Aw, thanks Leslie, right back at you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it has been quite the ride, but we all know it's not over yet. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because even though we're signing off, Scott Hanselman and friends are going to be saying hello in just a few moments. Yep, so on behalf of Microsoft, we'd like to say thanks for joining us here in the Microsoft Build Studio. And now over to Scott for After Hours. got the last yeah it'll be a talking head well this one's like a murdery one i can take that creativity and build on top of it what we need to do is make this easier and more accessible to build a low code experience on top of that the capabilities of these systems are changing cool bed back then
Hey friends, I'm Scott and it's Build After Hours. There's still more content even now and into the afternoon. We left Kevin Scott, we saw Into Focus with AI and low code and collaborative apps. And in fact, Kayla finished her computer, talked accessories with Felicia. I'm actually gonna check in with her a little bit later and see how that's going. Maybe Kayla will build me a machine as well. I told you I'd take you behind the scenes. I'm gonna show you all the cool stuff that we're working on here. Around me, we've got three pedestals. We've got one jib, one steady cam, five cameras in total hanging out here on the build stage. They told me I can walk over to the screen here. Check this out. This is actually an LED wall. This LED wall is in fact 4K screens, three 4K screens with 11,520 pixels in width. This is not really Seattle. I'm not supposed to touch it, but they can't stop me because it's live TV, which is pretty, pretty cool. This is, in fact, one of three studios used for Microsoft Build. We're going to go behind the scenes all afternoon. Do stick around because it's Build After Hours. Uh, it'll be, it's about shifting interactions and interfaces from being explicit to more implicit. You know, today, a computer is very explicit. Mm -hmm. You almost have to, you know, program it and use it in a very explicit manner. But the way I interact with you is very implicit. Mm -hmm. I'm fuzzy. You can't tell a computer to wear a black shirt and then have it go figure that out. We're you now using AI and machine learning to essentially bring that level of uh, implicitness to uh, your interactions with your applications. People expect life and their interactions to be fuzzy. If I tell my computer, hey, uh, set up an appointment with my wife for lunch right. on a Tuesday at the movies near us. You know, you know, that one movie theater by the crossroads. I'm always disappointed that the computer didn't get that. But it will. It will absolutely will. The things that are happening now in our office applications, uh, you know, powered by these large models that run in Azure, it's amazing. I mean, predicting the next few words that I'm typing. That is phenomenal. That's like, already starting to show up. Yeah. I, was, I was running Edge right. and I was writing some email and suddenly yeah. it started giving me the next yes. 15 words. And I was like, when did they add that? Like document summarization, they're solving riddles that like people can't solve. Searching with pictures. Yeah. Um, combining oh. multimodal picture and text together to find something. This is like human level parody things that are happening. But you need a lot of compute to make that happen, which is why this hybrid model between cloud and edge is so important. You want the computer to essentially help understand what you're trying to do and just do it for you and have it be right. And, and that is what AI is going to bring to everyone. We're walking into the inclusive lab right now where you know some of these things really come together nicely. Hello. Oh, that's right. Hi, Solomon. Hello. Welcome. Oh, hi. How's Hello. it going? I'm going well. Good to see you. Welcome to the Inclusive Tech Lab, everybody. Perfect. Tell me how yeah. this do. Oh, my whole setup? Yeah. Are, are, oh, wow. What I've got set up on here right now is actually the lighting control for the space. We can do full color control. Okay. I do Teams calls from here. This is how I keep up with my messages because I'm not at my desk, right. right? I'm in a lab. I'm doing stuff. I'm talking to people. Can you show us the adaptive kit over yeah. here that just came out? You and I on the right-hand side have similar mobility challenges with some repetitive stress injuries and some RSI. We've got the standalone mouse core, which is this little guy here. Nice little travel-sized mouse. What makes it really cool, that slides off. We take this tail. We just snap it right on. And then that thumb rest can be taken out really easily and switched around or we can custom 3D print all sorts of different tails like we have here. I'll tell you what I like about this mouse. The optical tracking engine is right at the front of the device, which gives you a little more precision when you're trying to essentially manipulate it. So it puts the axis of rotation towards the front of the device rather than sometimes the middle. And you have to do the charging mm -hmm. point yeah. around there. And we had yeah. to cant it enough that yeah. you could use it while it was plugged yeah, in. Yeah, that's some good engineering right there. Yeah. The thing that I'm really excited about with this particular device, I'm type one diabetic and I've got some implants and stuff and I've had bilateral lateral frozen shoulder, and I've got some mobility challenges on the right side, as well as RSI yeah. and some nerve damage. I use a vertical mouse. Sometimes the ones right. that I buy aren't really vertical. They're kind of at a 45 degree angle, and I can start hurting just as I turn. I'm going to be able to make whatever I want with 3D printed models. And as my body changes, mm -hmm. and as I either gain or lose mobility, I'm going to be able to make this happen. And I'm also left-handed, <laughs> which is a challenge. So I'm going to be able to make a left or a right-handed version with the right. same base. Right. It's so clever. When you showed me this the first time, yeah. 
I thought that was the mouse. And yep. you're like, no, look at the tolerance. Let me show you that. Yeah. <laughs> no. That is so nice. Everyone deserves quality, mm -hmm. tactile, right. accessible Well, that's devices. what we learned with the daughter of our lead designer. She has cerebral palsy. And mm -hmm. We built that shelf for her first. In the years since, she's grown. Her hands are bigger. And it's been a cinch to print newer, upsized versions for her, rather than having to go buy completely yeah. new hardware. And we're really excited about that, how the hardware can grow as your needs change. Yeah, with that's you. so important. That is a custom hand just yes. for you. Having pieces that we can easily upgrade and swap out is so important, not just with orthotics, but you know, with this as well. We took that same approach here. So we were talking about NPUs earlier and mm. the fact that, you know, we're gonna have these like interfaces that are so much more intelligent with like AI coming in and making more intuitive, fuzzy gestures. And then you like mix that with these accessible accessories. What kind of magic can we do there? We can take something that is traditionally a very explicit interaction model like I have to move this mouse exactly to this spot so I can click this button and that is our interface today that is basically the analogy of how we interact with computers today but with the advent of more compute power on the device with the advent of using Azure to essentially run these large models to help intuit what you're trying to do you can move more to a very implicit sort of interaction model and say you know I want to do foo uh, rather than move this thing to mm -hmm. this icon icon and click that button. Yep. And that's really powerful. It makes computers easier to use for everyone. It yep. makes computers more efficient to use for everyone. I was talking to Dave Dame, uh, how cut, copy, and paste was such a revolution. That software technology enabled many people to do more things more efficiently because you didn't have to repeat those keystrokes all the mm -hmm, time. Right. Take that analogy forward and now apply big AI on top of it. And you can kind of see that, you know, we're probably heading in a world where you'll be able to more naturally interact with computers the way we're interacting yeah. here to get stuff done. It's so programmatic right now. Not we taking anything away from the programmer, but you know. No, no, but a friend of mine at a company called Code Rush wrote a tool that calculated the amount of energy, the amount of force oh, wow. that required to do a thing. Like, yeah. I want to compile. Okay, well, I right. can hit Control Shift B, and that's a thing. Or I can click up here and I can move the mouse. And he calculated everything the moving yeah. of the mouse. The thing. Yeah. And he's like, okay, the most efficient way would be one button. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not three, not a mouse, yeah. not yeah. a this. That stuff adds up. One of the really a large model, the billions of parameters that the company's working on with OpenAI is called Dolly. And Dolly take, can take natural language and create a picture. I have a picture of an owl sitting on a beach sipping a tequila, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> like, like you can literally give that to Dolly and it will give you that image. It's crazy. Wow. In the future, we're gonna look at the past and say, I would have had to have drawn that picture. Yeah. yeah. And it's co-pilot for art. That's yeah. right. And it doesn't mean like I can't apply my own creativity. I can take that creativity and build on top of it. Just like Dave was talking about cut, copy and paste something and then building on other people's ideas. Well, now I can build on top of AI, take my ideas and build on top of something, a palette that's already given to me. You make a really good point that it's not about taking away creativity. It's not about making it so we just right. are talking to the AI. It's about making the boring parts easier so we can focus that's on right. the fun stuff. That's right. And, just... and give you inspiration and building on other people's work. It's different tools. That's right. The intent's still the same. That's right. But yeah, to your point, Scott, single button. We can do that now. The software now allows us to manually program those sorts of macros in where you can do really complex things with a single yeah. press yeah. and even multiple in sequence with that single press. But it'll be great when the system can actually start to learn those things on its own. And right. go, oh, I notice you're opening these things together at the okay. same yeah. time. As soon as you do one, all of it cascades. And that's really what we hear from the community is that kind of learning, that kind of adaptation of it molding around them is really what we hear desired a lot. How will NPUs proliferate the world? And you said, not too long, right? It's happening. Yeah. That's right. It's happening right now as we speak. I'm looking for that moment in time when I'm going to be like, I was there. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and I appreciate uh, both of you all spending time with us today at, awesome. uh, at Build After Hours. Thank you for showing us this amazing lab. Oh, appreciate my pleasure. It. Come back anytime, awesome. all of Perfect. you. We're always here. Thank you, Steve. Nice Thank talking you to you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye. I think you'll miss. Miss, 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 miss! I'm oh. not gonna miss. Oh, no. That was one hey, shot. Hey, man. <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, how Good are to see you, man. How's it going? Hi. This is Felicia. Felicia, Shaw. nice to meet you. My friend Mary, she's awesome. We have, between us now, 17, well, 17 minutes mm. of experience throwing axes. Mm. I have zero, zero. minutes okay. of experience. 10, 15 between us. Let's, can you help her pick an axe? Yes. I... This one's like a 
murdery one. So that's that's a good. murdery one. <laughs> Should yeah, I just go so I think for the it only and see if I'm a at the shoulder? Yeah. Okay. All right. You all ready? Yeah. Okay. This is for. <laughs> that was. That is. <laughs> Oh, well, See? okay. okay. Uh, so this, this is my surgery arm, so bear with me. Oh, yeah. Look at his little show off. But, okay. Sure. Here we go. He's already claimed a shoulder injury. Oh, oh yeah. I told you. It's just a little bit like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I should have asked coming in the door, but why do you want me here today, Scott? I feel, and I've talked to Felicia about this, that there's all the different VPs that like work all year and they build a thing and then they go and they talk about the thing. Yeah. But then there's all these other people who lead huge organizations mm. that no one has ever heard of mm. that are taking the thing and getting it ready for the customer and prepping it for the customer mm. and explaining it to the customer. I do think about developers, like legit, like not because it's yeah, built. We, we I think about, all about developers all the time. I think about trying to share what I hear when I go out to talk to CIOs and what they think about their developers. So we're mm -hmm. always thinking about how do we make sure the message is landing so that they're supported. Like that's at the end of the day. Now I have Demonstrate. to take all that energy in your Really, really this is the good one. Yeah, look. Okay, there you go. Whoa! Hey, oh, there you that go. Was okay, good. perfect. Do you have a bad shoulder too, or is that now? A... Oh, oh, you hit it right dead center. Dude. I am. Oh my goodness. See? All right, all right. Calm down, kids. Whoa! Oh, it's getting so better. Good. There it is. Woo! Put that on the board. Four points. Yeah. That's good. You're a lot better than me because <laughs> I have not yet hit one shot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're... Max. Oh! oh we, could, I... we could freeze frame that in post production and make that like a bullseye. Photoshop. <laughs> It's a developer world right now. We yeah. want to make developers happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to get out of their way. We need to make things easy for them to have all these secure, security policies. We need it to be easier for them to tap into all of the old cold bases, the data over here, but actually the, that makes their life joyful. Like the tools have to be joyful. We can't make yes. them unhappy in their jobs. I was going to say, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, early in career developers, you know, mm -hmm. getting them set up. I've seen people feel like it took them three or four months before oh, they gosh. could write a line of code because setting up the environment, getting plugged in, all of the, the dashboard of their lives as developers is in some Word document somewhere. Right. Just right. like set up their laptop, the, the kind of mediocre laptop that they were given by their boss. Right. All that's going to go away with DevBox, hopefully. Yeah, I think it'll go away. And I think it, it's, it's exactly the thing that you want like CIOs and CTOs just cringe. Like they want their talent working on problems tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these tools are both beneficial to developers and then they're both beneficial to leaders who are like, gosh, you know, having developers sit around for three or four months without being productive is not good for our bottom line, right? Yeah. And so I think that's where all things come together then. The fact that we're having this conversation all holding ninja stars, I think is somehow significant. And we need to be throwing those ninja stars. Oh, yeah, do it, do it, do it. Oh. I like that. <laughs> Funny, like. Oh. Whoa. Oh, and here you go. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what is it that you think Microsoft does well to allow people into the ecosystem? I think there's a lot of doors today, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because we just have such a robust portfolio, and yeah. so mm. I, I think we want to simplify, right? Yeah. But we also acknowledge people might be coming in from different places. And I think about like maybe some of the developers that are really in, been, you know, really into the Microsoft ecosystem for 20 years, they really understand it. And then you have another door for like low code oh, yeah. folks who are really t tacking this onto their skill set, right? That's yeah. a really good example. Or we have new types of developers, you know, you have these like data scientists who are really getting into this, you know, yeah. ML kind of yeah. very specific space. So, you know, I think we have a big tent and I think mm -hmm. we continue to grow that tent, but you know, what we need to do is make this easier and more accessible and more automated. And, yep. you know, that goes all to the simplification. We want to make devs' lives easier. Absolutely. Okay. All right, let's throw a couple more axes here. <laughs> oh, oh, right. That center. Stop it. All right, here we go. Now, we have a new bullseye expert. Hey, hey, friends, I'm Scott Hanselman, and it's Build After Hours. We're here 
backstage on set with a couple of ancient artifacts uh, myself, uh, this gentleman. But we do have newer things uh, like a copy of VisualStudio.net and Microsoft Bob. Now, if you had watched After Hours on day one, you would have noticed that not only did I abscond from the archives with a bunch of great t-shirts uh, that I plan on returning, otherwise I'll lose my job, but I also snuck out with copies of Visual Studio going back 20 plus years, and I've snuck them around all over the set. However, these are different than they were yesterday. So you gotta go back to day one if you didn't notice and find those hidden copies of classic Microsoft software. We're gonna head over right now to see Kayla, who just finished her PC, has got it all booted up and ready for development. See if you spot any other Easter eggs as we move through uh, from Studio A to Studio D. Uh, these were all pulled out and borrowed from the Microsoft archives. Totally different ones were put in the hallway yesterday on day one. So be sure to check that out if you didn't see Build After Hours on day one. And thanks to the folks at the Microsoft Archives for letting me have these t-shirts, as well as these classic pieces of software that I actually worked on a couple of those. We're gonna sneak into Studio D where Kayla and Felicia are working on their PC. And we'll see how it's going and see what they can share with us. Now we're gonna do the cool backwards walk that people do when they're live on something and try not to trip on anything. And then we'll say hi to our friends. Hello, friends. Hello. Hey. How are you? Oh, 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 oh. Check it out. It's, it's all done. This is Ada. This is Ada, named oh, after so Ada nice. Lovelace. Look at that. Yeah, so we've actually got it set up for development. So I installed Windows after the segment that we had and then um, put on some developer tools that I like to use regularly. So of course we have Windows Terminal and I have it customized to look just like builds um, backgrounds and I got that from the build website from the digital swag pack and I have Ubuntu installed as well for Windows Subsystem for Linux and then I have Visual Studio Code for all of the documentation that I write. I like to write it in VS Code um, and we have Visual Studio installed as well on the right and so I actually cloned the Windows Terminal GitHub repository and then built it using Visual Studio. So this terminal here front and center is the developer build of Windows Terminal. Now you used to build this on your uh, laptop. Yeah, so it took about like maybe 20 to 30 minutes depending on the day oh, wow. to build terminal. And this one took about three to four minutes, which is a huge improvement. Now, so I'm like, super excited. I've been telling you, we've been telling you like as your friend, like get a desktop <laughs> if you're gonna be really seriously producing. <laughs> yeah. What, like, what, why didn't you, why'd you wait to build your own PC? I don't know. So I always go back and forth between development and then doing other like program manager things. So it wasn't, it's not the main thing of my job. So I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll sit through it and I'll just triple check my code before hitting build. So I don't have to wait that time. And also I believe Visual Studio does a cache of the build. So it doesn't take as long right, the, second the second or time. third time afterwards. Um, but yeah, so this was a huge improvement and I was just so excited how quick it was to set up because it's just so fast. So what was your favorite part about the whole building process? Ooh, I think doing this, uh, inserting the CPU live was definitely one of the scariest things. A bunch of my friends were like, I can't believe you did that live on build. Like that is the scariest part to put in. It's like putting a heart in. Yeah, and then that spring that you have to lower down, you can't slip, otherwise you could damage the motherboard if, if it fits under your finger. So yeah. you get, really got to make sure that you're pretty careful. And if you push that, that 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 lever down, it's like you start pushing. It's like, I'm not supposed to push. The, oh, and then it clicks like, oh, oh I guess yeah. it worked. And then there's a loud snap and no one tells you about the snap. <laughs> no one tells and then you I'm the like, snap. did I just snap the CPU? Like, how did I how did I do that? So that, that was definitely the coolest but scariest part of the entire build, I would say. That's awesome. But you're a convert now. You're like desktop is the way. Oh, yeah. I am so excited to get my hands on this and then trick it out with all my other tools. Are you gonna be lugging it to and from your work? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't you know, think they, so. You, when, when, back, when, back in the day, we would do LAN parties before Wi-Fi and we would put a handle on top of them and you can get a strap and you can just lug it around. So you could do that. I'm just could saying, do that. that would be pretty awesome to see you just walking around Microsoft campus with your <laughs> PC with as a suitcase. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks so much, Scott, for coming. And thanks everyone for watching the Build a Windows PC segment. So what else or who else do you have coming up for your After Hours show? We have got our new friend, Meethi, who's gonna talk about the Power Platform. And we've got an actual very special conversation that we had with Kevin Scott in the yeah. 3D printing room, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so check us out, me and Felicia on Build After Hours. So, Miti and uh, Felicia, we are probably not supposed to be in sections of the studio. This is Microsoft Studios. I know that this is stage B. It says no events scheduled. We could probably sneak in here. Let's, Let's see. go. 
Oh my god. Look at this oh, massive green. green screen. Mita, you kind of have like green on your jacket. You're going to be. In. You're going to. You're going to be floating. You'll be a talking head. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Mithy. Hi. Hello. Um, so you work on Power Platform. I do. And we're putting the word power in front of a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, initially when you do that, it's branding, but now it's really cohesive. There's Power Automate, because Flow is Power Automate, there's Power Platform, there's Power Automate Desktop. But what is Power Pages? <gasps> it's our newest member of the Power Platform family. Super exciting. It's actually, I'll let you in on the secret, Scott. It's not brand new the low-code experience is brand new. Mm. So Power Pages stems from this capability from Power Apps called Power Apps Portals, which are essentially external websites that folks can build on business data that are still secure, still governable, still all of the stuff that's so important for making sure that our businesses can run smoothly. All of that existed. And we saw this growing need to build a low-code experience on top of that so that it's not only developers with deep technical skills who can now build out these sites, everyone can. So when is it an app and when is it a power page? Yeah. There's like SharePoint where I can have like list of documents and static parts. Mm -hmm. Then there's like power pages, but then when does it become an app? So um, I think we're talking about similar-ish things, but think about the audience there, right? So when you build a power app, the audience is usually internal. Maybe it's your teammate. Maybe it's for yourself to take uh, to keep track of something that you were doing with paper before. And so that's a power app. Okay. But now you want to take this and provide some functionality or some um, expose some information to your external customers. And that's uh, where Power Pages okay. comes in. So this is not something that's super brand new. The low code experience is new. All of the fun ways in which you can build this easier than ever. You can build it alongside subject matter experts and people who code for a living, the professional developers, so to speak. That's new, but the backing functionality, it's battle tested, it's highly scalable, it's out there in the world today. And then this is like the, the set. Doesn't everyone's house look like this? You this can is totally what my kitchen looks like. This is literally a stage. I thought that was 3D printed. It's not. Not everything is. Everything could be 3D printed. <laughs> this could be 3D printed. I don't know. You have to touch it first. That came from like Cost Plus. Is it, is it true you went to Vanderbilt? I did. And did you start a women in computing organization within Vanderbilt? I did. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so my journey to CS wasn't straightforward, which is interesting because I think a lot of people see me an Indian woman, they expect that of course I always thought that I could go into CS and technology. Um, not the case, did not grow up seeing a single woman in tech that I could look at and say that's something I want to do. And so I actually got into Vanderbilt thinking I'd be a mechanical engineer, discovered CS in my 101 class my very first semester, blessed that being a compulsory requirement. So <laughs> here I am in this class for the very first time um, studying what CS is, and I loved how logical it was. Um, fell in love with the subject, had a wonderful professor who just so happened to be female and gave me a lot of language to articulate how I was feeling in the field. Because I, you know, my first semester, I'm here, I'm surrounded by people who've perhaps been coding for a significant while longer. And so um, she was really uh, monumental to helping me realize that's, that's a very normal feeling to feel. And so cut to year two, I now see a whole batch of people coming in feeling the same way. And I'm like, we can fix this if there's a community. I want to replicate what that professor did for me, for everyone else who's coming in after. And so that's where Women in Computing came from. I also came in thinking I would do some other kind of engineering. Mm -hmm. um, but I studied CS in like school, I take it as an elective. But even so, I remember coming in and I remember thinking command line was so scary. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't feel like the way I thought was necessarily the way I was supposed to be thinking. And the mm -hmm. questions I thought of weren't questions that came to these people's minds. And then I, you know, luckily found the intersection of user uh, empathy and product and CS. And I think that really fits me. But yeah. I relate so much to that story. Yeah, and that's why I love working on our platform and business applications here because that's the story. Every time recently we uh, published a blog with like six makers who switched careers because they found Power Apps, for example, and that, not to be corny, but that makes me teary-eyed because that's, that's real impact that we're having on the humans behind the tech and not just because it's cool technology we're building it. And so that's why I love the whole citizen dev notion, yeah. right? It's like opens up the, the space for anyone who doesn't 
doesn't have that deep technical skill says, come on in, like come we've got in. the tools for you. And when, once you're ready, we've got a path to support you to grow. Well, thank you so much, Meethi Joshi, for hanging out with us today. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you for coming out and hanging with us. It was real fun. It was a lot of fun. Wow, daylight. <laughs> Go. Hey. Hey, friends. Uh, we are in Building 99, and you are eating, uh, as usual, which is the cool. Free little donut. It, free food is free food, right? Craft services. And uh, we're checking out uh, this workshop that we're going to interview Kevin Scott in. Mm. This is cool. Okay. If you, <laughs> After you. They've got lasers and CNC machines. Oh, this is a playground. You put this in your kitchen, right? Yeah, just print out my sandwiches. I love how you're, you're making crossing, too much noise. Scott. You're crossing lines like this. I can't hear it. Stop it. Stop. That could mean death. You this don't know what this means. This is great to keep around with you. Check this one out here. Let me get ahead again. Are, are we just going to roll? We're already rolling. Okay, we're rolling. Hey friends, we're here in Building 99 and we're talking with Kevin Scott in his workshop. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. I brought my friend Felicia Shaw. She's a PM on Visual Studio. Hey. This hey. is the CTO of the company. Very exciting, I'm super excited. If you're a CTO in a small or medium-sized company, I was the chief architect at my previous company in a company of only about 400. We thought of the CTO as being the most technical, mm. but I feel like that can't be possible. Like you're not trying to be- No, no, no. I think of my job more as uh, being the person that helps uh, a very large community of these tech fellows and distinguished scientists and engineers actually flourish and be technical and do the work that the company needs them. And, and it's a, it's really a, it's a nutty sort of team. Like we have <laughs> multiple Turing award winners. We have a Fields medalist. Uh, we have MacArthur Genius uh, grant winners. We have people who've been knighted by the Queen uh, of England. Uh, it's sort of crazy, like what that team actually looks like at Microsoft scale. We're easily the most distinguished people that you're sitting with. I don't think <laughs> we're <laughs> we're not even close to distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, oh, wow. oh, oh, contraire, you guys are awesome. Oh my gosh. Okay, so you're kind of like a quarterback, right? You're not trying to be the most athletic member of the team, but you're trying to be the one that helps block and tackle and coordinate with the rest of the folks. See how my sports analogy is? Correct. Beautiful. Yeah. You, feel, you really feel strongly that AI is, is fundamentally for the good and is going to make major changes in our lives. Oh, I, I do. I, I think it is uh, one of the more powerful tools, uh, technological tools that humans have ever built. And I, I think when we package it up in a way where it is usable by a huge variety of people to solve both small and large problems, like you, you may use it to, you know, build your next web app, or you may use it to figure out how to design a, a bespoke protein that will uh, fend off the next uh, pandemic virus that hits the human race, or figure out how to design a catalyst for carbon capture to help with climate change. Interesting. And is that sort of the role of Microsoft? What do you see Azure playing a role? I think you call it something as the supercomputer of AI. Yeah, the world's AI, world's AI supercomputer. AI supercomputer. What does that yeah. mean to us or to the world? Well, look, the, the fun thing about doing all of this at Microsoft is we've always been a platform company. We build things that other people then take and build on top of to solve the problems that they think are interesting or meaningful or impactful or urgent in their lives. I'm getting surprised all the time by how people use this tool once it's available to them. Uh, and so I think that's the important thing as a platform company is just like make the tools more powerful, make them more available, and then watch in amazement as people smarter than you <laughs> figure out how to use them. Well, you say people smarter than, than us, but you also feel very strongly that everyone can be a developer. And that's an interesting Correct. juxtaposition. You're gonna take smart people and make them smarter. You're gonna take regular people and make them smart. Really, a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, I, I think so. Like what, what you want is more people to have more powerful tools to solve their problems. Uh, and so that, that works for everyone from, you know, the aforementioned uh, Turing Award winners and Fields medalists uh, all the way to, you know, folks like the, the people in my hometown in rural central Virginia who have their own businesses in agriculture and manufacturing and whatnot that they're doing. And like, if they have more powerful tools, they, they're gonna be able to make their businesses better. 
One question that I have is I hear about, you know, AI and AI on an iPhone or uh, AI on a small thing on the edge, but then I also think of AI as being this massive computer refrigerator, you know, in a warehouse somewhere. Help me understand 